Jesus gives another sermon in Ptolemy, and over 600 people show up to hear him speak. He teaches them about the Temple of Forever and how to have a joyful and fulfilling life. The following day, Jesus again gave a sermon during the midday rest and the number of people who came to hear him was greater than the previous day, numbering over 200, including men, women, and children. Many people came early and brought food and drink with them so they could listen to his preaching while they ate their midday meal. And numerous small awnings were set up in the crowd to shade the young and old from the sun. Ptolemy was a bustling city with residents and visitors from all parts of the Mediterranean and beyond. Among those who came to hear Jesus were both the rich and the poor, Hebrews of many persuasions and Gentiles of many lands, including a number of Romans. It was with this varied audience in mind that Jesus chose the subjects of his sermon. And Jesus said unto them, Is source the God of the life to come? Or the God of the life you live? Truly, source is the God of both. Yet how different is the life you live from the life you expect to live in the hereafter? Your life in mortality is meant to be a challenge that you may grow stronger and of more sure faith. But it is not meant to be misery, for the man who is beat down without end eventually becomes so numb from torment that he stops trying to rise to something better. It is for this cause that those who unnecessarily cause pain and suffering in others, giving pain and suffering instead of compassion, will reap the evil that they sowed. Seventy times seventy in the hereafter after they are weighed in the balance and found wanting. So too will the man or woman who gives compassion instead of torment reap their good reward in the hereafter, seventy times seventy after they are weighed in the balance and found to have multiplied their light. Nevertheless, though you may die in a moment, the hereafter seems distant and far away, even but a dream while your challenges of today are unavoidably before you, both those you inflict upon yourself and those inflicted upon you by others. But you are the master of the celestine light that dwells within you. If you choose to embrace the light, there is no darkness deep enough to overcome you. If you choose to let the celestine light of source fill your body, no problems in life are great enough to take away the warmth and tranquility you will feel inside. Though you may be poor, you will feel rich. Though you may be persecuted, you will feel peace, without anxiety. Though you may hunger even for food, you will feel filled. Think not that Source is the God only of the world to come, for it is Source that made the world you now live upon and everything in it, and this for your happiness, joy and fulfillment. Life becomes sour for many people only because they do not take good actions to make it sweet like honey, therefore, it spoils and becomes unpalatable. Verily, I say unto you that Source gave you a world where life abounds that your life might have exceeding joy by being one in spirit with all the life around you. Go and stare for an hour at the sea, listening to the waves lapping on the beach. Rest in your garden for an hour and quietly watch the bees gathering nectar on the flowers or the ants patiently building their nest by removing one small grain of sand at a time. Take time to immerse yourself often, if only for an hour or a day, in the life of the world around you, and you will find the celestine light of source comes alive inside of you, and your burdens become lighter and your life becomes brighter. When a man becomes a man, he stops being like a child and he thinks well of himself. But in truth, when a man stops being like a child and takes life too seriously, it becomes drudgery and monotony, and his life goes from the continual pure happiness of a child to the frequent unhappiness of a man. The more years of drudgery and monotony that pass, the more unhappiness builds within the man until in his old age he becomes as shriveled as a stale dried date, with little of the soft joy remaining from his youth. Does this sound like anyone you know? Perhaps even you?
Have you become so caught up in being an adult that you have forgotten how to be a child? Do you play with your own children, sharing in their delight at a new discovery or accomplishment? You may say that you have no time for the foolishness of children. But I say unto you there is little that is as great of importance, for unless a man can easily and often become as a little child, he can in no way enter into the glory of the kingdom of heaven. Being as a child does not throw off your responsibilities as an adult. It merely seeks avalanche of stewardship to your family and stewardship to yourself of recognizing that there is a time to work and a time to play, and that the time to play, just like the time to work, comes every day, except for the Sabbath. For this cause look often for occasions to celebrate. At the end of each week of work, reward yourself and your family with a special celebration, even if it is only an extra date for a dessert and a quiet hour on the beach with your family. Celebrate the planting even if you are not a farmer, for you still hope for fair weather and a good crop that you may have food on your table. For the same reason, celebrate the harvest, whether the bounty came from the farmer's fields or your own plot of land, it is the blessing of life and the pleasure of good food. Celebrate each full moon even if your life has been greatly challenged during that moon, for you still live and still enjoy great blessings. If the lamp of source is lit inside of you, then you will always see the blessings that surround you. Your joys will be magnified in your heart, and your sorrows lessened. Celebrate each birthday in your family, even if only with an orange and a day off from work. For each soul of life is a blessing, and each step you walk in life is laying the foundation for your eternity. As you celebrate the lives of your loved ones, your thoughtfulness reminds them of how special they are to you, even as they will remember how wonderful you are to them. As a community, look for occasions to be festive and celebrate things great and small. For sharing and rejoicing together is the glue that binds the stew pot of cultures and people, that is, Ptolemy. Why do you think I speak to you of these things? It is to help you to know that God did not create you to have endless sorrow, but to have endless joy. You were not born to wait for death as a blessing, merely hoping to escape life and pass to an eternal paradise. Verily, God gave you life and gave you this world that you would have joy and make it into a paradise, beginning within the walls of your own home. You may be accustomed to hearing a long list of laws you must obey from your priests, but the only laws I give you today are to acknowledge God in all things and to treat your neighbor in your thoughts, words and deeds as you would hope to be treated by them. Respect and humility toward God and respect and courtesy to your neighbors are the foundations of peace on earth and everlasting joy in heaven. But what does that mean to you who live in Ptolemy? Here your neighbor may be a Roman or a Persian or a Syrian or a Greek, all with beliefs and habits different than yours. And perhaps even objectionable. Is this a cause to fight with your neighbor or just to disdain them? I say unto you, do not fight them or disdain them, but accept them and respect them if they are of good character. Then Jesus pointed to a man with a red sash far to his right at the edge of the crowd and another with a brown sash far to his left and beckoned them to stand, and he said, Though Source is the one God of all the earth and every star in the sky. There are many ways to find and know God, even as those who sit to my right see me differently than those who sit to my left, yet both see me. If I were to ask these two men to come to me, they could not walk in each other's footsteps. In truth, they would have to take very different paths. Yet both would have their eyes upon me, both would be seeking me, and in the end, I would embrace them both as they came to me. Therefore, do not look to see if a person is from the same country as you or the same faith to befriend them. 
but look to their good character and virtue as a sure foundation worthy of friendship. If they are seeking God with virtue and good character, even on a path different than yours, know with certainty that they are loved by Source. And if they are loved by Source, can you treat them any less? And I say unto you that the day shall come in your lifetime when there shall be contentions among those who live in Ptolemy, and among the narrow-minded, there will be some who will incite violence against those that are not of their tribe or country or faith. On that day, remember my words. If you would show devotion to God, then give only peace and solace and refuge to everyone who has virtue and good character, even as they would. Return it to you, regardless of the color of their skin, the language they speak, or the path they walk to God. On that day, turn your back upon the instigators of intolerance, support them not. For in the eyes of Source, it is far better to give comfort to a man who walks a different path than you, but walks toward God with humility, honesty and virtue than to stand against such a man and is far worse to stand with the ignorant and intolerant, simply because they are of your faith. Or speak your tongue, or are from your tribe. The fact that you listened to the spirit of Source that led you here today testifies that you are seeking something greater than you are and are seeking to become more than you have been, not in the ways of the world, but in the ways of God. Remember now my words and the twelve pillars of the Temple of Forever and the capstone over all, which I give to you now in my love for you. The true Temple of Source is in a circle and no other shape, for only in a circle are all good things included in harmony and unity. Though man may build a likeness to fulfill his needs for sanctuary and communion on earth, the true temple of Source is not built by man, but is within man, as he lives in harmony with the Spirit of God. Live these pillars, rest your thoughts and your words and your deeds upon them, and they will support you in life against all that the world may bring upon you and lift you to the highest mountain in the eternity to come. These are among the things God does for you, and you should do no less for yourself and your fellow men. When a choice is to be made between conflict and peace, choose peace. Be ever willing to find the path of harmony and common ground and ever reluctant to walk down the path of discord and anger. Because of differences There are many pious people who consider themselves godly, but do not act in ways that are pleasing to God, who become angry when others do not walk the same path to God that they do. But I say unto you that a faith that is worthy of God is not based only upon what you believe, but even more upon that which you do. Your actions are the gold of your life, which is weighed in the balance of the scale of judgment of resonance. And in the world to come, it will not be asked of you what you believed in life but rather what did you do in life? Therefore, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, for that which you do to others, both the good and the bad, will come back and in an equal way to you from others, both in this life and the next. And when good is done to you, reciprocate it back twofold. But when evil is done to you, find forgiveness in your heart, and unto the repentant, do not hesitate to forgive them in your words and your actions. Laugh and play and listen and watch and wonder, be a child each day, for it is one of the secrets of perpetual joy and communion with God, and for this cause have you been created. And given this world, that you might have joy in abundance. Be a good steward of all that is in your care by protecting, increasing and enhancing all that has been entrusted to you, beginning with your own life, then your family, then your brothers and sisters of light, then your community, then your world and the life of everything therein. Verily, the more you serve others, the greater grows your own spirit and stature. Seek knowledge every day, for ignorance is slavery and knowledge is freedom, and these enliven your soul. Verily, it is easier for a man or a woman with knowledge and freedom to do good in the world than one existing in ignorance and slavery.
Embrace love as a star to guide your life, for more miracles are possible with love than any other power save faith. In truth, these two work together, and one without the other is but an empty cup. Love yourself first, in humility and truth, for only then can you give true love to others. Such is the circle of love. Love your wife or husband as you would like them to love you, for when the love within a marriage is returned, it blossoms into a fulfillment and tranquility that is equaled only by the Spirit of God flowing in your heart. Such is the circle of love. Love your children as the most precious jewels and show your love by giving them your time each day, which speaks more powerfully of love to them than anything you can say and it will be returned to you multiplied many times when you are old. Such is the circle of love. Love your brothers and sisters of light and remember you are all part of the family of light, therefore, their concerns are yours, and their joys should be in your heart as well. Care for them in their times of need, even as they will care for you. Such is the circle of love. Love your neighbors, even those who are different from you. Verily, you are all still children of God and brothers and sisters of spirit. An injury to one is an injury to all, and a blessing to one is a blessing to all. Such is the circle of love. Love the animals of the wilderness and the deep waters and the fields, for when you give love even to those creatures who know you not, you gain a greater capacity to give and receive love from the people in your life that you do know. Such is the circle of love. Love the plants and the mountains and the valleys and the forests and every life and place that is upon the earth, for as you love all that Source has made for you, your heart opens to receive all the love that Source has for you. Such is the circle of love. In loving all these, your kinsmen and all the world and everything therein, show gratitude to them and to Source, for with gratitude, you become worthy to receive all of the miracles Source would give to you. Let it be known across the land that love is married to faith. Even in the face of great hardships and grief, do not abandon your faith in the reality and omnipotence of Source, for faith is the conduit to powers unseen and the channel through which all miracles flow, both the small and the great. Therefore, waver not in the face of adversity for only those who do not falter prove their faith is true and thus open the door to all the powers of heaven. Each day, choose to eat a variety of simple foods that retain life, various fruits and vegetables, sprouted bread and sometimes a little honey for a treat. Such brings you both pleasure and health. But if you were to eat only one food, such as dates, for every meal, and dates alone, you would soon become sickly and be very unhappy and disagreeable before that occurred from having to eat only dates for every meal. Even as a wise man eats many different foods for happiness and health, so should you embrace balance in all of your thoughts and actions, if you desire to obtain happiness in life and true progression of your soul. Too much of anything, even things which are wonderfully good, entombs a man in a grave he has dug while moderation leads to a long life full of wonder and contentment. If you nourish only one part of your life, you allow the other parts to recede, and all are needed for the journey. It is fine to be a zealot for a short period of focus to gain a specific desire, but to be continually zealous to the point that reason and harmony hold no sway is to condemn yourself to contentions that trample lives that should instead be uplifted both yours and those of whom you love. But balance alone can be a false justification to squander the sands of your life, if you do not ensure that virtue guides your path. Source delights in the virtuous man and woman, virtue is the fruit of the tree of celestine light, and the sweetness thereof is made known to all, but tasted and savored only by the worthy. Virtue is gentle and sleeps soundly at night. Virtue is faithful and kind. Virtue has patience and self-mastery. Virtue is peaceful and loving. Virtue is honest and reliable. Virtue is chaste and pure. 
Find a virtuous man or woman, regardless of their religion or culture, and you will have found a true son or daughter of God. To hold virtue in your life, you must instill it in your heart, so the habit to be virtuous becomes greater than the temptation to be unvirtuous. By this, you conquer yourself, you defeat the adversary within, and in overcoming yourself, you become greater than he who conquers a city. The capstone of the Temple of Forever is a golden sphere that has no beginning or end and endless mysteries to discover hidden within. It is the admonition of Source that all who would walk the earth in righteousness would leave a legacy, that they might continue to uplift their brothers and sisters of spirit. Long after they have been freed from the bonds of mortality. Even as Source has left you a legacy of the commandments of Sinai and the Eden of the earth and the true teachings of the prophets, that you might become more than you began. As you see God do, so do you. You cannot give commandments unto men, nor can you reveal the truths of heaven to the prophets, but as Source created the earth and everything therein. So you can create beauty and wonders which edify your brothers and sisters of spirit long after you have gone to your eternal reward. As worthy, righteous, and virtuous. Children of light, true sons, and daughters of God, let it be so. By their fruits you shall know them. When questioned by his disciples about the chosen people of God, Jesus explains that they are not from one tribe or one nation or one religion, but they are those who live the Celestine Light of Source. Which light is imbued upon all souls from before birth regardless of what they have been taught to believe in life. And it came to pass that Jesus Miriam, and his disciples departed from Ptolemy and walked a path to Bethsaida that traveled east over the ridge of hills. They went out of their way to climb to the summit of a tall hill where they could look down upon Lake Genesaret. At this place, they had their midday meal, and Philip asked a question to Jesus that others had also wondered, saying, Rabbi, we have just savored your words at Ptolemy, but I would ask you a question, not about what you said, but to whom you said it. Jesus rolled his hand, indicating that Philip should proceed. And Philip asked him, in the synagogue, we have always been taught that we are the chosen people of God and that all other people are unworthy to have God's favor. Yet in Ptolemy, and also in Samaria, you have given your light and the wisdom of your words, and even mysteries and mighty miracles to those whom we have been told since our youth should be scorned. In Ptolemy, I think there were more Romans, Greeks, Syrians, and other foreigners than there were Hebrews hearing your words. I must confess that I am confused. And all of the disciples nodded their heads in agreement. Jesus answered them, saying, I am thankful you have asked me this and were not afraid. And I hope it will always be so, for it is important that you understand the fullness of the Celestine Light. But I have spoken about this already to you, how is it that you have not understood the words I have said? If my own disciples cannot comprehend this most basic truth, how will others see the light? Every person on this world is a spirit son and daughter of our Father and Mother in Heaven, who loved their children and helped them to grow before they were born upon the earth. Therefore, every man and woman is truly a brother and sister of one another. Each is a child of God, so how could it be that Source would look upon all of the souls upon the earth? And say this small number here alone will we love. Only these few will we bless or acknowledge or give an inheritance in our kingdom. The ignorant and the prejudiced look for ways to puff themselves up by tearing others down. They will say, these people are not of our tribes, and they do not live the laws of God. Therefore. Their inheritance is desolation and separation. But I have said unto you that I have come to destroy the laws that mock the true Celestine light of Source, for man has elevated falsehoods to sacredness for his own purposes. I bring the fullness of the Celestine fire, which most will not be able to bear, 
but that you, my brothers, must not falter in, even though because of it, those whom it scorches will try to bring death and torment to some of you in retaliation. I came first to the Hebrews because in important times past, their fathers were faithful to the simple commandments of Source. Source the Father made a solemn promise to the faithful Hebrews of ancient days that the fullness of the Celestine light would be brought first to their descendants. I am the fulfillment of that promise, and when I first spoke of the light, it was to the Hebrews, in the cities and towns of the Hebrews. But I am not the light to the Hebrews. Alone, but the embodiment of the Celestine light of Source to all the world and everyone is my brother and sister of spirit. There are some parts of the Celestine light which the Hebrews know and do well, to them, I teach the parts that they do not know or do well. So too there are parts of the Celestine light which many Gentiles know and do well, to them, I will also teach the parts they do not know or do well whenever the opportunity comes upon me to share the Celestine light with them. If man is to become more than he is, if war is to cease and peace is to reign, then man must have respect for others beyond his tribe, beyond his nation, and beyond his practices and traditions and beliefs in God. It is a foolish man of any religion who thinks that Source has given hundreds of laws that man must follow to please God. Source gives no commandments to the children of men save the Great Commandment and the Twelve Commandments of Sinai and these not to burden man but to uplift him and help him to become more than he began. All other laws, be they written in the scriptures or not, are given by men to control other men. Now the spirit of the great commandment and the commandments of Sinai do not need to be written upon scrolls of scripture to be known, for these principles are a yearning of the soul. They are inscribed upon the heart of every man and woman before they are born into a physical life by Source the Mother. Through the teachings of parents and priests and cultures and traditions and actions that are contrary, the fullness of the true commandments may become lost in the hearts and heads of some men and women, and the light all but extinguished because of these things. Yet even when a man commits acts contrary to the great commandment, and the commandments of Sinai, there will continue to be a still small voice whispering to him in his head and a feeling in his heart that what he does is contrary to the will of God and contrary to his own happiness and well-being. Only after he has repeated the same error many times will he become deaf to the still, small voice and the flutter in his heart, and hear and feel it no more. Yet even then, in a place inside he keeps imprisoned and never visits, the Celestine light will whisper reminding him that he does wrong. And sometimes despite all his best efforts to convince himself otherwise, the truth he has hidden from himself will come to torment his consciousness. Now I ask you, who are the chosen people of God? I tell you plainly. They are not of any one tribe, or any one people, or any one nation or any one religion. Verily, the chosen people of God are they who keep the spirit of the great commandment and the commandments of Sinai and by this live the essence of the Celestine light. And the tribe they are from, or the people they are a part of, or the nation they live in, or the religion they believe in, are all nothing of consequence in the eyes of the Source. And what is the spirit? What is the essence? Love God, be respectful, and a good neighbor to all people, be virtuous and of good character in your words and deeds, be of service to others, and be a good steward over all that you have been given responsibility over, beginning with the temple of your body. How then may you know a child of light? You will know them by the fruits of their life. How well do they live the spirit of the few true commandments of God and the essence of the Celestine light? It does not matter whether they are Hebrew, Roman, Greek, Syrian, or someone from any other tribe or land.
if they live the spirit of the true commandments, they are sons and daughters of God, true to the celestine light within them. Seek them out and do not turn them away because they are not exactly like you, for these are your true brothers and sisters of the light. As Jesus took a pause in speaking, Yohanan asked, Rabbi, what you say resonates in my heart, but I am still having difficulties in my head. You say that if men hold to the spirit of the true commandments and the essence of the Celestine Light, they will be numbered among the chosen, even if they are Greeks or Romans or other people. But the commandments are very specific, even as the second commandment of Sinai says to only worship Source and even condemns veneration of anything except Source. I have seen the ways of the Greeks and Romans and some of other people. They do not even know the name of Source. Some of them may be virtuous and of good character and good stewards, but they worship a myriad of false gods and venerate many objects and places. How then can they be numbered among the chosen? And Jesus answered him, saying, Men are not held accountable for that which they know not but only for that which they know. The essence of the Celestine Light and the virtuous of the Great Commandment and the commandments of Sinai are etched into the soul of every man and woman born upon the earth. But the beliefs of religion, including the name and substance of God, are taught differently within the family and the tribe. Concerning the nature of God, as the children are taught, so they believe until they are shown the true light. Then the true light kindles a fire in their heart that they did not even know was there. If a man from another land has been taught that God is a big rock that sticks up from the ground and he leads his life in righteousness, with virtue and good character, worshipping the big rock in the faithfulness of his beliefs, he has as much favor with Source as the man who knows and faithfully follows the Source. It is the virtues and good character that distinguish a child of light, and they are not held accountable for the realities of the nature and fullness of God until they have had the opportunity to be taught and understand them fully. It is for this purpose that you have been called to be my disciples. You learn from me now, but the day soon comes when I shall send you out into the world to preach the gospel I have taught you and bring a portion of the celestine light I have given you to those who will rejoice when you come. Many will hate and revile you because of me, but some will open their hearts to you and receive the celestine light, which will be much greater and fulfilling than the light they had previously held in their beliefs. The principles of virtue and character that I teach, which is the Spirit of the True Commandments and the Essence of the Celestine Light, will spread forth across the world through you and those who come after you, for the children of light wait with a yearning heart for what they know not, until it is upon them, and then great will be their joy. Millennia will pass, and many men will become more wicked than their forefathers, but because of the seeds you plant, some men will become more righteous. Preparing the way for the fullness of the Celestine Light of Source upon the world and the beginning of the Epoch of Promise. Therefore, when you are sent out into the world to bring souls to the Light, remember to find the children of Light who are waiting for you, not by their tribe or nation or beliefs, but by their fruits. By their fruits, you shall know them. A Prophet Rises to His Glory the evil plan of Herodias comes to fruition as she forces her beautiful daughter, Salome, to seductively dance for her stepfather Herod Antipas in return for the head of Yochanan the baptizer. The spirit of Jesus comes to Yochanan while he is in prison and shows him exactly what is currently transpiring that will bring about his demise. Just as the guards come to take Yochanan, Jesus takes his spirit from his body, and he is instantly transported to heaven, thwarting the guards. Attempt to behead him alive. On the following day, it came to pass that as the afternoon waned and they neared Capernaum, Jesus suddenly stopped walking, 
and bowing his head and covering high seas with his left hand, he began to cry. Miriam and the disciples all went to him with great concern, and Miriam embraced him, saying, What is it, Jesus? What has happened that grieves your heart so greatly? Jesus kissed her lightly on her forehead, his tears falling onto her, and said, I grieve to my depths because at this moment, the mold has begun to be carved in the evil mind of Herod's wife Herodias, and on the morrow, Yochanan, my friend of friends and brother of brothers, will pass from this life. And though I know it is as it must be and that we will be together again soon and be brothers forever, I still ache to know his pain and that of Martha and his children and the loss for all the world when he is no more upon the earth. I rejoice for the brightness of the sun to which he goes, but weep also for the world that will be darker without his light. Then pulling Miriam away slightly, he held her with a hand on each of her arms, saying, We will spend the night tonight at Capernaum, and tomorrow at first light, we will journey to the castle above the springs with the children. Your sister and family will need you. Then turning to his disciples, he said, Miriam and I must make haste to the south and will be gone for at least a moon on matters of family, for Yochanan, the mighty prophet of Source, rises to the heavens tomorrow. Though I know each of you would desire to come with us, please take this time to be with your own wives and children, for once we return, all things will quicken and only then will you realize how precious this time with your loved ones will have been. The disciples nodded solemnly in agreement, and after bidding goodbye to Jesus and Miriam, each made their way to their own home and families. After coming home to their children and family, Jesus spoke to Miriam quietly, saying, I need to go up into the hills, and I must go alone. Please do not wait up for me, but prepare for our journey tomorrow. Miriam was curious about Jesus' request, and she asked, of course, I will do as you ask, Jesus, but have you not said that I should witness all things? How can I be a witness if I am not with you? Jesus answered her, saying, I will not be there to witness, I go now to Yochanan, and as I go, you cannot yet follow. But I will return before the day break tomorrow. With a nod and a smile of understanding, Miriam embraced her husband and watched him depart for the hills from which they had just descended. As darkness fell, Jesus sat upon the ground at the top of a bare knoll overlooking the lake with his eyes closed. Nearby, a lion growled quietly, and from the underbrush down the slope, it moved silently toward Jesus. Only when it was very close did Jesus open his eyes and he held out both hands inviting the lion to come to him. It stood and stared at him for many breaths and then came into his arms. Jesus embraced the head of the large male lion and ran his face through its mane, saying, Thank you for coming, my friend. Please remain here with my body and watch over it while my spirit goes to my brother. Then Jesus lay upon the ground, and the lion lay beside him against his body. And unseen to any eyes, Jesus' spirit rose from his body, and in a heartbeat, he stood before Yochanan. Though Yochanan was in a prison cell in the castle of Herod above the Salt Sea, because of Herod's fascination with him, he was afforded more comforts than was accustomed to prisoners, and his cell had a bench and table and bedding to sleep upon. Yochanan was in prayer upon his knees when the spirit of Jesus appeared before him and so real it was that Yochanan shouted with joy and went to embrace Jesus only to discover it was his spiritual form, without physical substance. Jesus spoke to him, saying, Namaste, brother, I have come to be with you in your time of deliverance from your persecutions and your ascension to the celestine light of the heavens. Yochanan stared at him somewhat in wonder, saying, I have longed to see you again Jesus but this is your spirit perform. How is it that your spirit can appear and speak to me while I am still in the flesh? 
Is this a vision I am being carried away into? Jesus answered, saying, Only the eyes of the most virtuous can see the essence of a Holy Spirit while they are still in the body. None can claim more virtue than you, my brother. Yochanan was embarrassed and said, You of all who know me know well enough that though I have virtues, I also have many faults. Am I truly worthy to see your spirit even to the point that we can speak? It would not seem so to me, but as you will, so be it. Jesus looked into Yochanan's eyes with love and compassion and said, This is the day you have known would come, when you shall be undone by the spite of a woman. Everything is as it must be, and I could be no other place than with you on this day. Though you leave the earth, the essence of your light will always remain across many religions. Even as you have kindled the Celestine light in many souls while you have been in the body, so you shall continue to bring forth the light in many more for all time. Whereas both good and bad will be spoken of me, your name and the works you have done will be known only for good among men, save a few, for all time. Yochanan let out a big sigh, saying, We have known this day would come for some years. And in truth, it is not hard to leave this wicked world except for those I leave behind that I love and will miss greatly. But I know that it will be but a blink of an eye before we are together again forever in paradise. Knowing that is a great comfort that calms the turmoil of parting. Jesus nodded saying, You will only be parted in the body which is not much different than what has been since you have been preaching and now in prison. But more than when you were in the body, your spirit will be able to commune with the spirits of those you love, and in many ways, you will be closer to them each day than you have ever been able to be during your ministry. As long as their heart still loves you and they think of you in their thoughts, your presence will be felt most profoundly and they will know you are the angel of light, who watches over and counsels them always. Should I do anything more to prepare for what is to come, asked Yochanan. You have been prepared since our last days together in the wilderness. But let us now look upon that which is even now transpiring so you will know with a certainty who is at fault. And who is not. Then the spirit of Jesus waved his hand and the stone wall became as if a large portal into another room, and in the room, they saw the fate of Yochanan come to pass. As they looked into the room, they saw Herodias, the wife of Herod Antipas, speaking harshly to her daughter Salome, who was fair and lithesome, saying, You will do what I require, daughter. Or I shall see you married off to a loathsome man to live in wretchedness and squalor all of your pitiful days. Salome prostrated herself at her mother's feet, pleading, Please, mother, do not make me do this. Horrid thing. I do not wish to dance for Herod. I am not a harem slave. It is not proper for a man other than the one I love to see me displayed in such a manner. Herodias kicked her daughter away from her, and she lay sprawled on the floor, looking up at her mother and searching her eyes. You will do more than dance, daughter. You will dance seductively. I will instruct the servants to keep Herod well supplied with potent wine before you dance, and foolish as he is under the wine, you will be able to elicit promises from him with each sway of hip and, if necessary, shed of clothing. No, mother. No. Salome pleaded. You will make me into a whore. Why oh why? What have I ever done to you to make you hate me so? Herodias answered, I do not hate you at all, as long as you do as I desire, I merely want revenge on the baptizer, and Herod turns a deaf ear to me on this because he fears a revolt by the commoners if he puts the baptizer to death. But with your beauty and sexuality on display and Herod's head fogged by wine, you will be able to get him to give you the head of the baptizer on a platter. He will not want to do it, but it is his birthday and there will be many nobles in attendance.
if you get him to make an open promise to you in front of the nobles, he will not be able to withdraw his promise when you ask for the head of the baptizer. At the words of Herodias, Salome let out a terrible shriek of agony, weeping, and said. Please, do not tell me to do this. I will be cursed forever if it is because of me the baptizer is killed. Your feud has nothing to do with me. Please leave me be, please. I beg you. Herodias strode up to Salome, and pulling her to her feet by her hair, she slapped her twice across the face and then pushed her again to the floor, saying, You will do as I command, you insolent wretch. Everything you have is because of me. And you cannot even begin to imagine how horrible your life will be if you do not exactly fulfill my desires. Salome lay in a heap, crying, while Herodias continued to speak vilely to her, saying, If you so love the baptizer, whom you have never even met, more than me, your own mother, then consider your punishment if you refuse to do as I command. I will disown you. You will be dressed in rags and locked in the dungeon for six moons with only bread and water for food and whatever bugs and rats you can catch. When you come out, you will serve as a whore for Herod's soldiers for another six moons. After that, I shall find a most loathsome man to give you to, but I am sure he will not want to marry such refuse, so you shall be a slave till your last breath. Or you can choose to continue to live a life of ease and privilege, to marry a nobleman within the same six moons, and to always have the finest clothes and food and servants at your call. Your fate is in your hands and yours alone. Decide now. Salome pulled herself up to her knees, and exhaling a deep breath, she said unto her mother, May God forgive me, for I will never forgive myself. I will do as you demand. Too meek am I to withstand the tortures you present today even though I know my actions will inherit many more torments in the world to come. Then the scene faded and the wall became a wall again, and Jesus asked, What do you think of what you have just seen, my brother? Yochanan was obviously disturbed, and he answered, Whatever happens, please do not take vengeance on that girl. It is obvious she is being forced down a path her own good virtue would never choose. But as for her mother, how can someone so callously discard the lives of others? both her daughters and mine? Is she possessed of a devil? Jesus answered, It is the way of many people in power, that they are possessed by a devil of their own creation inside of them inciting unrighteous dominion over others, but it is only their own darkness, which they have embraced instead of their own light. Verily, that which they have given in darkness in life shall be meted out in darkness to them in the next life. What will become of them still in this life? Will the people rise up in revolt as Herod has feared? Yo Chanan inquired. No, they will not, Jesus answered. At least not because of taking your head. But Herod will not keep his kingdom in a way that is pleasing to Rome, and he and Herodias shall be exiled into the wilderness of the Western Empire and shall die in obscurity and poverty. And what of Salome? Yo Chanan asked. Surely she deserves more happiness than she has received in the house of her mother. Salome shall repent of her weakness, and it shall become her strength. And she will find the light, Yo Chanan. She shall become one of us. That makes my heart glad, Yo Chanan replied. And now I have another important question for you, Jesus which is what shall become of my family when I am gone. I know that by the law, we are not brothers of blood, but I wish for you to marry Martha. That she will be within the community of light and have the continual friendship of her sister Miriam in this time and in the coming years. Jesus nodded in understanding, saying, You know it would never be a marriage consummated with intimacy, but you are wise to suggest it as my own time in this world is also short, 
and it would be a way to ensure our wives could remain with each other, without a husband, in the community of light, and also continue to receive support from their family and Lazarus. For the next several hours, Jesus and Yochanan continued to talk, reminiscing about times past and speaking with excitement about times to come, both in the world and in heaven. Meanwhile, the evil designs of Herodias were coming to pass even as she desired. As Herod's birthday party progressed, Herodias made sure the servants kept him liberally supplied with wine, and she had asked many of the nobles to toast him often so that he always had reason to drink again from the cup. Now Herod Antipas had often lusted after his stepdaughter Salome, the daughter of Herodias, but she, knowing his lecherous designs, had always managed to stay far away from him and see him but seldom and then always in the company of others. But on this his birthday, because of the threats of her mother, she came to him in his court dressed provocatively and asked him if he would like her to dance for his birthday. Hardly believing his good fortune, Herod readily agreed, and Salome began to dance a seductive and beautiful dance to simple music, even though her heart ached beyond measure to do so. Herod was spellbound watching her. His mouth gaped open, and even a little drool escaped and ran down his chin. Suddenly, Salome stopped dancing and came up to Herod, asking, Did you like my dance, Herod? Herod replied, It was entrancing, please do continue. Salome looked apprehensively to her mother and then said to Herod, What will you give me, Herod Antipas, if I dance more for you? Herod and all the nobles laughed at the boldness of the girl, and Herod asked, what is the worth of a dance that stirs the loins of men from a daughter of nobility like you? Make your dance even more seductive. Make us want to take you on the floor, and I will give you anything you ask that is in my power to give. Then Salome danced as she had been taught to dance for the husband she hoped to have someday slow and sensuous, tantalizing, showing parts of forbidden flesh and then covering it again as quickly as it had been shown. When she was done, there was great applause and many men ready to seek her in marriage. Then she approached Herod and asked, I am ready for my reward now, uncle. Herod was somewhat giddy thinking she would ask for some a trinket such as girls desire. And he looked forward to giving it to her in front of all the nobles and said, Ask your desire, beautiful one, I am here to fulfill it as I promised. Salome tried to ask the terrible thing her mother had demanded, but when she made attempt to speak, her voice became mute. Though she moved her lips, no words came out. Her mother Herodias commanded a servant to bring her a cup of water, and after drinking it, Salome was sad to see she was able to speak, and she bowed her head and asked in a quiet voice, Bring me the head of Yochanan the baptizer. Hearing her words, Herod was shocked out of his drunkenness. What did you ask, he inquired, hoping to hear something different than he had heard. Salome looked nervously at her mother and then back again to Herod, repeating in a louder voice so all nearby could hear, Bring me the head of Yochanan the baptizer. Herod looked over at Herodias, and knowing how much she hated the baptizer, he suspected she must be behind her daughter's request. He did not wish to kill Yochanan, for he admired his boldness and feared a revolt from the people. Nevertheless, he could not easily back away from his promise given in front of so many nobles and wealthy citizens. Therefore, worrying less about the commoners and more about his peers, he ordered his soldiers to go to the prison and immediately bring him the head of Yochanan on a platter. Now all that had transpired had been watched in the portal in the wall by Jesus and Yochanan, even as they had watched Herodias force her daughter to carry out her evil desires. Yochanan was therefore prepared. As the soldiers approached and was even a bit jovial, saying, perhaps, 
this would be a good time for a heavenly vanishing. Both Jesus and Yochanan laughed, and as the door to the prison opened, Jesus said to Yochanan in seriousness, My spirit will always be with you, my brother, even as yours will be with your family and friends. Come with me now, for you need not suffer the pangs of death. Yochanan gave a great smile, understanding the words of Jesus, and the soldiers entered, having heard his laughter, asking, What are you laughing at, idiot? This is the day of your destruction. Yochanan looked at them and smiled, saying, You are so wrong, friend. This is the day of my eternal life. Then Yochanan's earthly body fell to the floor and breathed its last breath. And Jesus reached forth his hand and grasped the hand of the spirit of Yochanan and led him into the celestine lights of heaven. The nature of eternity Jesus is asked by the father of Martha to speak at the funeral of Yochanan, and he speaks at great length about the nature of eternity and what can be expected when one passes from mortal life. As the sun rose the next morning, the spirit of Jesus returned to his body. The lion remained nestled against this side as he opened his eyes and arose, saying in his mind and heart as well as his words, Thank you, faithful friend. May you live long and always be cautious of men who would hurt you. The lion looked up into his eyes for a moment, unblinking, then turned and quickly disappeared in silence into the underbrush. Absorbed in his thoughts, Jesus descended back to his house and family. As he neared his home, he began to whistle, which was a very uncommon thing for a man to do, but something Jesus did often. Hearing his approaching whistle, Miriam stepped out to greet him with a smile on her face, saying, Jesus, my love, it is good to hear you whistle, for I know then that you are happy inside. Do you have good news for us of Yochanan? Jesus came and embraced her and held her tightly for a moment in silence, and then the children came out to greet him and he opened his arms to them. Turning to Miriam, he answered forthrightly, Though you may be saddened, know that I bring you good tidings. With contempt for a light greater than he could know, Herod thought to behead Yochanan in ignominy, but was left in fear of the power of source when the jailers told him that Yochanan laughed at them and died, robbing Herod of his victory. Miriam swallowed deeply and a tear formed in her eye, and she asked, Yochanan is gone then. Jesus smiled again and said, He has returned from whence he came, having left a light upon the world that will never be extinguished. I am happy for Yochanan, Miriam said. He lives now in light and glory, but what of my sister and their children? I feel their pain already. Let us make haste to go to them. And it came to pass that Jesus and Miriam and their children made a quick journey to Bethany. Though Yochanan's family had been near the castle of Herod by the Salt Sea, they had returned quickly to the house of the parents of Martha and Miriam in Bethany upon word of Yochanan's death, and this Jesus knew. The body of Yochanan had been given to his disciples by the soldiers of Herod, and at the direction of his wife Martha, they had treated it with herbs and spices after the manner of the Egyptians as Yochanan had taught them and followed behind Martha. Bringing the body of Yochanan to the house of her parents for a funeral and burial. Thus it was that the body of Yochanan arrived on the same day as Jesus and his family. And with it came many people, for the word of his death had spread quickly and he was much beloved of the common people. Even many people from Gimron, who seldom left their isolated community, followed after the body of Yochanan. As Jesus and Miriam arrived, Lazarus was waiting at the gate for them, and all the family came out to greet and comfort one another with tears and hugs and soft words of love. And it came to pass on the following day that the body of Yochanan was wrapped in a simple knotted, white linen shroud and buried in a tomb. Owned by Martha's father in a hillside northwest of Bethany.
Over 1,000 people followed the funeral procession and watched in silence as Yukonan's body was interred and the tomb was sealed. Then the father of Martha spoke to the people assembled at the foot of the tomb, saying that Yochanan was a good man who walked with God. And he thanked them for coming to give him their respect. As he sat down, he asked Jesus to speak also to the people. And Jesus rose up, and standing in front of the tomb, he said unto them, It is good to grieve, to cry, and to acknowledge the empty place in your life when one you love is no longer there to hold you and make you laugh and comfort you just by their physical presence. But in your grief, know this with certainty, as surely as the sun rises in the sky, so too rise the souls of all who have died to their reward in an eternity that never ends. Those you love wait for you still, and the virtuous need not fear separation, for mortality is but a heartbeat, and in eternity, they shall not be parted. As in Adam, save for a precious few, all will die a physical death. The spirit essence will rise to the realm's source created for eternity. And because of the love of source, everyone shall live again in the spirit. But unto the virtuous and righteous, it is given not only to live again in the spirit, but for your immortal soul to become one with a glorified new physical body, made whole and perfect by source, for your life eternal. Your future began with your past, for your existence is an eternal walk that never ends. Before you were born of woman, your spirit was created by source, and before it was born upon the earth, the spirit of all things lived in a spiritual realm called Koropian. And to the Koropian, the realm of spirit, all things of spirit born into a physical existence shall someday return even the birds in the air, the fish in the sea, and every blade of grass beneath your feet. So vast it is an expanse that the earthly mind of man cannot even begin to comprehend the magnitude and diversity of the Koropian. Verily, there is nothing that lives or that has lived or that will ever live upon the earth whose spirit was not first created by the source and then existed in the Koropian. Nor is there anything or anyone that has ever lived that shall not return to that realm. But everything that has a spirit does not also have a soul, for only the children of men and women, whose spirits were all birthed in a sacred union of love by your father and mother in heaven, have been given a soul, and more precious than all the treasure of earth, it is. For a soul created in the celestial union of love, it is given an ember of divinity that ever calls the soul to a greater light called Celestine, that it might ever be moved to return to the blessed kingdom from which it came, expanded in stature from its humble beginnings. When the soul comes to earth and it is born of woman into a body of flesh and bones, it dwells in the body of a man or a woman and is thrust into a physical world of darkness and light. Mortality is the crucible, the refiner's fire, and the soul within the body ever beckons to the light, even while the physical man or woman in the body is ever seduced to darkness by the temptations of the world and the pleasures of the body. Therefore, man has been given the years of his life to feel the warmth of his soul calling him out of darkness and back to the celestine light that is his home. Throughout the days of his mortal life, the warmth of the ember of divinity ever burns quietly within the heart of man, that he may always know good from evil and right from wrong, that on the day of the judgment of resonance, he may be weighed in the balance by his own choices and not be able to say, I did not know. Therefore, take heed, for you know not which breath upon the earth shall be your last, whether your life will end when you are young or when you are old. I say unto you, do not ignore the warm and gentle calling of the divine ember of light burning in your bosom. It is calling you from your mundane life to the glory that you can be. Think not to say, today I will eat, drink and be merry, for I still have my old age to become virtuous, for though you may be young, these may be the last days of your old age. When your physical body is laid in the grave, your soul held within. 
your spirit rises immediately to the first judgment of resonance, at the place of transition in the Koropian realm. For a moment, whatever you believed the afterlife to be will seem to be as it is, but then at direction of source, the angels of heaven will come and the illusion will vanish like a mirage on the desert, and the reality of eternity will become apparent. The angels of source shall look with you at the life you have lived in mortality and the virtue you had or had not. Every iota shall not be reviewed, not the rivulets, only the rivers. Then you shall be inexorably drawn to the place of your resonance within the Koropian, the virtuous to a place of warmth and light and the unvirtuous to a place of bitter cold and darkness, the greater the virtue, the brighter the light, the less the virtue, the deeper the darkness. It matters not whether you are of Judah or Samaria or Rome, whether you are a man or a woman, whether you were rich or poor, whether you lived free or as a slave. Each shall be judged, not by what they believed or who they were, but by what they did and even by what they thought but did not do. Did you live a life of virtue? Did you uphold the great commandment and the commandments of Sinai as the ember of God within you ever? Beckoned and guided you to do? Your spirit shall again have a form of a physical man or woman without the substance, and your soul will dwell within it. Those in the Celestine Light will be among their friends and family who also had virtue, and they shall have joy together and delight in new knowledge and opportunities. Those that are in darkness shall be among others in the darkness, but none that they know. Or love or miss or take pleasure to be around. Misery and loneliness shall be the lot of those in the darkness. Their only hope will not be for new knowledge and opportunity like those in the light but simply to regain that which was lost by their foolishness. Though beset by the pain of their own mistakes, those in the darkness will still have a promise. From the lonely place of cold and dreariness where they dwell in misery, far and away, they will see a distant lamp shining from the realm of warmth and happiness, illuminating the path they can still walk to come back into. The light, with faith and repentance, and sorrow and confession and restitution and good works. For each moment, whether one is in the darkness or in the light, every spirit will continue to make choices that can show virtue or vice. As they act upon their choices, they will move either into a greater light or into a deeper darkness. Then at an hour you know not, nor expect, will come a final judgment of resonance upon your soul. Verily, all men and women who have ever lived shall stand someday before the source to be weighed in the balance and judged, not only of their life in mortality, but also their life before mortality and after it. And all the angels of heaven shall stand as witnesses on the day of your final judgment. So shall every person whose life was ever touched for good or evil, by those being weighed, also stand as witnesses to see the life before them with nothing hidden. Nor shall anything that was done, not be seen, for at the final judgment, every iota shall be judged. Of your thoughts and of your actions, both good and bad, from your entire mortal life, nothing shall be hidden. With every good and virtuous deed you ever thought or did, light will flow to and be added to the essence of your soul. And with every evil or loathsome thing you ever thought or did, light will flow out of and be taken away from the essence of your soul. When all has been seen, your soul will be weighed in the balance, and those who lived selfishly, without virtue and kindness and gratitude and stewardship, shall be found wanting. The virtuous will be pulled by resonance of their own light into warmth and greater light, and they shall be given a new and perfected immortal physical body and live near the presence of Source in the Celestine Realm. They shall be given great blessings and new stewardships worthy of their light. But those lacking virtue shall be pulled by their own dark resonance into a bitter cold and deeper darkness, where there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and an endless torment upon the soul for the warmth and light that could have been. But remember, even this is not the end, 
but only the beginning. The love and forgiveness of the father and mother is boundless, and even those in outer darkness can still reach the celestine light and savor the warmth and the love of paradise. Among their family and friends and gain new knowledge and be given a greater stewardship. Even in outer darkness, they will have the choice to do good or do evil, and when the good weighs more than the evil, they will draw light to their soul. After millennia, if they continue to seek the light and do good, their balance shall be with the light, and they will inherit the just reward they deserve after overcoming the suffering and punishments they inflicted upon themselves. Knowing this that for lack of virtue and mortality your soul could be in torment for millennia may each of you choose the light each day. There is still another path in the afterlife, one bestowed upon few and that is to return again to mortality. This was the path that had been given to Yochanan by source. For Yochanan is a choice soul who has faithfully served source from before the creation of the world. Your ancestors knew him as Elijah the prophet, and so great was his vision and power to sway the hearts of men that after he had died in the flesh and had risen to his glory, he was asked by source to come again into the flesh that the world might hear his voice once more. That he might prepare the world for the greater light to come. Thus was the scripture fulfilled saying, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, whose hall prepare the way before you. Therefore, when you remember Yochanan, his laugh, his honesty, and frankness, his simple words of power, and his example of a life of virtue and righteousness, Remember that you had a true prophet of the Most High walking among you. You had a man who had been born twice of woman, walking among you. My hope for each of you is that you will remember this glorious Son of God and live your life as he showed us how to live, full of spirit and love and unwavering virtue and faith. And for those of his family, know that he waits for you even now and that mortality is but a heartbeat of eternity. I admonish you to live in virtue, doing good upon the earth. Fulfilling your stewardships, and surely, you will be together again and for all eternity to come. Then Jesus slapped his hands together and proclaimed, Now, let us rejoice. Play glad music, prepare a feast, talk with one another, and remember Yochanan. Celebrate and thank this wonderful man of God who served you all of his days. Second Marriage of Martha of Bethany By the request of Yochanan and Miriam, and with the agreement of Martha, Jesus and Miriam marry Martha, who becomes Jesus's second wife and Miriam's as well in keeping with the teachings of Celestine Light. But they do so with the understanding that the marriage will never be consummated between Martha and Jesus because she is the eternal maid of Yochanan. The marriage is primarily for the companionship of Miriam and Martha, as well as for the comfort and protection of Martha and her children in the days to come. And it came to pass that Jesus and Miriam lingered in Bethany, and Jesus was weighed heavy by the thought of his promise to Yochanan concerning his wife Martha, for he understood that to marry her, as was Yochanan's wish, would cause contentions with many people, not only the priests, but even among his friends and followers. For a marriage to two sisters at the same time was not permitted among the children of Israel. One day as he was sitting atop a small hill meditating upon this vexing situation, Miriam came to him, asking, Husband, you have been often alone since Yukonan's funeral. As your witness in all things, I wish that you would share with me what it is that you have been in such deep thought about. Jesus touched her face as he loved to do and, looking into her eyes, said, I have been thinking much about you my love and the days that are coming and much about the family of Yochanan. Miriam smiled mischievously, saying, I have been thinking also of the family of Yochanan, and I have come to speak to you about it. Jesus raised his eyebrows in interest and Miriam continued, when we returned from Egypt, we spoke about the day when I might want to have another wife in our family. 
At the time, the thought seemed repugnant to me. But in the days since Yukonan's death, I have thought much of my sister Martha and her children and also of the knowledge that you will be gone from this earth in the days to come and that I will be left alone with our children. It seems most reasonable that I should ask you now to marry Martha, that she can be a wife with me, for we have loved each other since we were children, and when you have left the earth, no greater helpmate could I have than my sister. Though she could remain in Bethany with my parents, I feel she would benefit immensely more if she could be with me during these times of trial and I with her, as will all of our children, that we would all benefit from being a family together at the Community of Light. Jesus gave a big smile of appreciation at the wonder of his wife, and he said unto her, You are a light beyond the angels of heaven. It is upon this very thing that I have been pondering for I gave a promise to Yochanan that I would take Martha as a wife and care for her and their children, but I have been vexed, for to fulfill all righteousness. It is only by your desire and initiative that such a thing could be. Miriam leaned toward him and kissed him on the lips, saying, It is by my desire and initiative, dear husband, and you show how great your love for me is by marrying my sister. Jesus spoke again to her plainly, saying, As you desire so shall it be, if it is also the desire of Martha. It is, replied Miriam, we have already spoken about it. You must know that I told Yochanan that I could not consummate a marriage to Martha, Jesus cautioned, expecting Miriam's agreement. But instead Miriam frowned, saying, I understand the proprieties of the law and that this marriage will cause great opposition among some. But what do I care about the evil thoughts of wicked men or the weight of law without the light of source or compassion or love? I know that you made such a promise from your honor and purity, thinking you would be honoring both me and Yochanan by giving such word. And perhaps that is how it will be. But do not on my account close the door to a fullness of relationship for I will ever be with you, and because you will honor and respect your wives, nothing would occur without the consent and desire of all. Perhaps in your intention to honor and not offend, you would end up causing great offense, for Martha might lose her esteem, thinking you did not desire her in fullness. Even though she would understand the wisdom and reason of our marriage for greater comfort and bond of family, she is also young and may not wish to no longer know the righteous pleasures of the flesh and hence become an elderly woman before her time. I do not ask you to say yet or nay today, but speak to Yochanan about it in the heavens beyond and know that it is my wish that you remain open to fulfilling your full obligations of a husband, as both my sister and I may desire. Jesus never took his eyes from the eyes of Miriam and said unto her, Never has a man had a wife such as I have in you. For your words, I am grateful, but you must understand that Martha is Yukonan's wife for all eternity, not just for this life as men suppose. I can marry her for convenience and security and for the happiness of both of you. But I can never have more than chaste brotherly love and affection for her. Because her marriage in eternity is still in force, to be with her in any other way would be adultery. Then Miriam bowed her head in sorrow, saying, Forgive me, my Lord. I knew this was true, but in my desire for my sister's happiness, I forgot this most important of laws that is not of man, but from source. I am ashamed for what I have said. Jesus touched her face again, saying, Be not ashamed of love nor of your righteous desire for the happiness of those that you love. Know that though I will never touch your sister in intimate ways, nor will any other man, she will not be unfulfilled or an old woman before her time. Miriam nodded. Slowly, understanding the meaning of his words, and she was happy. Upon returning, they went immediately and spoke with Martha. Miriam explained all that she and Jesus had spoken of and agreed upon, and Martha fell to her knees before Jesus, saying, 
My lord, it is my honor to become your wife. In your face and your words, I see my Yochanan, and I know this does not displease you. Living with you and my sister in holy. Marriage will seem almost as if Yochanan still walks beside me. Jesus lifted her to her feet, holding her two hands, and said unto her, Though you have yet many years upon the earth, never forget that Yochanan looks upon you every moment and that you shall be with him again for time and all eternity. For the years I have left upon the earth, it is my honor to embrace you into my family and deliver you to the comfort of your sister, who loves you with a pure love. Then Jesus and Miriam and Martha went to tell the sister's parents and family of their intention to be married, and as they had feared. Except for Lazarus, great was the discord at their announcement. The father of the sisters came to Jesus, saying, How can I condone this? You know it is not permitted by the law to marry two sisters. Jesus answered him, saying, In the beginning, it was not so. I care not for the laws of men, though they pretend to be of God. Nor would I do anything that was not pleasing to my father and mother in heaven. But the father of Miriam and Martha was not consoled by the words of Jesus, and he left immediately in distress to go and speak with the Levites. Shortly thereafter, he returned and two Levites came with him, and they were very agitated because of what he had told them. Approaching Jesus, one said unto him, We have been told that you think to marry a second daughter of Abra of Bethany. Such a thing is strictly forbidden in the law. Besides the shame it would bring upon this esteemed house, the consequences could be very grave for you. Jesus answered unto them, If man's laws are in opposition to God's laws, to obey one is to disobey the other and to find favor of one but wrath of the other. Whom do you think I choose to obey and find favor with, man or my Father in heaven? The Levite's eyes widened in disbelief at Jesus' words, and the other Levite said unto him, It has been said by the people that you are a learned rabbi. Therefore, how can you be so ignorant of the law? Jesus answered unto them, You charge like lions for the kill, understanding not the nature of your prey. Verily, it would be easier for a lion to eat a millstone than for you to move me today. The law you call upon condemns not the marriage of a man and two sisters, but that a man should not cleave unto two sisters. I declare to you and all the world that I shall not cleave unto Martha of Bethany, but shall always hold her apart as the wife of my brother who has died in the flesh. But it is not because of your law that I make this declaration, but because of the love of my brother and his wife. Verily, I declare unto you, your law is not a law of God, but a mockery of God issued by the vanity of men. Did not the tribes of Israel spring from the loins of Jacob? And did Jacob not marry the sisters Leah and Rachel, the daughters of Laban, and even cleave unto them both and this in righteousness? and from this sprang many of the tribes of Israel, including the Levites, from whence. Come you? Do you think Source is a changing God? That the laws of heaven given to men would change with a new generation, that good would become evil and evil good? I declare unto you, no. Source is the same, yesterday, today, and forever. God does not. Give the commandments of Sinai to one generation, saying to not covet or steal and then to a later generation, saying that it is now good to covet and steal. Neither does Source rejoice in the marriage of two sisters to Jacob, blessing them with the fruitfulness from whence sprang most of the Hebrews who walk the land of Palestine today and then make a new and opposite law, saying it is forbidden to marry two sisters. Only men could think up such contradictory doctrines, for source is like a rod of iron, constant and firm, unmoving and unyielding in the foundations of light. In no other way could man depend upon God. Verily, I declare unto you, 
you insult and mock source with your petty laws. Therefore, get away from my sight and do not return until you bear the fruits of repentance. The Levites hurried away from his mighty countenance and the force of his words, and all the family and their friends that had been watching were once again in awe of Jesus. Abra came to him contritely and said, You have opened up my eyes, and my ears have heard different things than I had thought. Forgive me for my weakness. I would be honored to give Martha to you in marriage. And it came to pass that Jesus and Miriam and Martha were married one to another after the manner that Jesus taught, and Abra threw a great feast that lasted for three days. Though there were some in Bethany who still spoke ill of the marriage, and harsh words of it were carried to the priests of Jerusalem, among Jesus and Miriam and Martha and their children and kinsfolk, there was a deep sense of unity and happiness. Challenges of the Children of Light Jesus explains to his disciples the difference between the laws of heaven and the laws of the natural world. He tells them that he will teach them the secrets of heaven, which will be known by no others and by which all things are possible. And it came to pass that on the first day of the feast, the disciples of Jesus arrived from Lake Genesaret, and they were sore distressed upon learning that Jesus had taken Martha as a wife and that they had not been invited to attend the wedding. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, came to them, saying, My brothers of light, do not despair that you were not present for our marriage. Know that my days upon the earth are numbered and they are not many. Therefore, each one is precious, and we could not wait for your arrival, for already the days following the feast and all the days to come have been assigned for greater tasks and of those things, you are very much a part. Upon hearing his words, his disciples were mollified and apologized to Jesus for their weakness of understanding. Without speaking of it again, Jesus bade them to enjoy the first day of the feast and then meet with him in council upon the sunrise at the hill near the house of Martha's father. The following day, the five disciples that had come from Lake Genesaret came at daybreak to the top of the hill, along with Lazarus, the brother of Miriam and Martha and found Jesus and Miriam already there, kneeling in prayer facing one another, with hands held and heads touching. The disciples of Genesaret and Lazarus stood aside quietly with their heads bowed, honoring the sacredness of the prayer until they were finished, and then they approached. Jesus and Miriam rose to meet them, and Jesus embraced each one with various greetings, while Miriam put her hands together upon her chest and, holding their eyes, bowed her head slightly toward each as they came before her, calling them by name and greeting them with namaste. Jesus bade them all to sit upon the ground in a circle with Miriam at his right hand, and he said unto them, You think that your lives have changed since you became my disciples, but the change has been only like the Jordan after a small rain like the river that swelled for a time with new water, you have grown with new knowledge. But your lives have been affected only a bit. In the coming days, if you will follow me, you must be prepared to have them affected greatly. I will tell you now of some of the things that shall come to pass in the lives of those who walk with me and are my disciples. You will sacrifice much and I will understand if the burden is too great and you desire simply to return to the life you have always lived. You know I teach the true Celestine light of heaven and that it is oftentimes at odds with the laws of men and the falsehoods taught by men in the name of God. Because of this, as word of my teachings spread, the opposition against me, from Caesar and Herod and the Sanhedrin, shall grow. I shall be opposed openly and in secret even unto my death, and those that follow me shall be cast into the same storm, and many will suffer similar woes. Even should you live to old age, you will be away from your wives and children many more days than you are with them. You will find no reward of money, and though you will always have enough to eat, you will never grow fat from having too much. 
many of you shall be arrested and thrown into prison, and some shall be persecuted unto death at the hands of those angry at you for preaching my words, unless you gain the full knowledge and power of Celestine adepts. Despite the dedication of your life to preaching the Celestine Light of Source, you will find precious few who will heed your words and will be saddened by the many who will pervert them for their own ends. After all you have sacrificed to bring forth the Celestine Light, you will see false churches spring up in my name that teach not my teachings, and they shall draw many to them, for their path is easy. In the generations to come, these churches shall grow mighty and wealthy. They shall have a form of godliness, but will be empty of the true spirit of source and barren of the fullness of truth. Of the things that you shall teach, the very words and truth you heard from my lips. You will find few who will listen and embrace the light for fear of what others will think of them or the persecutions they might invite or from their own weakness to give up the comfort of the sandals they have always worn. The few children of light that gather in my name, faithfully living my truth that you have shared, shall not have temples of gold and precious gems, but will be thankful just to have a roof over their heads. Knowing all this, what do you say? Amram raised his right index finger and said, First, know that I will follow you through any storm and count the endurance of any pain as evidence to source of my faithfulness to the true light. But I would like to understand why it is that Source would allow all the things you have said will befall us to come to pass? Why would Source allow the true Celestine Light to be perverted by men and your faithful disciples to be persecuted even to death? How can it be that those who would follow the Celestine Light of Source would only have the means to worship in simplicity, while those who teach a perversion of your words would find prosperity and be able to build grand temples in which to worship Source. I am just a simple fisherman and know my understanding is slow, but it would seem to me that everything would be the opposite of this, that God would reward those who are faithful to the Celestine Light and make difficult the paths of those who teach perversions. Jesus smiled at the words of Amram and said unto him, Your questions show a depth of understanding greater than you give yourself in your humility, and it is important that you comprehend the answers. Know that there are laws of heaven, and there are laws of earth. I speak not of laws made by men, but of immutable laws of existence. There is the law of the sun. If you go outside on a cloudless day, you will see the sun in the sky and feel its warmth upon your shoulder. If you are righteous, you will see and feel the sun, and if you are wicked, you will see and feel the sun. To see the light and feel the warmth of the sun is a law of earth that comes to all and makes no qualms about who it rewards with its light and warmth. Regardless of who you are, if you stand outside at midday, beneath a cloudless sky, you will receive the reward of the light and warmth of the sun. So too there is the law of the storm. When the clouds darken and the wind blows and the rain comes in torrents, you know that if you choose to be outside, uncovered, you will quickly become wet and uncomfortable. It does not matter whether you are rich or poor, wicked or righteous, if you stand outside, uncovered in a storm, you will suffer the consequences. So too, there are several laws pertaining to fire. If you build it correctly and strike a good flint, you will create a fire. If you do not get too close, it will warm you on a cold night, but if I a step into it, you will get burned. Whether you are rich or poor, wicked or righteous, the laws of the fire treat all men equally, except for Celestine adepts that have mastered control of the natural world. I have spoken to you only about laws of the natural world, which are easy for all men to understand. But there are many other laws that are more subtle, and the consequences from obeying or disobeying these laws can be far greater. I speak of the laws of interaction from one person to another, from a man to a man, and a man to a woman, and a woman to a woman, and a parent to a child, 
and a child to a child. And I speak also of the laws of blessing and consequence, some of which are easy to know and others which require insight and understanding. If you needed to dig a well and you and your brothers applied yourselves with diligence throughout the day, at the end of the day, you would have dug deep enough to be blessed and rewarded for your efforts with cold, clear water. But if you desired a well and were slothful, working for a short while, then taking a long break, working a bit more, then taking a longer break, as nightfall descended, the consequence of your lack of diligence would only be a small dry hole. These are the blessings and consequences of obeying or disobeying the law of diligence. Remember, the laws of life have no favorites among men. Without passion, they reward only those who follow the path they dictate. If wicked brothers apply the law of diligence to dig a well, they will be rewarded for their efforts with the water they seek. Even as the righteous brothers, if they are slothful, will suffer the consequence of their disobedience of this law. Therefore, when you ask how it is that those who teach the false truth might have prosperity, while those who teach the true Celestine light may not, understand that it is not by their worthiness that they manifest their situations, but by their understanding and obedience to immutable laws of heaven and earth. Those who love ease and comfort and power heed the call of priests of falsehood because they have itching ears, seeking those who will tell them what they wish to hear, and so they hear, pay generous alms, say your prayers, and listen to the scriptures on the Sabbath. And all is well every other day of your life. These doctrines are delightful to those who love the ways of the world, for then they suppose to themselves that they can forget about source and the ways of God and do as they will accept on the Sabbath. Therefore, each of the other days, they devote to acquiring the spoils of the world, and in the ways of the world, they become great. But the children of light understand that the path of source is a way of life each and every day, not just on the Sabbath, and that the steps they take each day bring them abiding joy, not just in this world, but also in the world to come. While the foolish and worldly are spending their days making money and immersing themselves in the pleasures of the world, the children of light are investing their days playing with their children, loving and comforting one another in word and deed helping the poor, giving their time to serve Source, honoring the temples of their bodies, helping their community, and building qualities of good character and all manner of virtue in their hearts and the actions of their lives. That which you pursue with focus, you are likely to obtain. Those who love the ways of the world obtain the fruits of the world because that is what they seek, while giving just a passing nod to the ways of God. Those who love the ways of Source obtain the fruits of God because that is what they seek, while giving just a passing nod to the ways of the world. Therefore, each gains that which they seek and lacks that which they acknowledge only sufficiently to appease the necessities. Understand too that there are laws of wickedness as well as laws of righteousness, for if a robber accosts a lone traveler and holds a dagger to his throat, demanding his coins, he has a great certainty from his past experience that the man so attacked will yield up his coins. He has employed the law of intimidation, a wicked law, but a law nonetheless. But for every law, there is an opposite law that will oppose it and overcome it, if applied sufficiently. In the days to come, you will be learning much about these many laws and how to utilize them and how to counter evil when it is cast upon you. Therefore, take heed to be astute students, for your very lives and livelihood will be at stake in the future. When a false priesthood teaches a path of ease and the true priesthood teaches a more difficult way, which do you think more people will embrace? If a false priesthood says, sacrifice a lamb or two turtle doves and all will be well between you and God regardless of how you live or what you eat or drink or take to befuddle your mind but the true priesthood says, honor the temple of your body, 
eat only living foods that grow upon the earth, drink only pure drinks, and take nothing that befuddles your mind, which priesthood will draw more followers. If a false priesthood says, Pay great alms that we may build a temple of gold and your sins will be forgotten, but the true priesthood says, only a sincere and contrite repentance and restitution will wash away the sins of men, which priesthood will draw more followers? If a false priesthood says, become rich, live in a grand manner, but give generously to the church, and you will be loved of God, but the true priesthood says, live in simplicity and give your access to the poor, which priesthood will draw more followers? If the false priesthood says, give your intimate affections to whoever you desire, just continue to show your devotion to the church with your alms, and all will be well between you and God, but the true priesthood says, honor the sacredness of intimacy only within the union of marriage, which priesthood will draw more followers? If the false priesthood says, only men may hold the priesthood or speak in council, but the true priesthood says, men and women are equal before God, which priesthood will draw more followers? If the false priesthood says, men who lay with men and women who lay with women must be shunned and even stoned, but the true priesthood says, the choice of intimate relationship is not important as long as it is a union in marriage and virtue, which priesthood will draw more followers? If the false priesthood in collusion with Caesar says, Obey the laws of the land, and you shall find peace and security and be in God's favor, but the true priesthood says, Obey not the laws of men that are in opposition to the teachings of heaven. Even if it brings the wrath of Caesar upon you, which priesthood will draw more followers? If the false priesthood says, Believe only in Jesus of Nazareth and by this alone, you shall go to heaven for all your sins will be forgiven, but the true priesthood says, Believe in the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth and demonstrate the truth of your belief by doing good works. Having virtue and good character, and obeying the great commandment and the commandments of Sinai, which priesthood will draw more followers? If the false priesthood says, Whatever sins you do, just give alms and confess them to a priest and they will be forgiven, but the true priesthood says, Repentance comes only after remorse, confession, restitution, forsaking of the sin, and humbly asking source and those that have been wronged for forgiveness, which priesthood will draw more followers? Verily I say unto you, Straight and narrow is the way that leads to the Celestine kingdom of source, and very few will be those who are willing to walk the virtuous path that leads to physical resurrection and immortal exaltation. But wide and easy is the path upon the earth that leads to misery and separation of the body and the soul in the worlds to come, and many are those that shall go that way. Therefore, understand that the false priesthood uses laws of persuasion that allow men to imagine that they can be wicked and still be welcomed into heaven. But no unclean thing can enter into the presence of source in the Celestine kingdom on high. And those who live their lives in wickedness, thinking they will inherit glory, have deluded themselves into eternal misery. The seeds you plant in life blossom in eternity. That which you sow, so shall you reap. In the days to come, there will be many who will profess to follow me, but only a few who will live their lives as I have shown and taught them to live, that they may become more than they are. When those who have been faithful to the Celestine light knock upon my door in the world to come, I shall welcome them to their glory, even those who professed me not in life but nevertheless lived my teachings by the light of God that was within their heart. But those who professed me, even loudly from the rooftops, 
but did not do the things which I taught, will not see me or my kingdom. Be mindful of the things I have revealed to you this day, as we go into the world to preach the gospel. Of Celestine Light, remember that many will come to it, some because of the miracles, some because of rebellion against Caesar, some because of the welcome of the community, some because their noble soul pulls them toward the light. But when those who seek only miracles find none forthcoming when they desire, they shall fall away. When those who seek only rebellion find we are not trying to overthrow the government, they will fall away. When those who seek only the embrace of community but find they must give as well as receive, they shall fall away. When those who are pulled to a brighter light are unwilling to hold it because it requires them to change too much, they will fall away. In the end, the refiner's fire will take away the dross, leaving only the pure in heart. Look diligently therefore for those precious few of pure light. Among the crowds, look for those whose countenance shines above all others, for the celestine light will shine in the face of all true children of light, even those who have never heard of me or my teachings. Teach to them what I have taught to you by my words and deeds. Know that there shall be great grief upon the people of this land in the next generations. The people think they suffer now under the yoke of the Romans, but their suffering shall be greater in the days to come. We are making a community of light at the delta of Genesaret, but know it will be abandoned in the days to come and not one stone will be left upon another that is not overturned. The faithful shall scatter across the world, a few here, a dozen there, another beyond. So shall the seeds of the celestine light of source, which you will plant, settle upon many lands until the time of their maturation. Comes in the flowers of truth and light planted in the dust of yesterday's bonus blossom in fullness and glory. Therefore, do not concern yourselves with riches or grand temples or gathering great numbers of believers. Instead, concern yourself with finding and teaching the chosen few who are true, royal children of light. Know that Source will give a great blessing to all those of noble heart that you find and cherish. The resonance of truth will pass through their loins from one generation until the next. In the Epoch of Promise, when the Fullness of the celestine light shall be given again among men, the descendants of the chosen shall feel the resonance that burned in the hearts of their ancestors. And the seeds sown by their progenitors shall grow and bear fruit within their hearts. Then Cephas asked of Jesus, You are here and have the power of heaven upon you. We are few in numbers, but mighty in our faith and our willingness to spread the celestine light you give us. How is it that we can fail to establish a torch of truth that is never extinguished? Why must we suffer so and why must the children of light be scattered? I still do not fully understand why that which is false would be allowed by source to rise. While that which is true would be allowed to vanish from the sight of men. Jesus answered, Though I walk among you, I do not compel you or anyone to follow me. Those who walk my path despite the challenges do so because they desire to feel the love and celestine power of God, burning in their bosom greater than they desire a life of conformity and ease or enticing words of emptiness. Nor should you think that suffering must be your lot. Among the children of light, let there always be love and support for one another and may the sweetness of this comfort and the sure knowledge of your eternity ever shield you from the pain and inflict ions of the world. Nor is the scattering of the children of light in the days to come a curse, but a blessing, for it is in distant lands and upon distant shores that they will find sanctuary and a peace they could never know in the lands of Rome. Nor should you wish to give more command upon the affairs of men to source than source would take. For each man and woman to grow beyond their birth, they must be free to choose their course in life, they must be free to make mistakes and amends. Even though they may be slaves, bound to a master who controls their days, 
their eternal fate is still in their own hands by the choices of virtue and character they make every day. There was a sower that sowed his seeds, and some fell upon the road and was walked upon and eaten by birds, some fell upon rock, and as soon as it sprouted, it withered away because it could find no moisture, some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it, cutting it off from the light of life. Some fell in a marsh and sprouted but could find no soil of substance and also perished, but some fell upon a cultivated field of fertile ground and sprang up and bore fruit that fed the cultivators and all whom they called family. You are the sours, and so it shall be with the seeds of Celestine light which you sow. Some will be sown in the byways of the world, it will be crushed and taken away by those who will pervert it that they might teach their version of truth without the fullness of light and evidence for men to compare. Some of your seeds will fall upon people who are like the rocky ground, they are closed tightly like a clam and are afraid to even consider any light other than the little candle they have. Some of your seeds will be cast among thorns, they will begin to sprout in the hearts of those who want to know and believe, but will wither when they are shunned by their friends and family and will fall away in their desire to please others instead of God. Some will be sown in the swamp of zealots, who, lacking a foundation of balance, will grow furiously for a time only to fall away when their narrow-minded zeal finds no support among the children of light. But take heart, some of your seeds will be sown among those who will live and support one another in communities of light. As long as true believers gather to the fertile field of community and live the light they have been given in fullness, they will always grow and prosper. If they do not choose to live it in fullness and their community falters, it is by their own choices and actions, and Source would have it be no other way. For only by allowing each person to make their own choices can each person be given an eternal reward according to their faithfulness and their deeds. Never forget that many are called, but few are chosen. Nor is it Source who chooses, but each of those that have been called choose whether they will heed the call and walk in the celestine light that their heart tells them is true, or follow the enticing words of conformity and ease spoken to them in the world. Therefore, I say unto you, follow me, do as I do, speak as I speak, live as I live. Let those who would inherit the blessings of the children of light in this world and the next do likewise, and heaven shall pour forth blessings upon you greater than you can imagine. You shall become Celestine adepts and have the power to control your destiny. You will be given the secrets of heaven by which all things are possible such secrets as shall be known to no others of this generation. The challenges of these early days are your growing pains. And it is not until you are fully grown that all things will be understood in fullness. Sermon in Kafar Salama Jesus and Miriam return to Kafar Salama with Jesus' disciples at the request of Gimel. Jesus gives a sermon that over 200 people attend. As it takes place during the time of the midday meal, some people bring food, but most do not, so Jesus asks those who have food to please give it to his disciples so they can distribute it to everyone present. The amount they gather only fills four small baskets, but after Jesus blesses the food, there is a never ending supply coming out of the baskets and there is enough to abundantly feed everyone in the crowd. Jesus speaks about obeying the law and the fear of God versus the love of God, as well as which laws are the creations of man in the name of God and which are actually of God. And it came to pass that early in the morning, after they had broken their evening fast and communed with the earth through the contemplative movements, Miriam and Jesus, accompanied by his disciples, began the journey to return to the community of light at the delta of Genesaret. Martha did not journey with them but remained behind to spend more time with her parents. She made plans to bring all of their children in a fortnight, 
in company with Lazarus when he made his monthly trip to Tiberias to meet with the manager of the family fish business on the lake. And it came to pass that Jesus and his followers came upon the town of Kafar Salama as they travelled north on the road. Seeing it in the distance, Jesus bade everyone to stop their journey for a moment, and they listened intently as he shared the events that had occurred on the road north of the town when he and Miriam had journeyed through there previously. While he was speaking to his disciples, a citizen of Kafar Salama passed them on the road as he was returning to town. He was one of the men that had previously confronted Jesus. He recognized him immediately and, without a greeting, hurried into town to alert the citizens that Jesus had returned. Seeing the startled recognition on the man's face and his haste to arrive at the town, Cephas conjectured, from the rudeness of that fellow, who gave not even the slightest greeting, I'd say the way is even now being prepared for a less than friendly welcome. The other disciples nodded in assent, but Jesus merely smiled. Knowing the true intent of the citizen of Kafar Salama. Nor did they have to wait long to discover that intent, for within minutes, a group of at least three dozen men issued forth from the town and came down the road toward them with obvious intent. We are outnumbered and virtually weaponless, Amram said. Looking to Jesus, he asked, how shall we protect ourselves if they attack us? But Jesus was as calm as a summer morning and said unto him, Fear not, they mean us no harm. Despite his words, the disciples were tensed for a confrontation. But as Jesus had assured them, when the men were near, one of them opened his arms to embrace Jesus who returned his welcome, saying, It is good to see you again, Gimel. I can see from your countenance that the Celestine light of Source has grown in your heart since we last met. Gimel nodded enthusiastically and said, So it has, good Rabbi, and also among many of the others that have come out to greet you. Jesus gave his great warm smile and said unto him, it gladdens my heart to know that the few seeds I planted when last I was here have taken root and grown. Then looking at the faces of the men of Kafar Salama, he inquired, But where is Ephras? I would have hoped to see him again as well. Gimiel looked down at the dirt for a moment and said, I know not where he has gone, good Jesus. Many of us followed your admonition and welcomed him or at least did not malign him. But some others who did not hear you speak in person still treated him with disdain and continued to threaten his life. He remained but a few days in Kafar Salama after you left, and I know not what became of him. And your kind heeded rabbi? Jesus inquired. He remains still in Kafar Salama, answered Gimiel. But I doubt he will show his face while you are in town, as you embarrassed him greatly when you were last here, showing by your teachings, words, and wit upon whom the light of Source truly dwelt. And it came to pass that Jesus and the disciples mingled and spoke with the men from Kafar Salama for some time, standing on the road outside of town. They introduced themselves and told of their families and their experiences with Jesus. Gimiel asked Jesus, Would you bless us with a sermon while you are here? For we may never again have you among us. Of course, Gimiel, Jesus answered. Let us pass through the town and you can gather those who would desire to hear my words. On the small hill north of town, I will speak at the midday. And it came to pass that upon the midday, Jesus and his disciples sat atop the small hill and a crowd of over two hundred men, women, and children came to hear him speak. The men sat to one side and the women and children to another, as was the way of the people of Kafar Salama. Some had brought food with them to eat their midday meal while listening to his words, but most had not, and seeing this, Jesus asked that those who had brought food would bring it to his disciples so that they might share it and distribute it to all. 
Those with food came up to the hill and gave the disciples the fish, bread, vegetables and cheese that they had brought, and it filled four small baskets. Looking at the small amount of food and the large number of people, Yohanan commented to no one in particular, there will only be enough for each person to have maybe one or two bites. Then Jesus came and blessed the food, saying, Our Father and Mother in heaven, we are grateful for this bounty and the good earth, which has borne it. We ask your blessings upon it, that it will come forth. In Abundance And Deliciousness that all might be filled and nourished. He beckoned for the disciples to bring some large empty baskets, and taking a loaf of bread from one of the small baskets, he began to break it into large chunks and place them inside the larger basket. Soon the larger basket was filled, and he bade some of the men from Kafar Salama to distribute it to the people. Likewise, using two hands, he scooped several of the small fish from the smaller basket and placed them into the larger basket and continued to do this until the larger basket was filled to a weight that two men could carry and then bade some men from Kafar Salama to make sure each person had enough for their satisfaction and to return for more if they were lacking. In like manner were the vegetables and cheese distributed. And the disciples were astounded by the miracle they were witnessing as the four small baskets never diminished the food they held, even though the items from them filled several larger baskets. Even among the people of Kafar Salama, it became evident that there was far more food remaining after they had all eaten their fill than had been present before the first bite had been taken. And seeing this, they spoke in quiet wonder to one another and gave great attention to Jesus as he began to speak. And Jesus said unto them, My brothers and sisters of Kafar Salama, when I was last here, I heard much about the law and what the law is recorded in the scrolls of the prophets say about the things you can and cannot do in your life. These laws are said to be from source, therefore, who cannot obey them without condemnation. The penalty for disobedience, for even small things, is severe. And for greater things, death awaits. Knowing a sword hangs ever over your head lest you take too many steps on the Sabbath or eat or touch. Something that is unclean, or Pointing to the crowd, sit men with women. Does the fear of the law and the punishments therein not weigh upon you and cause you to act or not act from fear, rather than love of God? I speak now as I spoke before when I came upon your town. Because I see you are very devout in keeping the law, I will speak more upon it because of my love for you. Only man can craft a God that must be obeyed because of fear not love. Only man can create a God who demands actions which are contrary to common sense and God's own interest. Every person upon the earth lives today because Source made alive their first ancestors in the Garden of Eden. Just as your children are a part of you, so every person who has ever walked he earth from the descendants of the Garden has a spark of God within them. Every man from every country is your brother and every woman from every country is your sister. I say unto you with words of soberness that every man and woman upon the earth is a child of God. Would you kill your own children because they disobeyed you in some slight thing or even in some great thing? How about your neighbor's children? How about the children of the Egyptians or the Romans? I hope you would not. Do you think that source? a God that is real and living, and not a contrived creation of men, would demand some of the children upon the earth to kill others or would give favor to some over others, when all are children of source. Would a God that created all people as equal sons and daughters demand that some be sacrificed at the altar, slaughtered in war, or given as plunder to be raped and enslaved? Could you separate your children and say, these will find my favor, but these are to be raped, enslaved, and killed as needs be.
Do you truly believe that a true and living God, Creator of all that is, Father and Mother of all the children of men, would ever treat their children so blessed with love in creation to such a despicable and ignominious end? You have heard it said that it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for the smallest of the laws to pass away. But I say unto you it is easier for a lamb to get into heaven than for a man who obeys a law that is contrary to the very essence of source. Source is love. Source is inspiration. Source is fair and just. Source is compassionate and understanding. Source loves virtue in whomever it is found and gives no preference to one child over another for any other reason. Source cherishes the life of all things that have been created and blesses the man that honors and protects life. But men who take life without necessity for food or in self-defense bring a curse upon themselves, not from source, but from their own soul, for their inner guilt cries out for the sin they have done against God. Consider how you would be if you were the perfect father or the perfect mother to your children, as you would so be, even so is source many times more to each of you, the children of God. Nor would true laws of the true God demand the beauty of the body to be hidden. What would be the point to create the most magnificent work of art that is, the human body, only to hide it forever under great coverings of clothing? If the body is not hidden but seen, there is greater incentive to honor it and honor the Creator by keeping it fit and trim. But if it is forever hidden under flowing and voluminous clothing, with only the eyes and the feet to be seen, then it can be allowed to get fat and sagging, for who will know or see it to condemn the poor steward? And why do you think men and women lust for one another? Is it evil as many would have you believe? Consider that it is a desire source instilled in every person. How then can a gift of God be evil? Is it simply to ensure the race of men perpetuates as others proclaim? If that were so, then you would cease to have desires of that kind once you were beyond the age of fertility, for there would be no need for such desires. But any of you who have passed that age know of a certainty that the desire remains. Verily, I declare unto you that you desire one another and can give physical pleasure to one another because that is a gift from source that you might always have a source of joy and pleasure, even if you do not have a single coin or a roof over your head or food to eat, and not just any joy or pleasure, but one that fills you with a glow that lasts and a happiness that does not diminish with the waning day. But in this joy, procreation does bear weight. For within the true laws of Source, the Great Commandment says to multiply and fill the earth and the commandments of Sinai say to not fornicate or commit adultery. Therefore, it is only in righteousness that men and women may quench the fires of their lust, only within the halo of a marriage given before witnesses, with commitment for life. Source gave the commandments, Source gave the desire that stirs the loins, and these two were given that they might be fulfilled in each other, even as the man and woman are fulfilled in one another. Marriage then becomes the only resolution that honors God and fulfills the desires that stir the loins. It is for children that all of this is so, that they might be born into homes of balance and light and have the best chance to grow into balance and light in their lives and it is for the parents that they might overcome their weaknesses and selfishness and make their weaknesses their strengths. But never forget this total pleasure has been given to you by source to enjoy, and enjoy often for all of your life. Remember, the time to procreate is but a few hours in your lives, all the other days source has given this great gift of pleasure and comfort and love that you might have joy and fulfillment that is above the cares of the world. Bending his left arm and holding his chin with his hand, Jesus looked toward the heavens and asked aloud, 
let us consider what other laws of the prophets can be revealed as merely the foolishness of men who would be kings over their brethren. Certainly, circumcision must fall into this pit. Consider that if circumcision was necessary or important, the sons of men would be born from the womb already circumcised. Who is man to cut up a child made in the image of God so that the child is no longer in the image of God? Why would Source create a child one way only to ask the child to be disfigured by men once he was born? They say it is to distinguish the sons of Israel from the Gentiles and to show obedience to God, but I say unto you if that were important, the sons of Israel would have been born circumcised Verily, Source would ask men to cut off their own finger to show obedience before they would ask them to cut an innocent and defenseless child. In my condemnation of the law, know that I do not condemn all of it for there are some parts that are reasonable and just, but they are few and the unreasonable and unjust are many. Therefore, I will teach you some of the signs by which you can judge a law of source from a law of men in the scrolls of the prophets. If obedience to a law gives Celestine light to your life and only light and causes the light within you to shine and to always shine, then it is of source and you should give it a place in your heart and life. Respect those laws which have eternal significance and bring Celestine light to you. Cherish those laws and live them as your life. Do not listen to the interpretations of men concerning the law and the prophets, for many are the laws of man that have been said to be the laws of God but have no value in the world to come or value in the world in which you now live. Verily, if it is of God, it will have eternal significance and will bring celestine light into your life, and if it is of man, it will have no consideration or merit for your entry into glory in heaven and, instead, will often be onerous and not of light. The ways of Source are simple to live and easy to understand, not convoluted and ritualistic like the ways of men and the religions of men. The laws of men have no meaning in the world to come, but the laws of source involve the purity of your heart and your good works in this life, and those jewels of character have great weight on the day of eternal judgment. If a law is of man, it will give power to men to judge the spiritual correctness of other men, and God has not given to men to judge the spiritual worth of souls or to take life or abase the spirit of the children of God upon the earth. Nevertheless, there are some things in the traditions and the law of the prophets that are true and worthy, given for your benefit and edification, and these are easy to recognize, for they have significance both in this world and the world to come. Verily, if that which is given or expected expands your spirit, or is for your health or for the strength of your family, or for building your good character, or for helping your relationships to be deeper and more fulfilling, or to increase your knowledge. And does not demean you or take away your spirit or constrain your finite time upon the earth or hurt others and keeps balance in your life and promotes harmony and peace in your heart and among all men and women, the Naya may know that it is good and of God. Then Jesus stopped speaking, and gathering his wife and his disciples, he bade the people of Kafar Salama farewell, for he desired still to travel far upon this day. Gimiel came to him as he prepared to leave and said, Good Jesus, once again my heart has been moved by the wisdom and sense of your words. May I follow you and become one of your disciples. Pointing to some of his friends, he said, Not just me, but several of. My friends would also be honored if we could walk with you wherever you go and hear more of your divine wisdom. Jesus grasped his right forearm in a way that Gimiel also grasped his, and holding him thus, he said unto him, My friend, you are welcome among us and any that would come as well. 
but already I have taken my brothers here. Pointing to his disciples, from their wives and families. If you would truly help build the kingdom of God, come with your wives and children to the delta of Lake Genesaret, where you will find a community of light, wherein dwells my family and the families of all of my disciples, and where I most often reside. We are in need of stout men, devout women, and happy children to build up this community of God. Will you accept this important calling? Gimiel bowed his head, saying, I cannot express the joy my heart feels. Nothing has ever felt so right. I know this is where I belong and where my family should be. And it came to pass that as Jesus continued northward on his journey home with Miriam and his disciples from the Delta, they were joined by Gimiel and his wife and children and three of his friends and their wives and children. And great was the joy in Capernaum and Bethsaida upon the return of Jesus and Miriam and the disciples to their wives and children and the joy upon meeting the people of Kafar Salama who had come to join the family of light. From this day the light goes forth. After returning to the community of light at Lake Genesaret, Jesus asks Cephas to form and administer the community. When Cephas chooses only men to be on the council, Jesus speaks to him about the merits of balance in all things and overcoming the incorrect teachings and prejudices he has previously known. And it came to pass that Jesus, Miriam, and the disciples that came with them arrived at the delta of Genesaret, and for some days each stayed mostly with their families, taking care of family. Business After the first day and night of visiting with the members of the community, Jesus and Miriam retired to their house to fast and pray and did not join the community for meals for three days. The community of light at the Delta was growing with new members, in addition to the several families that already resided there. Before going into seclusion to fast and pray, Jesus asked Cephas to form and administer the community, to call others to be a council and to help all the men to be immediately employed in fruitful labor that benefited both their families and the community. Now Cephas pondered greatly upon the men he should call to be a council of elders to help him plan for the activities and policies of the community. Thinking only in his mind and without prayer, he concluded that he would need to ask all oft disciples that Jesus had asked to specifically follow him so he would not offend anyone's sensibilities. As most of the disciples would often be away from the community, traveling with Jesus, he considered who among the new men he should also call upon. Unable to come to a conclusion, on the fourth day after their return, he went to visit Jesus at his house in Capernaum to get his advice, for Jesus said he would be in seclusion for three days only. Jesus questioned him, asking, How many men do you think to call for the council of elders? And Cephas answered him, saying, I thought twelve would be the best. It is a sacred number, sufficient to get a variety of advice, but not too large to become undermined by an overabundance of opinions. Jesus nodded and asked, How many men, including those of both strength and vigor and the old and weak, who are not among those I have called to walk with me in my journeys, do you count among the children of light in the community? Cephas pondered this for a moment and then answered, Including those who have just come from Kafar Salama and Gurion and his eldest son who came with their families from Ptolemy while we were in Bethany and those who already lived here at the north end of the lake. We have eighteen men firmly committed to the community, plus those you have called as disciples. That is a small number to choose twelve from without offending the six who were not chosen, Jesus replied. Cephas raised his eyebrows and nodded in agreement, but added, I only thought to call eleven as I would be the twelfth. But even then, you are correct that the other seven might take offense. Perhaps, my error is that twelve is too many and that a smaller number such as six or even two others besides myself would be better. 
Did you pray to Source to seek guidance before you decided upon the number 12? Jesus asked. Cephas answered, I prayed about how many the council should be, but I neglected to ask for guidance about who should be numbered in the council, assuming this would be easy for me to know of my own accord. Then it must be that eleven is the right number for the council with you as the twelfth, even as the light has been revealed to you in your thoughts by source, affirmed Jesus. But now you must pray more earnestly and discover who should be numbered among the eleven. Cephas nodded in agreement and prepared to depart that he might find a quiet place to pray for guidance. But Jesus reached out and grasped his arm, saying, One more thing. My brother, before you ask of source, you must be open to receiving the answer, and you are not quite in that place of wholeness. Cephas looked with wide-eyed surprise at Jesus, saying, What could I have done to be unworthy of an answer? I promise you that I strive mightily each day to live up to the Celestine light and do not feel unworthy to seek source in prayer in any way. Jesus smiled and answered him, saying, my brother, I did not say or mean to imply that you are unworthy, for surely you are a pillar of the light. Nor is anyone ever unworthy to seek the comfort and guidance of their father and mother in heaven in prayer. Many pray in all sincerity, humility and worthiness, but cannot receive the counsel they seek because in their pride or prejudice or cultural or religious upbringing they are incapable of accepting the answer. It is of this that I spoke. Your Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother will answer your prayers and give you the guidance and inspiration you seek, yet your cup will not be full, for it has a mouth that is too narrow and cannot gather. All the wisdom poured into it. Therefore, most will be spilled upon the ground and lost to your understanding. I do not comprehend why. Cephas stammered. You know my heart is in a good place, and my eyes seek only the light. If there is something in my character or customs that blocks me from the fullness of the Celestine light, please reveal it to me that I might unblock this dam. Jesus answered plainly, saying, You have only chosen men for your counsel, yet women outnumber men in our community and every decision made for the community affects them as much as the men. Where the men are often away because of work, the women are always here. Exclude the women from the council and you deny yourself the wisdom of those who see all things from a different perspective. Exclude the women and you also exclude those who are present almost every hour of every day and thus better prepared to understand the dynamics and immediate needs of the community. A good council will have both men and women and be stronger because of it. From Themen, there will be an understanding of the currents of the outside world. From the women, there will be an understanding of the currents of the community of light. From the men will come strength and wariness and protection. From the women will come compassion and welcome and action without rashness. Each is a branch of the tree of light. For the tree to grow large, the needs of all the branches must be considered and the gifts of all branches must be accepted. Cut away more than half the branches of a tree and the tree will soon die or only live as a scrub of what it could have been. But nourish all the branches and the leaves and the roots and the shoots and the buds, and the tree shall grow magnificent beyond comprehension. So it is with men and women and all things within the community of Light I know your heart and your head, Cephas. Both desire that which is right, but both are swayed by the customs and teachings you have grown up with, concerning the proper place and duties of women. If you truly follow me, you must overcome that which you have lived all of your life and live the teachings that I have given you in fullness. Only then will the mouth of your cup be wide enough to receive all of the wisdom and blessings your heavenly father and mother pour upon you every day. Cephas listened very intently to the words of Jesus, but squirmed a little. Uncomfortably in his skin as he began to answer him, saying, this is a hard thing you speak, 
Jesus, for women are. They are. It is hard for me to say what they are. You know I have a love for my wife. I do not treat her as my property as is my right by law, and as many men do their wives, but show her respect and consider her happiness and not only how she can please me. But her thoughts are very simple. She only knows how to clean and cook and garden and take care of the children. Her emotions come upon her easily, sometimes in a most unbecoming manner, and I know the wives of many men are far worse than her. In honesty, I do not see how women could be of any help in a community council. Let them do the things that they do, but how could they give any useful advice outside of the tiny world they live within? And how they decide to cook or clean or take care of the children is of no consequence to the community as a whole. Jesus looked to his wife, who had been listening in silence as he spoke to Cephas, and asked, Miriam, how would you answer Cephas? And Miriam said unto him, Good Cephas, I too know your heart and your head, and I admire you for both. But your understanding of women is like an empty chest. It has nothing at all inside of it. But that can be a good thing if you are willing to listen and learn, for there is much space to fill it with scrolls of knowledge. Before she could continue, Cephas interrupted, saying, Wait, Miriam, I do not speak of you when I speak of women, for you are like unto a man in your knowledge and experiences in the world. I know you have the greatest favor of Jesus, and I would not hesitate to ask you to be on the council. But surely there is not another woman like you in the entire world, and in any case, like the other disciples, you travel with Jesus. The rest of the sisters of the community are lights to us all, but would it not be a mockery of wisdom to ask them to sit in council with men? And even if I could persuade my head to abandon the law and all I have understood my entire life, could we expect the same to occur with all of the other men of the community? Miriam scoffed, what part of me do you find is like a man? Is it my long hair which I do not hide? for many men also have long hair. No, it is not your hair, Miriam. As I said, it is your understanding of the dealings of men and the places you have been, even to Egypt, and the knowledge you hold from being with Jesus these many years. When I first met you, I did not understand why Jesus allowed you such freedom, but having come to know you more, I understand you. Are like a brother to us but in that you are surely unique. And even understanding all that I have said, it is still difficult to accept all that is given to you by Jesus. For in the end, you are still just a woman. And in the eyes of the law and of men, you should not be allowed to be the way that you are allowed to be. I do not mean to offend, only to speak in honesty. For me, it is enough that Jesus has said this is the way it should be. If there is rebellion inside of me, it comes from the adversary, not from the light of source, and I will steadfastly follow the light of source wherever it leads, and heed. Not the darts of the adversary within. But even as you know more than other women, so too have I been blessed to understand more than most men, because of my longer association with Jesus and my dealings with men in the world. Therefore, I can bring myself to accept and live this higher truth, that some women can be considered equal to men in a few select areas, even that some women might be capable of serving on a community council. But let us be honest, not just with one another but about this situation. Though I might accept for some women to be elevated thus, do you believe that except for you, the other men in the community would accept it? Miriam let out a deep breath before speaking and then said unto him, I believe that the other men in this community are more uplifted in their understanding than you credit them. Consider that every man in the community of light is here by their own choice. And why are they here? 
because they have heard the teachings of Jesus and some have seen his miracles, and they want to follow him and be a part of that which he establishes. Jesus has made no secret that he has come to upturn the laws and traditions and much more than that as well. Surely, there can be no man in our community without that most basic understanding, for almost everything Jesus does and says is contrary to the law and tradition. Therefore, I think if you, as the disciple he has chosen to lead our community, as a lifelong resident and leader of Bethsaida, and as a fisherman of three boats, speak to our community as one, both the men and the women, and speak the words you have heard from Jesus and give an account of his teachings about women, there will be no dissension. Surprise perhaps, some confusion perhaps, but no dissension. For every man here is a son of source, a son of light. Even as every woman here is a daughter of source, a daughter of light. When they see or hear the light, it will dance in their hearts, no matter how different it may be from all they have known. Though they may not understand the fullness of the Celestine light at that moment, they will have a deep desire to learn and understand it, no matter how simple their life has been. I know that is true, Cephas. I am not so different than other women, even as you are not so different than your brothers of light in our community. Speak and they will listen. Testify of the truth and they will believe. Live the Celestine light and they will live it also. Cephas was humbled by Miriam's words and said, Thank you, Miriam. You have opened my eyes and heart greater than they were. Before and I will ponder and pray about the words you have spoken. But even now there is a greater peace in my heart about this. Looking then to Jesus, he asked, Miriam is correct to say that all will follow that which you say to do, even if it is contrary to what they have known. I did not mean to make this such a large issue, only to seek advice. Perhaps, you can give us a sermon about this on the Sabbath and then the path will be laid for all to understand that which would seem to many to be contrary to the laws of nature. Rather than answer him, Jesus looked from his eyes into Miriam's and gestured for her to answer for him. And she said unto Cephas, Another reason we are blessed above all the generations of the world to have Jesus among us is that we can have a testimony of him from what we have seen and what we have heard, and because of this, we can be special witnesses to the world of the Celestine light he has brought. On a dark and dreary day, not far away, Jesus will part from us and rise to the heaven from whence he came to dwell again with our Celestine father and mother. He walks among us and gives us the Celestine light of heaven that we might teach the light to others. Once he is gone from this world, it will only be by the words we speak and write, and the things which we do, that the people of the world will learn of the brilliance of the Celestine light he brought. Even then, it will only be held by a few. I speak to you now because he desires me to grow in my confidence and stature while he is still here to teach and nurture me. It is the same for you, Brother Cephas. The day will soon come when you must stand alone and lead the children of light on the paths that Jesus has blazed. The day has not yet come when you must stand alone, but the day has come when both of us must not be afraid to stand. And for this cause, Jesus desires me to speak to you rather than speaking himself, even as he desires you to speak to our community about the council and women and the true Celestine light of source. And it came to pass that two days after the Sabbath, Martha came to the community with her children and the children of Jesus and Miriam in the company of her brother Lazarus, and there was great joy in their family with the reunion and among all the people of the community especially with Miriam, the grandmother of the children of Jesus and Miriam. And it came to pass that on the next Sabbath, Cephas spoke to the community, to the men on the right and the women on the left. He had contemplated and prayed about the council of elders and the words of Jesus and Miriam, and in his heart, there was now a great understanding. 
Because of this, he had the Celestine light of source upon him, and his countenance exuded the light. It seemed to radiate from his very pores. He spoke with a great and majestic voice that pierced the hearts of all that heard his words. And even as Miriam had predicted, although he spoke contrary to all they had assumed and believed about women, there was a resonance in their hearts and no dissension among them. As he concluded his talk, Cephas called the men and women he had chosen by the guidance of prayer and contemplation, to be the eleven who would be the council of elders for the community of light. And numbered among them was Martha of Bethany, the wife of Yochanan the baptizer and second wife of Jesus, and Miriam of Nazareth, the mother of Jesus, and Shabala, the wife of Cephas. And among the men was Gimel of Kafar Salama. Then Jesus rose among them and said unto them, My brothers and sisters of light, remember this day, remember this place. Tell it to your children, that they may tell it to their children and they to theirs, unto every generation. For on this day, at this place, with this action, you have witnessed the beginning of the expansion of the Celestine light of source upon the earth. And the light shall expand throughout all the world and to generations unborn, even all the generations of man, by the words and deeds of those who know and love the light. Though the light will be fought, though it will be resisted, though men will try to pervert it and change it to their desires, it will never be stopped, and from this day, the world will begin to change. Never forget you were here at the beginning, on the very first day. On this day, I call each of you to a high and holy calling. You are special. Witnesses called of source to hold the Celestine light to cherish the light and bring the light unto the world. So let it be. Many miracles at Genesaret. Many people come to Genesaret hoping for Jesus to heal them of sickness, disease, and injuries. He sends his disciples out to see who is worthy to be healed and who is not. Simon the leper is one found worthy and Jesus heals him first. Jesus' fame spreads and more crowds of people arrive to be healed. Jesus speaks to the crowd from a boat on the waterfront about being healed, and in order for that to happen, they must forsake their evil ways and repent of their sins. Those pure in heart he invites to enter the water and come to him and they will be made whole by their faith, but cautions those of impure heart to not enter the water because it will be their death. Many are baptized that day and healed of all manner of afflictions, but one man is not. And it came to pass that during the following days, many people Kamato visit the community of Genesaret to see and speak with Jesus, and many came hoping he would heal them of all manner of infirmaries, diseases, and injuries, as it had been spoken about in Galilee and Judea that he had done. But though he wandered freely through the community and ate meals each day with the members, he met in depth only with his disciples and continued to teach them of the Celestine light of source and the things to come. Some of his disciples wondered why he would not speak with the infirmed and the scholars and scribes that had come to see him, and he answered, The mason must lay the foundation of bricks before the building can be built. And the building must be built before it can give shelter to many people. But the days of the mason are numbered upon the earth, and if he is distracted from his task, the foundation will not be laid ere he must depart. Then the many that would have had shelter and comfort will be alone in the cold and dreary world because the time of the mason was robbed to help a few at the expense of the many. Nor is it given to me to prepare the people of the world for the Celestine light, for you have seen the light and hold it in your hearts. Therefore, it is given to you to bring the Celestine light to the people and then bring those who love the light and have repented of their sins to me. For only those who have repented and hold the Celestine light in their heart are worthy of me. Only those have a resonance that turns my face to them. 
The disciples understood his words and that very day went among the visitors to Genesaret and spoke to them to see who it was that came to contend. And who it was that came in selfishness to find favor of Jesus and who it was that had come in humility seeking to be healed or to grow within themselves because they loved the light and had come seeking that which called to them. Among those that they found bathed in humility and sincerity was a man known only as Simon the leper. His lot was misery, and even the disciples spoke to him with some revulsion. And from a distance. Nevertheless, when Jesus met with his disciples that night, he inquired if they had found any of the visitors of pure heart. Cephas replied they had found several including a man who stank very badly, whom none could approach too near, called Simon the leper. The following day, after the community meal to which uninvited visitors were not permitted to attend, Jesus walked with Miriam and his other disciples and they came upon Simon the leper sitting upon the ground and seeing them approach, he knelt upon his knees, saying, O Jesus of Nazareth! Blessed be your father and mother that you stand before me. I know you are blessed above all men and that the power of God is upon you. Though I am but an unworthy clod of dirt, I beseech you to make me clean, for I know without doubt that you need only say it will be so and so it will be. Jesus stood before him and asked, If you were not a leper who would you be? Simon answered him with a crack in his voice, saying, I would be a faithful husband to my wife who has not seen me now for almost two years because of my affliction. And I would be a loving father to my children who think that I am dead. And I would be a hard-working man that I might support my family. And I would repay my brother who has supported my family in my absence twofold. And if God so wills, I would bring my family here that I might labor in your community and repay in some small measure the gift I ask of you. Jesus put forth his hand and touched him upon his forehead, saying, You have answered well Simon, and I perceive that your heart is pure and your words are true. Therefore, by your faith, be clean. Immediately, his leprosy began to vanish and great scabs fell off his body and onto the ground, even from within his wrappings. As they fell upon the ground, they turned immediately into dust and were no more. And all who were present marveled greatly and with wonder at what they had seen and at the new Simon who stood before them, for he was glowing in his appearance and the air around him smelled like a fresh spring day. Jesus told him, Go and show yourself to your wife and children that they might know of a surety that the one they love has returned. Then come with your family to Genesaret, and you will be welcomed and can be baptized. But speak not of what has happened. Except to the pure in heart who are open to the celestine light that I bring, even as you have been. Then Amram came forward, and taking the robe off his back, he handed it to Simon and said, I will return to my home for another. You are a new man, bury the rags of your past in the ground and remember your ordeals no more, for now you are one of the family of light. Simon put on a room's robe with the joy of a child, and after bidding goodbye to Jesus and Miriam and each disciple one by one, he hurried on the road to Jericho so that he might find again his family that had been lost. When he came to his wife and revealed himself, she fainted straight away upon seeing him. But once she revived, her joy was full, and upon hearing of the miracle of his healing by Jesus, she went out of the house and began to joyously proclaim to everyone what she saw, My husband, who was as dead, is now alive again. Jesus of Nazareth has healed him in an instant. Do you hear? He was afflicted with leprosy, and now he is whole. From the moment Jesus touched him, he was made whole. Praise to God in the highest. Now Simon, remembering the admonition of Jesus to not speak of his healing to any but the pure in heart, tried to dissuade his wife from publicly proclaiming the miracle, but so great was her joy that she could not be persuaded. 
Because of the proclamation of Simon's wife, many came to see for themselves the miracle man. Before he had been afflicted, Simon had been a prosperous merchant of dates and owned a large grove down by the river with his brother, therefore, he was well known among the people of Jericho. Many knew he had disappeared after being sorely afflicted with leprosy and now to see him whole and to hear the story of his miraculous healing amazed them all. Word of the miracle performed by Jesus of Nazareth soon spread across the land far beyond Jericho. It was matched with stories heard by others of additional miracles Jesus had performed. In a very short time, his fame grew, and many more people with afflictions began to journey to Genesaret to be healed by his touch. In a matter of days, the crowds coming into the area around Genesaret began to swell even greater in number. Jesus asked his disciples to go each day and preach to them the principles of the true Celestine light of source and to note those with whom it resonated. Then taking only Miriam with him, he departed into the wilderness to the east of the community, and they remained there for several days, communing with the father and mother and with each other. The day following the Sabbath, Jesus and Miriam came down from the wilderness into the town of Hippos on the east shore of the lake and being recognized by no one there, they returned quietly by boat to Bethsaida. But no sooner had they set foot upon the shore than the news quickly spread that Jesus had returned, and people began coming toward him hurriedly from several directions. Many crying out, Heal me, while scribes beset him with doctrinal questions without any respect. Most of his disciples were out upon the lake, fishing, and it was Gimel of Kafar Salama, who seeing Jesus, waited through the crowd to stand before him and clear a path so that he and Miriam might return to their home in Capernaum. As they walked along the road to Capernaum followed by the crowd who still called out to him, they came upon a man with palsy being pulled on a litter by his wife, and as he approached, she fell to her knees and said, Praise God in the highest, good Jesus of Nazareth. I plead with you to heal my husband, for our children starve since he can walk no more or use one of his arms. Jesus stopped before them, and all the crowd stopped with him in expectant silence, sensing a miracle was about to be. Looking at the woman, Jesus asked, are you and your husband one with source in your thoughts and desires and actions? The woman answered humbly, We have always strived to do right, but in truth, we have done much wrong, and it is our children that suffer the most because of our inequities. Many say it is because of evil my husband has done that he has been cursed to walk no more or even barely move. I know we are unworthy to ask to be healed but our life is almost death and we knew not where else to turn. Then Jesus asked, If your husband were healed by the power of God, what would you do? The woman answered him, saying, We would give thanks beyond words in our very heart and body, and my husband would go before the priests and make an offering and show himself to them that they might see God's miracle. But more than this, we would turn our backs upon our iniquities, which are greater afflictions than the palsy. We would seek you out, not to heal our bodies, but to heal our souls. Jesus nodded in appreciation of her words and asked, If your husband is not healed, what then will you say and do? The woman answered him again, saying, We will surely be very sad. No one could be aught else if their hope is so lost but it will not change our determination to live a better life than we have, to be more worthy of life itself, however limited it might be. If my husband must remain as he is, despite standing before you, then surely it is God's will. And if it is God's will, it must be for our good, and we will strive to appreciate and understand the good God gives to us. Then Jesus came up to the woman and held her by each shoulder. And looking into her eyes, he said unto her, Your honesty and humility are deeper than the pools of the Jordan. Then turning to her husband on the litter, he said unto him, Brother, 
be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. There were in the crowd that witnessed this event certain scribes that had been sent to discover the evil that might be in him. And hearing Jesus' words, they spoke among themselves, saying, This man commits blasphemy, for who but God can forgive sins? Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you or to say, Arise and walk. But that you may know that this Son of Man is more than that and has the power and authority on earth to forgive sins, watch now that you may testify of the truth that condemns you. Then looking to the man upon the litter, Jesus said unto him, Man of misery, by your repentance, you are forgiven, and by your faith, you are made whole. I say unto you, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. Go now to your house and your children. Immediately, the man stood up and then fell to his knees before Jesus in thankfulness. Then he and his wife departed in. Unabashed joy for their home. The scribes were aghast at what they had seen and heard, but the multitude saw it and marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to be upon the earth. At last, Jesus and Miriam reached their home, and Martha and the children were there to greet them. Gimiel had called out to other men of the community as they traveled so that there were four who stood before the entrance to the house once Jesus and Miriam were inside to bar the multitude from pressing too close. And after a time, being assured by Gimiel that Jesus was not coming out, the crowd dispersed. Some left altogether to return to their towns, but many others merely removed to their camps or accommodations to await Jesus' reappearance. The following day, before the sun arose, Jesus and Miriam slipped out of their house unseen except for their faithful friends who had remained on guard before the door. Going down to the lake shore, they met Cephas in one of his boats along with three of Jesus' disciples, and boarding they pushed out into deep water just off the shore. As daylight came upon the land, one of the multitudes that waited to see Jesus spied him on the boat, sitting off the shore, and quickly, the crowd formed upon the beach nearest to the boat as it lay at anchor, broadside to the beach. Then Jesus stood up in the center of the boat on the side, facing the beach, and spoke to them, saying, Many of you have come to be healed of your afflictions, but like the woman whose husband had palsy yesterday. You must first be healed of the affliction of your sins in your life before you can be healed. Of the afflictions that beset your body. Know this, I heal you not, but it is you who heal yourself, for your true affliction is not on the outside but on the inside, and you are the only physician that has the cure. Some may say that their malady is on the inside, and it is something tangible and physical like a broken bone or worms that devour them, but it is not of the physical that I speak when I speak of the inside, but of the disease of your sins, which eats at the essence of your soul with more finality than worms will ever consume your body. Your sins are like a millstone that weighs you down and prevents you from rising to the light. If you do not free yourself from their weight, they will crush you and drown you, making your life unfulfilled and destroying your eternity that could be. I call upon you this day to forsake your evil ways and commit to walk henceforth only in the simple and true Celestine light of Source, which you can learn from the mouths of my disciples. I call upon you to shed your old skin and become a new and better person. I call upon you to forsake your friends who have enticed you to do evil and make new friends who will entice you to do good. I call upon you to publicly proclaim that you are forsaking the darkness of old and embracing the Celestine light that dawns in the new day, in your new life, and to seal that promise with the covenant of baptism this very day by the hands and authority of my disciples. Any of you who are ill and afflicted and are ready to be born again, who are ashamed of your sins and ready to live in the brightness of the Celestine light, 
I invite you now to enter into the waters of Genesaret and come to me. By my word, I declare if you are pure in your heart, in your intentions, you shall be made whole. But do not enter the water if you are not pure in your heart and your intentions, for the very water that gives life to the pure will be death to the impure. If you are not numbered among the pure, turn your backs and leave this place, there is nothing here for you. Return to your towns and homes and come back to Genesaret once you have healed yourself of your sins and are ready to be born again into the light. Despite his words, no one left, but many people who were afflicted of all manner of disease began to enter the water and walk toward him. There was another man who also had the palsy, and his relatives held up his litter and waded out into the lake toward the boat where Jesus stood with open arms. As they neared the deep water and could walk no further, Jesus bade them to throw the man from his litter into the lake. The relatives all looked at one another uncertain of whether they should follow the words of Jesus, but the man on the litter raised his voice and beseeched them to throw him into the lake as Jesus had bidden. Heeding his request, they threw him into the deep water beyond them, and he immediately sunk beneath the surface. But then in the next moment, he bobbed up and began to float toward the boat flailing his arms. Soon. He was at the gunwale and was pulled up into the boat where he stood beside Jesus, beaming in happiness and waving to his friends and family on the shore and standing in the lake. Many other people with both minor and serious afflictions were also shouting for joy as they stood in the water, finding themselves free of their disease, both on the outside and the inside. There was still another man stricken with palsy, a rich man who had been brought upon a litter by his servants, and he commanded them to bring him into the lake as they had seen the first man stricken with palsy be cured. But his head man hesitated and said, Forgive me, master, to speak out without your command. I think only of your welfare. You have done many things God would not countenance to acquire your wealth. Have you repented as this rabbi has said must needs be? else you shall perish in the water. The rich man scoffed at him, saying, You know people have been hurt sometimes by my actions, but that is the nature of business. I am sure God understands, for I have given many alms to the temple. Now get me into the water this instant while the power of the miracle is still there. Only good happened to the first man, and you have not seen anyone in the water suffer ill effects so it is safe to say the rabbi's warning was just so much pomp to create the right mood. Even as the servants entered the water, bearing the rich man on the litter, the head man still spoke with caution to him, saying, You do not even believe the teachings of this rabbi. He has said you must repent and have faith, and he teaches many things contrary to the law which you obey. Perhaps, it would be better to wait until another day and reflect more on the things he has said. You fool! The rich man said, raising his voice. It is no wonder you are a servant, and I am the master, you can't think any better than an ass. Now throw me into the deep water as you saw the other man thrown. Abiding by his command, they Servants threw him into the deep water of the lake. Like the first man with palsy, he quickly sank beneath the surface. But unlike the first man, he did not reappear, for he was weighted down by his unrepented sins and lack of true faith, and the lake became his grave. Seeing this, the servants were terrified, thinking they would be blamed for their master's death, they came back to the shore, shaking in fear. But once back on shore, they were approached by a well-known doctor of the law who had come to question Jesus. He had the scribe who attended him write a note to which he gave his seal, saying he had witnessed their master command them to throw him into the lake because he thought he would be healed by Jesus of Nazareth. He absolved the servants of guilt in their master's death upon the promise that they would testify against Jesus as culpable, 
should they be called upon before the Sanhedrin. Despite the death of the rich man and the sinister actions of the doctor of law, the mood among most of the people was jubilant, with the happiest being those in the water that had been healed. With a digression in happiness obvious as the people stood further away from the shore of the lake. The people standing most distant were those who felt Jesus was speaking to them when he said that those who were not pure in their hearts and intentions should return to their homes. They did not share in the joy of those closer to the lake, but neither had they been able to pull themselves away. They were fascinated by the possibilities, but unwilling to embrace the purity Jesus had asked of them. After all the worthy who had desired to be healed had come forth, the boat came in closer to shore and the disciples went into the water and waded toward the shore until they were waist deep. Then Jesus called forth unto the multitude, saying, All who have forsaken their wickedness and waywardness from the simple teachings of the commandments of Sinai and the great commandment and, in humility, seek to be born again into the greater Celestine light of source. Come forth now to one of my disciples and be baptized that you may begin from this moment forth to be filled with the spirit of source and ever guided on the paths of greater light and joy. The people came forth, and the disciples baptized them one by one, and forty-two people were baptized that day in Lake Genesaret. By the following day, the multitude had dispersed, and everyone had returned to their towns and homes. But during the coming weeks, another ten families moved to the community of light at Lake Genesaret from among those that had been present on the day of the healings in the lake. Callings of the Children of Light Jesus speaks to the children of light about the many religious sects that will spring up in his name once he has departed from the earth, but warns that none will contain the wholeness of his teachings. Only the children of light will know and live the true Celestine light of source, for they are in the world but not of it as they do not allow the world to hold sway over their lives. He explains to the children of light what it means to be a child of light and the gifts bestowed upon all of them by Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. And it came to pass that on the following day, Jesus called a meeting of his disciples and the council of eleven whom Sephashad called to lead the community of light, and they met in privacy up on a hill beyond the community. Everyone wondered what it was that Jesus had called them for, and they spoke about it in hushed voices with one another before he walked among them, for he had been up beyond, in the wilderness, meditating. Jesus called upon Martha to say a short prayer to begin the meeting, then he said unto them, My brothers and sisters of light, thank you for gathering here today. I must speak to you of the coming days and how our community must be and become. I will be with you but for a short time longer. Understand that no man could take my life save I willed it to be so and I so do will it that you might see with your own eyes that you are far more than this frail, mortal body. For as my mortal body passes, my eternal soul still lives. As my eternal soul lives, so it shall become one with an immortal body, as physical and tangible as the man before you, but glorified and perfected that it will never die. As you see me do, so shall each of you do. You are sons and daughters of God, and I am merely your elder brother upon the earth to show you the way to your greatness and the inheritance of all that our Father and Mother in Heaven wait to pour upon their good and faithful children. We live in a world of turmoil, and many good people look to a God of their conception to help them to cope with the burdens of life upon their shoulders. In the days to come, there shall be many sects that shall spring up in my name, not just in Palestine, but across the world. They will have a likeness of godliness, but it will be wrapped around their previous upbringing and beliefs about the nature of God. There will come a great and powerful church from Rome that will trample underfoot all of the other sects that follow after me. 
with pomp and ritual and the authority of the emperor, they shall hold sway over the world in my name, but I will know them not. The generation after I have returned to our father and mother, Rome shall destroy much of the land of Palestine. Even the temple at Jerusalem shall be laid to ruins. The teachings that I give to you have never been meant for all the people of the world, for most in the world cannot accept truths that are so different from what they have known, and even if they could accept them, they are not sufficient masters of themselves to live them. That is why they are of the world, and you are not, because you both know the truth, and you live it. When I have returned to our father and mother in the Celestine Lights, you must go out into the world to teach. They Precepts and understandings I have given you, for though there are not many, scattered far and wide are your fellow brothers and sisters of the light, and you must find them. Know that you will be reviled and ridiculed by the people of the world, and by many of the sects who desire to teach a form of my teachings without the substance. Some of you will be put to death, unless you heed the warning of Source and flee ere your persecutors arrive or have become adepts of the Celestine Light and need fear no men. But some of you will not flee. And most of you will not have taken the time to become the adepts you need to be. But when choice is to be made in your life, I would rather you become an adept than not or rather you flee than perish. Think not that there is any less honor in avoiding death in my name than there is in accepting it, for Source would not have warned you, save it be that it would be better for you to live rather than die, for in life there is still much good you can do. When I am no longer among you, continue to live in this community and call those of true Celestine Light to come and live here with you. Let the disciples I have called and any they shall call be emissaries of the Celestine Light and go forth into the world and find those who wait for you. When you find them, and remember they shall be few in number, ask them to journey here to become one with the community of light. Do not draw attention to yourselves or concentrate only in one town, for then you will be seen as a threat by the Romans. See that the community is spread all along the north shore of the lake. Let the members of our family of light live in Bethsaida, Capernaum, Chorazin, and Genesaret. Know that even as you seek out your other brothers and sisters of the light in the world, that the sects I have spoken of shall grow larger than you by far and all in my name or a perversion of it. Even as they create stories of my life, and teachings that are not true, they shall deny the accounts of my life and words that you teach which are true. Do not fight against them in any way. Let your countenance always be one of peace toward them. Even in their perversion of the truth, they are bringing more light to their followers than they had before. In this, I am grateful and so should you be. And any true son or daughter of the greater Celestine Light will be drawn to you when they hear the words you say, despite all the obstacles that may be before them. I shall be calling twelve to be my special witnesses. They will walk with me wherever I go until the day that I walk upon the earth no more. Because there will be many false teachings in the world, always cherish the words of the twelve I have called for they will not speak of things they have heard about me, but of things they have seen with their own eyes and heard with their own ears. Know that if there be any who would say something about me that is contrary to the word of one of my special witnesses, you may always know with assurance that the word of the witness is true. In the mouth of two or more witnesses attesting in agreement to that which they have seen and heard shall all be established. To that there is but one exception. Miriam is the special witness of the special witnesses. Only she has been present since the beginning to see all things or hear them from my lips. She is the sacred scroll of my life. And teachings. Cherish her and protect her, even as she shall cherish you and protect you. Beyond this, there is nothing.
Though many will go forth into the world in my name and will convert many people to a semblance of the celestine light that I brought, if they do not teach the same precepts and understandings of my special witnesses who received their knowledge from me, then they teach a doctrine of their own imagination. Think not that the community of light shall ever be large or prominent in the world. How could that be? You are not of the world. In this world, there are people of all races, cultures, and positions of prominence, from the emperor who is Caesar to the lowliest slave. In this cornucopia of people, you exist. Some of you are of one color or shade and some of another. Some of you have been affluent, and some have lived in simplicity. In the world, those things all have significance, but among you, they mean nothing. Never forget you are in the world, but you must not be of it. You might say that you are just a simple fisherman who has lived on this lake all of your life or a simple woman who has been just a wife and mother. But I say unto you that you are far more. You are in the world, but you are not of it. The world looks at you, but they do not see you for whom or what you are. Even many of you look at one another and do not comprehend who it is that you gaze upon. When I say that you are sons and daughters of God, do you think I am just using a figure of speech? I am not just using a figure of speech. You are as much a son or daughter of Source as I am. The souls of all the people of the world were created by our Heavenly Father and Mother, therefore, all are literally sons and daughters of God. But with you, there is far more than just that. Before you came down into the body your soul now wears, you lived in the celestine lights. Much the same as this life, you could choose right or wrong, and you did some good things, as well as some things in need of repentance. The same is true for all people. What separates the children of light from all others is that you were exceedingly good in your pre-life in the celestine realm and you received a greater reward in this life than all others. Even as those who are exceedingly virtuous in this life shall be rewarded greater than the less virtuous, in the next life. Some of you will say that you have had nothing but misery and challenge in this life, so how could it be that you have been rewarded greater than others? But you are thinking of the rewards of the world when you say that and it is not with the treasures of the world that your heavenly father and mother reward you. Your challenges in mortality are merely opportunities to build your eternal character and become greater than you are and to forge eternal relationships based upon the essence of your character and not upon your worldly ways or possessions. Therefore, give thanks and pray for greater strength and understanding, not for your burdens to be taken from you. By this, you may become greater than your challenges and overcome them and become still greater in the essence of your eternal soul. How is it then that you have been made greater in this life by the goodness of your souls in your pre-existence? Listen closely now, for I will reveal a great secret unto you, the greatest souls of the pre-existent Celestine realm were given a portion of the essence of Source to abide within their mortal bodies. Therefore, while all souls are sons and daughters of Source, all souls were not created equally. A very few, and you are numbered among them, were given a portion of the physical light of Source to reside within them in mortality. This is your reward for a life in the pre-mortal realms that was well lived. With the celestine light of Source that within you physically dwells, you can do marvelous wonders when you become adepts of the celestine light. Verily, there is nothing that you have seen me do that you cannot also do and even more than this, if you have enough knowledge, confidence in yourself, and faith in Source. If you say, with confidence born from knowledge and faith, to that tree, uproot and be thrown upon the mountain, it shall be done. If you say unto the mountain, take up and be cast into the sea, it shall be done, by the power of Source that is alive within you. The Greeks will tell you that there are laws of nature to which all things must abide, 
such as if you throw a rock up in the air, it will fall to the ground. But I say unto you that there is much more to the laws of nature given by source than the Greeks can ever know. Then taking up a fist-sized rock, Jesus threw it up into the sky. Everyone watched as it reached its apex and began to fall again to the earth. But, when it was at the height of their heads, it just stopped and remained standing still in the air, neither rising, nor falling. Then the rock rose slowly until it was about the height of two men above the ground and then remained motionless. Jesus taught them, To each of you and all the true children of light is given the power to know the thoughts of men and have influence upon them, to know the thoughts of one another without speaking, to heal your body and the bodies of others of all manner of infirmities. To call upon the sun or the storms, to see events of the future that will unfold, to have slight control of time and the ability to change the essence of one thing to another. And like this rock or the tree cast upon the mountain or the mountain upon the sea, it has been given to adepts of the celestine light to have the power to make rise that which the world would say cannot rise and to make fall that which the world would say cannot fall. All these powers and more I have not spoken of sleep inside of you, waiting to be Awakened by your confidence and faith. Are there any of you who have that confidence and faith today? Notwithstanding their amazement at the rock that hung still suspended in the air, most everyone nodded their heads affirmatively, and Cephas said, I know my faith in source is like a mountain. Of my confidence, I am not so sure, for though I believe if you say we can do these things, then surely we can do them convincing myself that I actually can is another net of fish. Jesus pointed at the rock above and said unto him, The test is easy, brother Cephas. Fetch that rock from the sky however you can by the powers manifested by your confidence and faith. The eyes of Cephas became very large as he contemplated the challenge before him but he went into intense concentration and tried to will the rock back to earth but it would not move. He excused his lack of success, saying, It is by your power that it remains where it is, and surely I cannot be greater than you, no matter the strength of my confidence or faith. Jesus answered him, saying, By my power it floats in the sky, but as soon as any one of you manifests the barest power to move it, so it shall be moved as you will. Once again, Cephas concentrated upon moving the stone to the ground, but once more, he was disappointed. Others came forward and made a similar attempt, until five had tried and failed. Then Miriam stepped forward and bowed her head to Jesus, saying, I will fetch the stone, my Lord that my brothers and sisters may know with assurance that the powers we have been given are as you have said. That their confidence and faith may be emboldened by what they see me do, even as I have been emboldened by the many miracles I have seen you do. With that, she made as if to step upon an invisible step, and in a heartbeat, her body rose off the ground until she hovered before the stone and gently grasping it in her hand she descended slowly and gracefully back to the earth, until standing beside Jesus. She opened her hand and presented the stone to him. There were gasps of overwhelming surprise and awe, for this was an ability of the Celestine Light, more than any had ever seen. Jesus explained, Marvel not at this, for you can do likewise, if along with your faith your confidence is born from a foundation of knowledge of the mysteries of Celestine Light, as it is for Miriam. To hold a stone floating in the air or to rise above the walls of the prisons that would hold you, or walk across the lake that would impede you, are merely manifestations of one of the abilities Source gave each of the children of light to be used with prudence and thankfulness by those who grow in knowledge of the secrets of Celestine Light and become adepts of the highest. Now I reveal these things to you that you will open your thoughts to the magnificence that you can become, for only by thinking of yourself in greater terms than you have can you 
begin to become greater than you have been. And more than this, I have asked you to go into the world and find the other children of light, but how will you know them? You will meet many good and honest people of many different faiths and beliefs. In the years to come, many will say they follow me. Look to discover those who are pure in heart, who are virtuous in their life, who honor the temple of their body and have one of the sacred abilities I spoke of, or who have them not but are drawn to discover and know of them. By this means, you can begin to winnow the wheat from the chaff, for the false doctors of religion and philosophy will flee with condemnation from things they can never have or understand. But the true children of light in their virtue and goodness will be drawn to the celestine light, even as one lodestone is irresistibly attracted to another. Beware of those who would seek these powers for dark purposes. These gifts of source are only to be used in righteousness, virtue, and selflessness. If any would seek to know of or use these powers for unrighteous, unvirtuous, or selfish purposes, then you may know with assurance that they are not children of light. Nor ever think to yourselves to use your special gifts for any purpose other than one that is righteous, virtuous, and unselfish. For that which you might so unworthily gain in this life will be taken from you sevenfold in the next life. Nor should you ever use your special gifts except in secrecy and privacy, or within the sanctity of a quorum of the children of light, or in defense of the children of light. Other than that, let the people of the world remain blind and in ignorance to things beyond their understanding or appreciation. There may also come a time when you will seek to use your special gifts for noble and righteous purposes, only to find they will not manifest. Know that there will be times when Source, who knows all that is, may deem it better for the situation to remain as it is than for you to change it by use of your special gifts. Perhaps one day as night is falling, you are late for an important gathering that will begin on the other side of the lake at sunrise. You think to yourself to walk across the lake at night when no one can see you only to find that when you step on the water you sink into it. In times like this, know that Source is watching over you and that there is more importance in your staying the night on this side of the lake or taking a ferry in the morning than there is for you to make the journey at night, by foot, across the lake. In the days to come, there will also be children of light who are seduced by the world and become children of darkness, it was even so in the pre-mortal realms. Because their special gifts are a physical part of them given by Source as a birthright and magnified by the knowledge and experience they have gained, they remain even when they turn from the light, but only in a weak semblance of their potential, for they cannot be fully empowered without virtue and faith in Source. Nevertheless, such Wayward children can cause harm in the world with gifts that were intended only to bring great good. Therefore, whenever you encounter a child of light that has become a child of darkness, first go to them and try to turn them back into the light. If they will not turn back to the light, let three of you go into a place of privacy and form the circle of three and, by the power of three, remove the special gifts of Source from their body and the knowledge from their mind, that they may manifest the powers of Source no more. Now why is it that I have told you all of these things at this time? And why only to each of you and not all of the members of the Community of Light? Some of you are my special witnesses and must know all things, and all of you are leaders of the Community which shall continue to grow and prosper. It is my desire that you remember the words I have spoken and the things you have seen this day. You hold a sacred responsibility as leaders of the community. You must be able to utilize your special gifts in times of need, such as when a member is sick, or when a storm threatens, or when the Romans would come to take that which is not theirs to take. In the coming days, 
you shall make this north end of Lake Genesaret like a garden, but know that it will soon have to be left behind, for the children of light must soon leave this place. Among the tribe of Judah in the land of Palestine, there are many who think the end of the world is coming soon. The end of their little world as they have known it is coming, but the larger world that holds the children of men will continue, and the suffering they will know here will not even be heard as a rumor in many a far place. Even as you strive to make this a garden, you also need to be preparing for the days to come when you will be here no more. This community is the egg that must be nurtured with great care, for it will bring forth the radiant birds of celestine light that will illuminate the world. When the ways of the world come upon you and surround you, know that your time of departure draws nigh. When the wind brings word of the movement of the Romans toward the communities of Genesaret, know it is time to go. Teach this to your brothers and sisters in the community and to your children, that all will be prepared. Cherish this time of community for such a family will not come again for millennia. While you are here, grow in the celestine light of source, edify one another, increase in the ability to use your gifts, and ever seek out other children of light in lands near and far, baptize them and send them to the communities at Genesaret, that they may learn and grow further among their own kind. From the travels abroad of those called to be apostles and seventies, you should establish places of refuge not for the entire community, but for a family here and another there. Once the time of departure has come, leave quickly to the many places you have pre-appointed, some to Egypt, some to Syria, some to Greece, some to Rome, some to the land of the Gauls, some to the land of Unish, some to islands in the seas, some to the lands of the Nubians, and some to the lands beyond these. Were you to remain as one community in Palestine, you would soon be beset by those who would destroy that which is different than they are, and instead of a life of peace, you would have a life of confrontation. It will be hard to separate from those who are like you and go into unknown places, but it is only by this that the true Celestine light of Source will spread across the world, unseen by the eyes of the men of the world, but found by other children of light wherever they may be. And I give my promise to this generation that the faithful children of light though scattered shall be reunited. But make good use of the time of dispersion to plant the seeds of Celestine light among many peoples. From the seeds may plants of beauty grow and prosper that from generation to generation there will be a light here and a light there and another there, all across the world of darkness. As the great religions grow in power and breadth, let the true Celestine light of Source remain hidden kept in sacredness by those who are called to it in ways the world could never understand. Every year as time goes on, Heavenly Father and Mother will send down to earth a greater number of their more righteous and virtuous children, and they shall teach their children the ways of Celestine Light. And they will teach theirs, even as each of you shall teach the ways of Light to your children. While the people of the world grow in numbers and the churches of the world wax great, the children of light shall remain hidden until one hundred generations have passed, when there shall be enough of them upon the world that by their united powers they can change the world from darkness to light. Upon that day, the fullness of the celestine light will be brought again upon all the earth, that the children of light may know it in fullness and inherit their destiny. The gifts of Source Jesus further expounds upon the gifts of the children of light, when to use them and when not to use them. He also explains the five points of the star of light by which all miracles occur. The following day, after completing the contemplative movements at sunrise, Jesus departed with Miriam and his disciples on the road to Tiberias. While walking, Yohanan asked, Concerning the special gifts we have been given as children of light, I am still uncertain of how or when to manifest my gifts. Jesus answered him, 
saying, Your gifts are to be used only in selflessness for the glory of God and only before the eyes of true believers, when there is a true need. If a man who is committed to the Celestine Light asks you to show him the special gifts of God it is rumored that you have, show them not, not in the least degree, for there is no purpose in this except fostering pride in you and false faith in him. If an unbeliever says that if you will but show him a miracle he will believe, turn your back and walk away from him, for faith built on miracles is like a house built upon sand that will fall at the first great storm. The majesty of source is not a circus, and those who ask first for a sign have not yet found source in their heart, and it is only those who have first found source in their heart that should ever be privileged to witness the powers of the Celestine light upon the earth, but even then, only when there is a need. Cephas interjected, saying, but you have healed those with great infirmities before the eyes of many non-believers, even the Sadducees and Pharisees. Jesus answered him, saying, I desired the enemies of righteousness to know me, and thus it must be that all is fulfilled as it should be. But you will have enough challenges without drawing undue attention to yourself with miracles given before the Ganesh. To help you prosper in the days to come, I have shown miracles to many people. This is necessary, for many are called but few are chosen, and there must be many who see but do not believe, to find the precious few who see and do believe. Miracles were necessary through me that the word of it would spread quickly across the land near and far that the true children of light would hear of it and come unto me. Among those, the spirit of source moves in their heart, and they will follow me and come to you. The celestine light that emanates from me is meant for but a short time upon the earth, and the greater glory is in my leaving when my light shall shine even brighter through the lives of those who love me and keep my teachings. Know that your light is meant to be longer upon the earth, that you may seek out other children of light and help them to find the true path. But this, do quietly, out of the sight of men of the world, or seen, but thought to be of no consequence. Verily, it is better to be thought mad than to be proved true to the eyes of the unbelieving Ganesh For an unbeliever who witnesses a miracle with his own eyes will be an unbeliever still, and instead of simply dismissing you as mad or a charlatan and letting you go your way in peace, he will now fear you and seek to control and confine you because of his fear. If the Romans call you before them and threaten you with death lest you show them your powers of the Celestine Light, show not the gifts that they can see while they look upon you, but when they look away, do as you must to be free. If you have ears to hear, listen well. One of the most powerful of all gifts is not to walk upon the water or to raise a stone into the air or command a flame to appear, for these visible powers are all things that the magicians of Egypt can also do. Your great power as a child of light is to exert the celestine essence of source that is within you to protect yourself and your loved ones, to heal the sick by imparting to them a portion of the essence of heaven and of your own vitality, and to influence and change the thoughts of men, and in this, you can begin to change the world. Though you desire that all men would come to love and live the celestine light of source, it is not possible, except for those who are first prepared and desire in their heart to bury the sins of their past and live the higher light as a way of life. Therefore, though it is never righteous to compel a man to God, it is righteous to expand and project the celestine essence of source that is within you so that the man is touched by your words in the deepest part of his heart. Then it must be on his own that he wrestles with himself to discover whether he can live what his heart knows is true. But to any who would compel you to do that which is evil, or impede your freedom to worship source and live in the ways of celestine light, or imprison you unrighteously, you are justified in projecting the power of source upon them, that they would desire and act to change the wrong they have done unto you. 
When you exert the Celestine essence of Source within you, the minds of men can be led to paths they would not have chosen, and this is justified if it is for righteousness' sake. Thus, when you are imprisoned by your persecutors, you are justified to exert the Celestine power of Source within you that your guards will desire to set you free and remember the circumstances not at all. But think well before you act, and pray to Source for guidance, for the better path might be to remain in prison if that is where you can do a greater good. For in all things, as special emissaries of Source, you will be led upon paths and to places where it is important for you to be, both for your growth and for the purposes of Source that you may know not. So too will you meet people, even adversaries whom it is important that you should meet. Though it may at first be a mystery to you, never forget who you are and why you are here upon the earth. Look therefore with wonder upon the places and people that come into your life, however simple or even undesirable they may seem, seek with humble prayer to ever understand the purposes of your life, and the places you end up being, and the people whom you meet. Then Yaakov asked, how is it that we can manifest our own gifts? What exactly do we need to do or learn? Since the miracles we witnessed yesterday, even Miriam flying like a bird, I have tried to lift just a single grain of sand, but though I can blow it away with my breath or wipe it away with my hand, by no other means can I get it to move. Jesus answered him, saying, what purpose of source would be served by you moving a grain of sand? If you were to move it without purpose, you would soon be doing it often and would become proud and vain because of your ability. Because it was serving you but not serving source. It is possible for you to move a grain of sand or a rock even without a righteous purpose, and if you continued to practice, you would succeed because it is a gift given to you as a birthright by Source. If you use your gift for things that are trivial, you will not be able to manifest it for things that are great, for that which becomes common is not valued. But if you have learned the Celestine secret of moving both sand and mountains, then your practice would be with the purpose to perfect your gift. Therefore, the first essential is to gain the secret knowledge necessary to accomplish the miracle. There are five points to the star of Celestine light by which all miracles occur, and only with confidence, humility, faith, awe and love can the great miracles be accomplished. And Before confidence comes, you must have knowledge. If I cannot practice my gifts on small things such as moving a grain of sand, then how will I ever know that I have any gifts? Yaakov asked. And how will I discover other children of light out in the world if our gifts must be kept in secret? Jesus answered him, saying, You may use your gifts often and with power for the purposes of Source. You should practice your gifts by embodying the five-pointed star of Celestine Light and prove to yourself that you are a vessel for the miracles of heaven by using your gifts for selfless and righteous purposes. Simply remember the five-pointed star as you seek to become proficient in the use of your gifts. The stronger each of the five points is, the greater will your gifts be able to manifest. Once you embody the five points, Practice on as many grains of sand as you desire until you have perfected your gift. But know that even if you never move a grain of sand, you should still be supremely confident that you do have special gifts, for I have told you that you do. You must not be puffed up with pride because of your gifts, but humbled by the honor that Source has bestowed upon you. And how do you relate to Source, the Unseen God? Do you know Source the father and mother, even as you know me? Is your faith great enough that though not seeing, you still know the living God and feel the spirit of the living God moving in your heart? Is your faith great enough that though not hearing, the voice of Source still speaks as a still, small voice silently in your head, imparting wisdom you did not know, ever showing you the way to go? 
the greater your faith, the greater your power. It is for this cause that you neither see nor hear source while you sojourn in mortality, except as the warm feeling that overwhelms your heart or as the still, small voice in your head that tells you the truth you did not know or in your dreams that seems so real. If you could see and hear God as men see and hear one another, what would be the need of faith? Give thanks for your blindness and deafness, for it is through them that you learn to listen with the part of you that is of God and learn to hear your father and mother in heaven when they give inspiration to your head, seek you in dreams, or touch your heart and move you to good actions. Because of your deafness and blindness, you can build the faith that moves mountains. Let confidence, humility and faith lead to awe and wonder in the majesty of all source has created and the power of God that has been given to you to come forth as the lightning of the storm and the bomb that calms the storm and heals all wounds. Lastly, draw upon your love. If faith is the power of your gifts, love is the activator. You must have a love that burns as a passion that can never be dimmed in your heart. For without it, confidence, humility, awe, and faith are for naught. Whatever gift you desire to manifest, you must first focus on a love that will activate the gift. If you are in prison for the sake of source and desire to be free, think of the love you have for God. Become one with the passion of pure love. That it may activate your commands. If you are asked to heal a young girl, Think of your own daughter or son and how much you love them. Feel the passion of your love for them, then lay your hands upon the infirmed and, with your gifts, empowered by your confidence, humility, awe, faith and love, heal them. Concerning finding the other children of light in the world, you will seldom see them manifesting their gifts, for most will not know yet that they have them and those who know will likely hide them for their own safety lest they be thought a witch and stoned. But when you preach, you will speak of the gifts given to the children of light. There will be those that hear you and know that they have the gifts, and they will be righteous and virtuous and honor the temple of their body, and they will come to you as the spirit of source moves them to be among their own kind. And there will be those who hear you and know not that they have the gifts but they will find themselves drawn and fascinated to learn of them. Those that are also drawn to live in righteousness and virtue and honor their bodies as temples are surely children of light. But those who are drawn to learn of the special gifts of Source but do not desire to live in righteousness and virtue, honoring the temples of their bodies, are not called to be children of light at that time, and they should be taught no more of the special gifts of Source. But some of those have just lost their way and are too weak to be masters of themselves. Therefore, do not turn away sincere seekers of truth, even those who are not strong enough to be their own masters. Instead, show them a path where they can become the master of themselves, where they can throw off the old and love to live in the new. Then let them wrestle with themselves to see which will be the victor. When the master of self has won, and they are ready to be born again, lead them to the gate that they may enter and discover how much greater light fulfills than darkness. And all who walk through the gate of virtue shall become children of light and inherit all that source has to give to the worthy and the righteous. The Calling of Mataya Jesus speaks to Mataya, a tax collector who invites him to his house to share the midday meal so that he can learn more of his teachings. Jesus is condemned by the Pharisees for eating with publicans and speaking to those known to be liars, thieves and adulterers. Jesus asks Mattia to be one of his disciples and Mattia accepts. And it came to pass that Jesus journeyed into Tiberias accompanied by Miriam and his disciples. Near midday, as Jesus was walking through the town, he saw a man named Mattia sitting at the custom house, and he went up to speak with him, saying, I know there is light in your heart. Therefore, why do you labor in the darkness for Caesar? 
Matbaya was startled by the question of Jesus and disquieted to be seen in the company of the notorious Galilean and his disciples, for Jesus's fame had spread throughout Galilee, and he said unto him, I am just a simple man, working as best I can to feed my family. I know publicans are not well thought of, but I do my best to treat all men fairly. Jesus answered him, saying, Is it? Fair to take the coins earned by a man's diligent toil and labor and give them to Caesar, who labored not for them, to live in luxury, gluttony, debauchery, and idleness. Matbaya put his finger to his mouth and, speaking in a whispered voice, bade Jesus, Do not speak thus, good man, for I have seen zealots imprisoned and crucified for less. Jesus responded firmly, you have called me a good man, but if good men stand idly by while evil is rendered and speak not against it or do not take actions to thwart it, then they are as guilty as they who committed the evil. Matbaya shook his head in disagreement, saying, Taxes are not matters of choice. Paying what is due is not like standing idle while a man is murdered before your eyes. Therefore, it is not just to call this an evil. To not pay is to die at worst or bring great misery to your house at best and all for something that cannot be changed by the common man. Whether taxes are just or unjust is not even a question to consider, because they are as they are, and to speak against them is fruitless. They are a compulsion that brings severe penalties for any who would try to escape them or entice others to avoid them. How then could obeying a compulsion be evil? I am warning you in the strongest terms to stick with preaching religion and not to meddle with the affairs of the government. Are you afraid then to talk with me? Jesus asked. Not at all, Mataya answered. It is you, being a man of faith, who has people that follow you and look up to you that should be afraid to be seen speaking to me, a publican. I do not think my company will be good for your reputation. Jesus turned and opened his arm pointing at Miriam and his disciples, saying, This is my beloved wife Miriam, and these are my brothers and disciples, Cephas, Yaakov, Amram, Yaakov, Yohanan, and Philip. It is important that they do see me speaking with you, that they may know with a surety that it is not among those who have found the light that they will do their greatest work, but among those that still are in the darkness. Matbaya looked surprised at Jesus' answer, and he said unto him, If you have neither fear of persecution from the Romans nor being reviled by your followers, then accept my invitation to share the midday meal. For I desire to hear more of your teachings that I might better understand the mystery that you are. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at the midday meal with Matbaya, other publicans came also to eat and he was sitting among several. And there sat others at the custom house, also eating their midday meal, who were known to be liars, thieves, and adulterers. When the Pharisees saw him eating and speaking freely with such people, they beckoned to his disciples to meet them outside of the custom house, and they asked them, Why does your master eat and drink and speak with publicans and sinners? But Jesus heard their words, and standing to address them, he spoke loudly so they and everyone else could hear, They that are whole and well have no need of a physician, but only those who are sick. Go and learn the meaning of that, and source will show you mercy. Be warned that murderous sacrifices will not bring you to the reward you seek, nor make you the man you think you are. Only having a love for source that causes you to live as God lives and a love for others that is not constrained by prejudice and class can mark you as a man of God and a worthy child of light. Know that I am here to bring the celestine light of source to everyone and have come to call those who are lost out of darkness, just as much as to call those who have always walked a good path into the greater celestine light. When a man who has lived in a darkened pit repents and pulls himself up from the depths of darkness into the light, it is a greater journey than when the virtuous repent and become more virtuous, 
and the celestine light thus gained by the greater journey brings also a greater bliss. The Pharisees scoffed at him and departed, deriding Jesus for his words, and he admonished his disciples, saying, Remember to teach by both precept and example. Nor ever forget that every person upon the earth was born as a son or daughter of God, even the Pharisees and the publicans. Though many have lost their way and sinned greatly, all save those who have murdered or fought with vile against source can come again into the light from whence they came with a sincere and just repentance. Then turning to Mattaya, he said, Mattaya, son of Cleopas, you are as you have said, a man of fairness, as you have been given to. Understand what is fair. But I call you now to a high and holy calling. Repent of your sins this day and follow me. I will give you a greater light, even the greatest light that men may have, and by this, you will see all the world through new eyes, and the man you truly are will breathe the first breath of life. And Mattaya, to his own surprise, was moved to tears, as his heart was overcome with a peace and joy he had never known. He fell to his knees and kissed the feet of Jesus, saying, I feel a power moving over me such as I have never imagined, and it can only be the power of the Almighty God. My very flesh tingles and is alive such as it has never been. I know not what will become of me and my family, but never have I known as surely what I know now. Jesus of Nazareth, lead me where you will and I will follow. Standing for the Truth Mattaya throws a big feast and invites his friends and fellow publicans to announce that he is now a follower of Jesus and is resigning his duties as a publican. He gives a moving testimony of his conversion. Outside his house, the Pharisees, as well as some of Yukonan's disciples, question Jesus as to why he is feasting on a day that should be set aside for fasting according to the law. Jesus explains the true value of fasting and when it is appropriate to fast. The following day while Mattaya was at his large house, preparing to begin journeying with Jesus in his travels, Jesus, Miriam, and the disciples came to him, as Jesus had promised they would meet him again at midday. In anticipation of his coming, Mattaya prepared a feast and invited his friends and fellow publicans. So when Jesus arrived, there was already a crowd of people present and many were already eating and drinking. The disciples of Jesus were somewhat reluctant to go into the house of Mattaya, for publicans were considered unclean in their culture and to even enter the house would be to become unclean. Cephas broached the subject with Jesus, saying, I feel uncomfortable to enter this house. Look at the people who go there. They are not of the light but of darkness. They eat and drink, and certainly much worse as well, and continually do evil to their fellow men by exercising unrighteous dominion. How can this be a place for us? Surely you do not wish Miriam to be seen in the company of such people. You speak truth, Cephas, Jesus answered. But if those who are in the dark never are shown the light, how then will they ever know it? By entering into Mattaya's house, we are not condoning corrupt and evil choices that have been made by those within. And we are having an opportunity to show them by our example better way. An opportunity we would not likely incur in our accustomed travels. Yet you must never forget that all men and women were created as sons and daughters of God and there is redemption and forgiveness for all who would repent of their evil and turn to the light. Thus has it been for Mattaya, and thus it can be for others as well, but only if those who have the light first reveal it unto those who do not. Once the light has been shown, those who walk in darkness know. Longer can say, I knew of no other way. Never hesitate to show the Celestine light of Source, even to the most corrupted for there always remains an ember of heaven in the heart of every man and woman, and if encouraged and shown the way, it can be fanned into a flame of virtue and righteousness. 
But woe to those who see the light and still mock it and turn their backs upon it. They will have no excuse when the judgment of resonance is upon them. When they cry out in agony in the life to come, it will be from within the prison they built for themselves. Those who choose to follow darkness, even when a torch is held high lighting a better path, choose not in ignorance, but in knowledge, and therefore close the door to their prison with their own hand. Cephas nodded in understanding as Jesus, Miriam, and the disciples entered into the house of Mattiah and were quickly amongst a throng of publicans, overlords, and harlots. Jesus went straight away to Mattiah and said unto him, It is good that you have called those who have known you to be here today. That they might see a man they have never seen. Show them by your words and your deeds the man of light that you have become. Mattiah answered him, saying, But how will I know this new man? I just met him yesterday and still have much to learn of his ways. Jesus smiled at his answer and told him, The man you are seeking to know has been with you for every breath of life, merely hidden away by the worldly man that had prevailed. Listen now to the still, small voice of the Celestine Mother, who has ever whispered to your heart that you would know right from wrong. Listen to the voice you have always heard. Only now, heed the gentle promptings of your heart and the sure knowledge of your head, for they will ever guide you to say and do that which is right. And it came to pass that Mattia did as Jesus bade, and he listened to the still, small voice of Celestine light inside his heart and head. And he called out to his friends and associates, and they all turned to hear him and he said unto them, this is a farewell feast, and I thank you all for coming. In the coming days, my family and I shall be moving to Capernaum to live in the communities of the Celestines, which have been established on the north end of the lake. Upon hearing these words, many of the people who were present laughed heartily, for they thought he was jesting. And one of the publicans said unto him, we have heard of that community and trust me, Mattia, they would not let you through the gate, nor would you want to go, for they do not eat meat, you can do nothing of pleasure there, they follow a crazy prophet named Jesus. And it is rumored they are zealots who have a special hatred for publicans. Mattia laughed with them and said, You are right, Helios, they... Mattia you knew would never desire to go to the place you have described. But the Mattia you knew disappeared yesterday. More than that, the Mattia you knew died yesterday by his own hand and desire. The person you see standing before you now may look the same on the outside, but on the inside, he has become a different man. Then pointing to Jesus, who was leaning with his back against a column, with Miriam standing beside him, he said, And that crazy Jesus you spoke of? There he stands. Behold the light of the world. Helios looked to Jesus at whom. Mattia pointed and laughed again, saying, That fellow? Surely you are jesting. He is dressed in the simple clothes of a worker of the land. You expect me to believe that you, who have so much, are going to walk away from all of this and follow after this man who obviously has so little. Mattia held up his hand and, in a most serious voice, said unto him, Stop, Helios. Cease to speak in disrespect to Jesus. There is more to a man than the clothes he wears. And there is a depth to this man that will pierce you to your soul. I have said that he is the light of the world and I know this as certainly as I know the sun will rise tomorrow, though it was just yesterday that I met him. For the essence of Jesus flows out from him and fills the heart of any who in sincerity seeks a greater light, even as I sought and I found. Life is more than eating and drinking and making merry, and then tomorrow we die. For in death we do not die, and in life we have not truly lived. Though many have hated me because I am a publican, you know that I am also an honest man. There is much I still must learn myself about the ways of light, 
but there is also much I have always known, but had forgotten, that now has again come upon me. Therefore, know that I speak the truth when I admonish you to listen and hear the words of Jesus of Nazareth and his disciples who are among us. Open your hearts and your thoughts to a light greater than you have lived, and you may find like I have, that a warmth fills your heart more sweet than any you have ever known, and a peace comes upon you which no travail of the world will ever overcome. You whom I have called my friends, hear now the greatest admonition of friendship I can give, do not in ignorance close your hearts to Jesus, but hear his words and the words of his disciples and see if they do not touch your heart with a beam of light that calls out to the nobility of greatness that still beats within you. And it came to pass that many in the crowd who were at the feast were touched by the words of Mattiah and the change they had seen come upon him in just a day. And the disciples of Jesus mingled among them and engaged them in conversation. And to those who would listen in sincerity, they taught the foundations of the Celestine Light of Jesus. And the Feast of Mattiah lasted into the night as the conversations continued. In earnestness and few wanted to leave. And it came to pass that three of the disciples of Yochanan came to the house of Mattiah, and they encountered four Pharisees standing without, looking in, and making critical comments among themselves as to the things they witnessed and imagined were going on inside the house. The disciples of Yochanan came up to the Pharisees who were discussing fasting, for the day upon which those in the house of Mattiah were feasting was a day that had been set aside among the Pharisees and the Hebrews for fasting. And the disciples of Yochanan also were fasting on this day. Standing together the disciples of Yochanan engaged the Pharisees in conversation, concerning fasting, and Hosea, one of the disciples said, I do not understand how Jesus, whom Yochanan loved, can so blatantly disregard that today is a day to fast. That is the least of it, cried one of the Pharisees. He is not only feasting on a day he should be fasting, but he is cavorting with all manner of sinners. By his very actions, he is repudiating his own claim to be a man of God. Hosea was not so quick to judge. He said, we should go and ask him about this, for Yochanan would not have loved him had he not been worthy. Therefore, let us go and find an explanation for such outrageous behavior. The Pharisees demurred, saying, we will not cross the threshold of a house so unclean lest we be tarnished. Perhaps, he could be enticed to come out here that we might question him. In the house of Mattiah, Miriam pulled lightly on the robe of Jesus to get his attention and whispered, I have heard the words that the Pharisees and the disciples of Yochanan speak without understanding in the street beyond the house. Without hearing a voice, I have heard them. Let us go out to them now, that you may speak with them, for they are afraid to enter into the house of Mattiah, but I know the followers of Yochanan are good and upright men. Jesus smiled and put his arm around Miriam, and speaking softly into her ear, he said unto her, It is with joy that I see you use your gifts, from rising to grasp the stone in the air to hearing the voices beyond your ears. Remember to help the others to discover and use their gifts as well. Then Jesus beckoned to Cephas and Amram to come with them, and the four of them went out to the street and walked up to the group of seven men talking amongst themselves. Seeing them coming, the circle of men parted, forming a half circle that they might all face Jesus. Spreading his arms at waist level, with palms facing toward them, he said unto them, he whom you seek is before you. They looked about themselves nervously, for his appearance and words were unexpected. Then Hosea said unto him, Today is a day of fasting among all who are devout. How is it that we fast and the Pharisees fast, but you and your disciples not only do not fast, 
but insult the sanctity of this day by feasting. Jesus answered him, saying, Those who fast each week on Mondays because it is said to be the day that Moses went up to the mountain and then again on Thursdays because that is said to be the day he came down from the mountain and then again nearly every tenth day for some other purpose to supposedly please God. No not the God whose favor they seek. Source is a God of people and of love, not of continually repeated ritualistic laws, the obeying of which becomes more important than the lives of the children of God. According to the scroll of fasts, a widow who recently lost her husband may not mourn on a day of fasting. What God worthy to be honored as such would be so callous as to tell a widow she could not mourn her lost husband, but instead that fasting again, and again, and again, was more important. Men have told you that this is what you must do to please God. But instead of listening to traditions and the laws of men and priests, listen to your heart, because it is in your heart that the true words of God are spoken and where you will find the celestine light of source that surpasses all the laws of men. One of the Pharisees stepped forward, saying, You speak only of fasting as if that is all that we do, but it is merely one of the three holies required to prove true devotion. These are not our laws, but laws that have been handed down from God through the prophets from generation to generation. If you are saying things that are contrary, it is you who is going against the will of God. Fasting alone is for naught. It must be combined with prayer and the giving of alms to show God true devotion. By fasting regularly, we not only remember the great teachings of Moses, but we also show God that we are willing to punish ourselves in mortification for our sins. By our prayers we show that we know our forgiveness and reward can only come from God. By giving alms, we show that we earn coin only for God, not for ourselves, and show our compassion for the poor, even as we pray that Source will have compassion upon us. You hypocrites! Jesus said unto them with a raised voice, You fast and pray and give alms twice each week and almost every tenth day to show Source your contriteness for your sins, but if you had truly repented of your sins, you would do them no more. Woe unto those who think they can sin and do penance with a fast and a prayer and a handful of alms, then sin again the following days, only to once again find forgiveness by a repeated fast and prayer and gift of alms. Think you that the favor of source can be bought with a fast and a prayer and a handful of alms? You Pharisees, in your false piety, give trespass offering every day for sins of which you are ignorant. Think you that Source cares so much about your imperfections that things so trivial that you cannot even remember them are going to draw the wrath of God? Source forgives the sinner who repents of their sins and sins no more, but does not forgive the sinner who sins and thinks by simply following the rituals of the law that they can be cleansed. You are not perfect, and Source looks with a forgiving eye upon those who in their weakness do small sins but each day strives to be better. But for those who commit grievous sins, who steal, and fornicate, and commit adultery, and murder, and exercise unrighteous dominion over others, their forgiveness comes only with a true repentance and a forsaking of the sin. If you truly repented, you would sin no more, therefore, if you fast to cleanse your sins, why then would it need to be done twice a week? Verily, fasting is important at the time of repentance to help you to find the place of humility and sorrow that brings about a true repentance. But the man who fasts twice a week either obeys the law like a sheep and knows not the God he proclaims or is a hypocrite who never repents and therefore always feels a need to fast, having never abandoned his sins. Other than in pursuit of true repentance, a fast should only be used on rare and special times in a man's life when he seeks to spiritually receive a higher understanding of Source and the Celestine ways of God. Or for health, once a month to cleanse the body and mind of accumulated sludge, a fast is useful, 
but should not be required. Let each help themselves as they will. For these reasons, neither I nor my disciples, nor the children of light, fast on this day or on any of the days prescribed by the law. We fast when it has true meaning and brings about a true transformation of the body and soul, not merely because it is one of many ritualistic days set aside to fast. The Pharisees were angry at the words of Jesus, but they knew not how to reply to him, and they stormed off, muttering to themselves. But the disciples of Yochanan remained, for they had been touched by his words. And Hosea asked, Good teacher, how is it that Yochanan taught us to fast often, but you do not? Jesus answered him, saying, that you were disciples of Yochanan speaks already of your devotion to God. It was given to you to learn more of the mysteries of Source because of your worthiness, and for this cause fasting can be of benefit. Therefore, Yochanan encouraged you to fast often to aid you in your quests. But search your memories and you will discover that in his encouragement, he never admonished you to fast as the Pharisees fast or to fast on a frequently repeated schedule, for then the very purpose of fasting is lost in repetition. Yochanan is my brother of spirit more than any other man. I speak the very words he would speak, so you know that I speak true. Therefore, you know that Yochanan would never teach that frequently repeated ritual would draw one closer to God. Only with a heart that beats as one. With the Celestine spirit of Source may man become more than man and become a child of light. The Old and the New When Jesus is questioned by the disciples of Yochanan as to why so many of the old ways and customs must change, he explains the significance of the new. And it came to pass that the disciples of Yochanan came to understand and believe in the teachings of Jesus as they continued to speak with Cephas and Amram and on the following day, they agreed to gather their families and accompany Mataya and his wife and children to Capernaum to become a part of the family of light. But among the guests who had known Mataya and came to his feast, none came unto the light at that time or desired to learn more of the teachings of Jesus. Before they departed, Hosea, who was the eldest among the three disciples of Yochanan, sought further enlightenment from Jesus saying, Good teacher, everything you speak of and that we have heard from your disciples seems so new and different from all that our people have lived for generations upon generations. Perhaps we have strayed some, but is it really necessary to change so many traditions and introduce so many new doctrines and do away with so much of the old? Jesus answered him, saying, If you have new fermenting wine, do you put it into old bottles or new? New, Hosea answered. And why is that? Jesus asked. Hosea gazed at him for a moment with a somewhat curious look and then answered, If you put new fermenting wine into an old wine skin, it will swell and burst the bottle and all the wine will be lost. And so it is with the Celestine light of Source, which I bring, Jesus said unto him. It cannot be merged with the ways of old, for they cannot bear its light, and in bursting both the new and the old, the good that had been gained would be lost. For this cause, I have said that I have not come to uphold the law, but to destroy it. In that, the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees fear, thinking I am trying to rip asunder that which they hold dear. But the ways of old will remain for it is better that men have some truth to live by than none at all. Only a precious few will be able to understand and embrace the greater Celestine light that I bring, and not all of them will bear it when they first learn of the new covenant I have brought. Some will have to chew upon it, and ponder it, and pray about it, and speak with others to hear of the good and the bad that they might comment even as few men having drunk old wine will straightway desire new wine, for they will say to themselves that the old is better. And it is only after they have been convinced by their pondering and praying that they will 
consider that perhaps this new wine is from a grape that has never been and is delicious beyond all that is aged. Therefore, because I love the precious few who will dare to drink the new wine, I do not remake the old, but give them the new in all of its glory. Seeking to repair the old would be to invite misery upon all, even as no man sews a piece of new cloth onto an old garment, else, the new piece that filled it up will take away from the old and the rent is made worse. Most people are like the wheels of a cart in a rut worn deep, they are comfortable in their rut even if it does not bring them to the most wonderful places, and they would protest in anger and violence should someone try to move the cart. But those who are children of light do not feel comfort in the rut, but imprisoned. When they see the new path I make before them, they see freedom, and a new cord pulls upon their heart, calling them home to a celestine glory beyond. And it came to pass that at the request of Jesus, Mattiah took his family to Capernaum, and Philip the disciple went with them that he might introduce them to the members of the community and to help them get settled. And the three disciples of Yochanan and their families also came with them. Before they left, Philip inquired of Jesus as to what was to be done with the Passover that was coming in the next days, for Jesus and most of the disciples would be away from their families if they did not return to the communities of light on Lake Genesaret. Calling all of the disciples to him, including Miriam and Mattiah and the disciples of Yochanan, Jesus answered Philip, saying, If there are those among the communities of light that wish to keep the Passover, then let them keep it as they will. But you are no longer that people, nor are any who come among us from whatever tribe or race or religion, who they once were. You have been given the greater Celestine light of source and that which is old has been laid in the grave. Though the time has already passed this spring, henceforth let the children of light celebrate the seasons of the earth, which source has given for the joy and abundance of man, a. Eh? Let there be celebrations on the day of greatest light and the day of longest night and upon the days. Twice each year, when the day and the night are equal. Let the spring celebrate renewal. Let the summer celebrate life. Let the fall celebrate abundance. Let the winter celebrate the light of source, which pierces the darkest night. Let these be special times of the year when you fast and pray as you deem best and make special efforts to touch the light of source in your heart and soul and become greater than you are. Do not become as the people of the world who have holidays or special religious requirements many days in each month. These four times of celebration are sufficient for the children of light and will have more significance in your lives if they are not cluttered among numerous celebrations. Make these days and the days leading up to them very special, and they shall carry you to higher and higher heights every year of your life upon the earth. A. Celestines celebrate four seasonal holidays during the times of the year Jesus specified. These are Spring Equinox, Excelsior, Celebration of Renewal Summer Solstice, Vitalta, Celebration of Life Fall Equinox, Majokplar, Celebration of Abundance Winter Solstice, Luminaire, Celebration of Light. Passover at Jerusalem Jesus heals an infirmed man on the Sabbath but is condemned by the Pharisees for breaking the Sabbath and commanding another to do likewise. After speaking with Jesus, they seek to find ways to have him killed. And it came to pass that Jesus Miriam, and the remaining disciples that were with them went into Jerusalem during the time of Passover, but they did not celebrate it as did the tribes of Judah, the Levi, and the other children of Israel. Now there was in Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which was called Bethesda in Hebrew. In and around this pool lay a great multitude of the blind and the withered, waiting for the waters of the pool to move in sudden waves. For it was believed that from time to time, an angel would come down and blow upon the water, stirring the waves in only a place, 
and whosoever should get into the water and get to that place first would be healed of their infirmity. A certain man was there, named Gasseri, who had been weakened and enfeebled for thirty-eight years. Each day of his later life, he had pulled himself from his sleeping space to the edge of the pool, hoping that someday, he would be the one to reach the waters stirred by the angel and be healed of his infirmity. When Jesus came upon the Bethesda pool, he saw Gasseri and knew that he had been infirmed for most of his life, and walking up to him, he asked, Do you desire to be made whole? Gasseri looked up with hope alive in his eyes and said, Sir, I desire it so greatly that I have crawled on my elbows to this spot every day for more years than I can remember. But I have no servant or friend to put me in the water when it is stirred, so always there is someone else who steps in before me and is healed. While I remain as I am. Jesus looked upon him and asked, Are all who step first into the water after it has been stirred healed? Kasari shook his head and answered, No, only a few, but even knowing a healing only happens for some. I still have faith God will bless me if I can just show him I am faithful enough to make it into the water before all others. Jesus continued to question him, asking, Why do you think some are healed and some are not? Kasari answered him, saying, It is by the grace of God that an angel comes to stir the water, but God does not reward the wicked. Therefore, only the righteous are healed. Why then do the unrighteous go into the water, if only the righteous are healed? Jesus asked. Because they do not believe it is an angel that stirs the water, but magic they know not. Kasari answered. Therefore, they enter in ignorance and take the place of those like me who live in righteousness and could truly be healed in the waters. And how is it you are righteous? Jesus inquired. In my heart, I love God, Kasari answered. Many have said that God has cursed me and wonder why I do not revile him. But I know that I have become as I am that I might grow stronger in my faith. God rewards those who endure and I shall never deny him or turn my back upon him. Though I am crippled, I have learned many things over the years. From lying here each day and observing the people and the way they are, things I never would have learned if I had not become as I am. Therefore, I still thank God each day for all the things he has allowed me to learn because of my infirmity. Hearing this, Jesus had a tear that fell from his eye and ran down his cheek, and turning to Miriam and his disciples, he said, In this man, see the faith of ages. Then turning to the man, he asked, Do you know who I am? Kasari shook his head, saying, No, kind sir, I am afraid I know you not. But I perceive that you are a teacher or a preacher, for you dress well, but... Simply, and there are several in your party, and they watch and listen to you with great attention. Then Jesus said unto him, I am Jesus of Nazareth. I am the Alpha and the Omega, and I say unto you now, Good brother of light, rise up, take your bed and walk. Remain righteous in your words and deeds, lest a worse thing befall you. Immediately, the man stood up and was made whole. Throwing his hands up into the air, he shouted with joy, and then fell at the feet of Jesus, kissing them and giving thanks. Standing up sprightly, he grabbed his bed, picked it up, and walked away to go to his family to show them the miracle that had been wrought. Though there were many other of the infirmed lying about the Bethesda pool, none asked Jesus to heal them, and they turned their faces from him for it was perceived that he had broken the Sabbath. As he was walking away from the pool of Bethesda, Kasari encountered three Pharisees, and seeing him whole, they confronted him, asking, How is it that we saw you yesterday and you were enfeebled and infirmed as you have always been? And now you are a new man made whole? Cursed man! you reward the miracle God has wrought. 
by breaking the Sabbath and carrying your bed. Gasseri protested their accusations, saying, For thirty-eight long years, I have been infirmed. But on this day, I have been made whole. A man came up to me and told me to stand and pick up my bed and walk, and I knew in my heart that as he commanded so it would be. So I stood and picked up my bed and walked as he bade me do. Who is this great Sabbath breaker? the Pharisees inquired. Gasseri pointed back toward the Bethesda pool, where Jesus remained with his disciples, and he said, It was that tall man there. Jesus of Nazareth, whom the others gather around. But I assure you he is a man of God. How can you, an ungrateful Sabbath breaker, recognize a man of God, the Pharisees? Taunted. And they approached Jesus and asked, Was it you that healed a man on the Sabbath and then commanded him to break the Sabbath by carrying his bed? Jesus, knowing the time had come to reveal himself to his adversaries, answered them, saying, My Father in heaven does good works upon this day, and as I have seen my Father do, so do I likewise. And a man who carries a bed on the Sabbath, not for work, but in celebration of a miracle of God, is honoring Source and the Sabbath. The Pharisees were beside themselves in anger, for not only had he broken the Sabbath and taught others to do the same, but he had also called God his Father, making himself equal with God. And in unison, they cried out, Blasphemer! But Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but only what he has seen the Father first do. And whatsoever the Father does, these things also shall the Son do likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all the things which he does, and he will show him greater works than what has happened here today. Verily, you shall yet see the Son do mighty works for which even you will marvel. For as the Father rises up the dead and quickens them back to life, so the Son will quicken whom he will. And the Father shall judge no man, but the fate of a man's eternity shall be judged by the Son for the Father has committed all judgment unto him. This, that all men might honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son, honors not the Father who has sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you he that lives according to my words and the example of my life, believes on he who sent me and shall inherit everlasting life. They shall never come into the throes of condemnation and shall pass in peace and bliss from death back into life. Verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear and follow that which they hear shall live. For as the Father is a life unto himself, so is the Son a life unto himself. They are not one, but two, but the two are one in purpose. Nor is there a father without a mother for then how could there be a son? And the father and the mother have given the son authority to execute all the judgments of heaven, for he is the son of the source. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear my voice, and they shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and exaltation and they who have done evil unto the resurrection of torment and damnation. I can of my own self do nothing. As I see and hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will or glory, but the will and glory of my father and mother who have sent me. If I alone bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. But you know the other who has borne witness of me, even Yochan and the baptizer and all who love God know that witness is true. You went unto Yochanan and heard his words and his testimony of me, for he bore witness of the truth he knew more than any man. But I need not be upheld by the testimony of any man, for the very Spirit of God testifies of me in the heart of any true seeker of the light. But I speak to you of Yochanan, 
that you might remember the man and his testimony and turn your heart from cold to warm, that you might yet be saved. There is a greater witness in the world of the Son than that of Yochanan, and that is the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works which I now do. And greater things shall you yet see and hear of, bearing witness of me, and know that the Source have sent me. The Father himself has borne witness of me by the power of heaven which I hold. And the voice of the Mother ever speaks my name into the ears of those who would hear. But you have never seen his shape or heard her voice, for Source cannot dwell in unclean vessels. You have not had his words abide in you and have not felt her spirit stirring your soul. Therefore, he whom the Source have sent, you believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them, you imagine you have eternal life, and in them, you will find testimony of me. But even knowing the truth, like a fire burning inside that you cannot deny, you still, in your stubbornness and devotion to the law and tradition, will not come unto me that you might have life. But I do not expect to receive honor from the men of the world, for how can they honor he whom they do not know? But it is by your choice that you know me not, nor desire to learn of me and the celestine light I have brought. Therefore, I know that you do not have the love or light of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. Yet if another Pharisee were to come in his own name and do the things that I do, you would receive a him and honor him. How can you seek the honor of one another and not seek the honor that comes only from God? Do you think that it will be me who accuses you to the Father? It will not be me, but Moses whom you revere. He will accuse, and I shall judge you and weigh your soul in the balance by the resonance in your heart, which will be testified to by the actions of your life and the words you have spoken. But Moses will first judge you as Hypocrites, for you say you believe Moses and believe the words he wrote, but you do not believe, for he wrote of me. And if you believe not the words of Moses, whom you revere, how then shall you believe my words? The Pharisees were beside themselves with anger but could find no words to respond to him. Angrily, they stormed away and returned to their conclaves in Jerusalem to spread ill words about Jesus of Nazareth. From that day forth, they sought to find ways in which they might have him killed, for not only had he broken the Sabbath and commanded others to do likewise and said that God was his father, but he had also said that there was a mother in heaven, even as many among the Gentiles and pagans believed. By their love you will know them. Jesus is once again condemned by the Pharisees for breaking the Sabbath when his disciples eat some ears of corn while walking through a cornfield. Jesus heals a man of a withered hand while teaching at the synagogue, which further angers the Pharisees for once again breaking the law of the Sabbath, and they plot anew in ways to have him destroyed. During the following Sabbath Jesus Miriam and his disciples walked through a cornfield, and his disciples who were hungry began to pluck some ears of corn and eat them. Seeing this, Jesus reminded them to leave a coin for the farmer in payment for that which they had eaten, for they had taken without asking. But when the Pharisees saw it, they chastised him, Behold, your disciples have done that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. Jesus answered them, saying, have you not read what David did, in the days of Abiathar the high priest, when he and those who were with him were hungry, how they entered into the house of God and ate the shoe bread, which was not lawful for them to eat, neither for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that if a priest who is serving in the temple violates the Sabbath, they are blameless? Think you that David or the priests are greater than the Lord of the Sabbath? Verily, if you understood the meaning of the words of Source, that I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned these innocent men. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath.
You have ears to hear and eyes to see, use them, for I say unto you that. In this place is one greater than the priest, even one greater than the temple, even the Lord of the Sabbath. From the cornfield, Jesus went straight away to the synagogue to teach, and the Pharisees followed to see if they could catch him in more acts of breaking the laws of the Sabbath. Jesus walked among the people in the synagogue, and they parted like the sea before Moses to let him pass, for word that he was coming had preceded his steps. Standing before them, Jesus said unto them, You have heard it said that a pious man prays many times a day and gives alms to the temple or synagogue. But I say unto you, of what good to the God of heaven are alms given to priests or prayers said upon prayers, simply for the sake of praying? If you would give alms, give them until you feel their loss in your own comfort. Give some to support the synagogue and temple but not all, for source would see you make your own good choices. Give a tenth of your excess to the synagogue and temple to support your spiritual community, but then give what remains of your excess to the poor or to your temporal community. Not in random should you give or to the man who says he will distribute your money for you. Give directly to the poor or your community in ways unseen, that you may see the benefit of your alms in the lives of those in need, but that they will not see their benefactor. By this means, you will see with your own eyes that your money has been well given. Because they will not see their benefactor and only God will see, you will grow in your character, having given for love and not for the acclaim of men. And of what purpose or benefit to either you or source is the endless repetition of the same prayers? Do you think that by praying the same repetitions again and again, you are proving your devotion to God? Nay you are only proving your slavish acceptance to the dictates of foolishness given by priests that neither brings you closer to God, or God closer to you, and demonstrates a lack of spiritual depth that you do not speak words from your own heart. If you truly wish to be closer to God and to show your devotion, then do so by your good deeds of love and selflessness. Treat others as you hope Source will treat you. And when you pray, Pray without repetition, but with a connection of love to God as the words flow from the depths of your heart, whatever they may be. If you truly want to hear and feel source in your life, then pray in sincerity and humility and speak with God, not in repetition, but as one friend would speak to another, for the righteous and virtuous have no greater friend than source. There was a man present by the name of Job who had been born with a withered hand that hung limply upon his arm. Notwithstanding his infirmity, Job was a good man. His countenance was pleasant, and with a smile on his face, he always sought ways to help his brethren and those in need, even as Jesus had spoken of. After he was finished speaking, Jesus began to walk out of the synagogue, and he passed next to Job. Seeing his withered hand, he said unto him, Though your hand is withered, your heart is full of love. Job nodded his head slowly in silence and then said unto him, I love every day of life, for it is another day that I can do good in the world. I stopped thinking of my withered hand long ago, else it would have stopped me from being who I prefer to be. Who can fathom the ways of God? I am as I was created. Perhaps, if I was not born as I was, I would have taken a different path in life, not so fruitful. Now the Pharisees had been watching and listening as Jesus spoke to Job, and sensing that they might trap him into again breaking the Sabbath, and this before many witnesses. They questioned him, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, saying, What man among you having many sheep shall see one fall down a pit on the Sabbath and not lay a hold of him and pull him out? How much greater is man than a sheep? Wherefore, I will ask you, 
Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or is it better to let evil have its way? Is it lawful to save a life or is it better to let it perish? And the Pharisees looked at him in silence, not knowing how to answer. Then Jesus looked around him to see that all eyes were upon him. Then to Job, he said, Stretch forth your hand. Job stretched forth his withered hand, and Jesus held it clasped in both of his hands and said unto him, Let your hand be as the hand of the man would be if it was in your power to help him. And opening his hands, Jesus released the hand of Job, and it was whole and healthy, and all who saw it marveled. But the Pharisees were filled with madness, and leaving the synagogue in anger, they plotted anew what they might do to Jesus and how they could bring about his destruction. After they had departed, Jesus told the people gathered in the synagogue, Today you have witnessed the power of source, and it did not come from endless prayers of repetition or from the giving of alms that vanish where you know not. It came from love and virtue and righteousness. If you desire the blessings of heaven, love one another. And let your good deeds done in secret testify of your love. By this means, may you separate the wheat from the chaff and know the people of God from the pretenders, by their love, you shall know them. And from love comes all virtue, righteousness, and good deeds. Calling of the Twelve Apostles Jesus calls to four men in a crowd of people that have never met him in person, to follow him. They join. Miriam and his disciples and together hike into the hills to the west. Jesus calls each of those with him to a high and holy calling as apostles special witnesses who will testify of his life and teachings, to act in his name, and be empowered to do all manner of miracles. Those he calls and ordains as apostles are his wife, Miriam of Magdala, whom he proclaims apostle of his apostles, Cephas of Bethsaida. Yaakov of Nazareth brother of Jesus Amram of Bethsaida, Yaakov of Bethsaida, Yohanan of Bethsaida, Philip Bartalma of Bethsaida, Matthew of Tiberias son of Cleopas Shimon the Zealot, Yuda son of Cleophas, Yuda Toma of Ptolemy known as Toma and Yuda Iscariot of Jerusalem. And it came to pass that Jesus and Miriam and the other disciples returned to the communities of light at Lake Genesaret. A multitude of people followed them from Judea and Egemia, bringing with them their infirmed and diseased calling out periodically for Jesus to heal them. As they passed through Galilee, the residents drew notice and word that Jesus the healer was present spread quickly in so much that the multitude increased. As they approached the first community, on the northwestern shore of the lake, they spied another large group of strangers waiting beside the road, and coming upon them, they found citizens of Ptolemy and Tyre and Sidon, who, also having heard of the miracles of Jesus, had come to see him for themselves and to have their relatives healed. As he passed through the throng along the road, many reached out to touch him, hoping to be healed, and it was with great effort that the disciples formed a protective circle around Jesus and Miriam to prevent them from being crushed by the crowd. Passing through Genesaret and by Chorazin, Jesus, Miriam, and the disciples continued on to Capernaum where they had hoped to part ways, each to their own homes and families, and wait until the following day for Jesus to speak to the crowd. But the multitude was persistent in their desires for Jesus to come among them in so much that they would not leave and began to clamor in their voices for him to come to them. Scarcely had Jesus and Miriam come near their house, than another group of travelers came upon them from the road to the east coming from beyond the Jordan. Seeing that something must be done and could not be delayed, Jesus had Cephas tell the multitude to let Jesus pass to the lake and then he would speak to them. 
Jesus asked Cephas to have a boat ready by the shore to carry away him and Miriam if the teeming throng pressed too much upon them. Thus it came to pass that Jesus stood on the shore of the lake with the multitude before him and the lake, and a waiting boat behind him, and he said unto them, I know that you have come to be healed of your infirmities and diseases as you have heard it said that I can do. But I tell you in soberness that I do nothing of my own, but only the will of they who sent me, my Celestine Father and Mother in heaven. You seek to touch me and be healed, but the power to heal does not emanate from me, but from you. I am merely the water that sprouts the seed of virtue that must first be inside of you. All the water in the world will not sprout a seed that is not there, for my water is holy and it only helps grow a seed which is planted in righteousness and virtue. But do not despair, for I know that many of you have come from far away, and your travel need not be in vain. If you came this day without a seed of righteousness and virtue inside of you, it is in your power to plant one even now. If evil has dwelt in your life where righteousness and virtue should have been, purge it from you now this very moment. In all humility and sincerity, confess your sins to those you have wronged and covenant to them and to God that you shall do them no more. If they are not with you, then confess to someone who knows and cares for you, and if they are not here, then to the stranger beside you. Repentance is a process, and this will begin to lift the weight of your yoke of darkness and help you on the path to a new life. Only by this will the water I give quench your thirst and sprout your seeds and bring you that which you desire. Make camp for the night, and I will come among you again tomorrow. Those who are pure in their heart will get their reward and their past of darkness will be as if it never was. The multitude was quieted by his words and many were humbled and they threatened no more to press him into the sea in their exuberance. Then he looked into the crowd and announced, Among you are four men that have never met me, but who know me in their hearts as if they always have. You, of whom I speak, know who you are, and I say unto you, Come into the lake and be baptized and then follow me. Upon his command, Four men came forth from the crowd with great suddenness as if they were being pushed by an unseen hand, and after giving their names, Cephas and three other disciples baptized them straight away. Immediately thereafter, Jesus set forth through the crowd, which parted to let him pass, and Miriam and his disciples came with him, and they were followed by the four men. From the multitude Jesus walked in silence, holding Miriam's hand, and they passed beyond the borders of Chorazin and into the hills to the west. Arriving upon a knoll, Jesus sat down, and Miriam was beside him on his right hand. His disciples and the four other men sat down below him in a semicircle facing him, and he said unto them, Some of you have known me since my youth. Others have only recently heard my words. But all of you are called to a high and holy calling because of your worthiness, both in this life and the life that was before this life. The time has come for you to begin to fulfill your destiny. By this, I do not say that you have an irrevocable compulsion or requirement to fulfill your calling, for your choices in life are always your own. Though you are loved greatly by source, you are never compelled upon a path, merely foreordained and predestined as your reward for lives well kept. But in the end, every day, the choice to do or do not is still yours, because foreordination is justified only upon continued worthiness and predestination only upon continued desire to remain upon the path. Some of you have been my disciples and the others desire to be so. On this day, at this spot, I call all of you to accept a higher and holier calling. I ask you to be my apostles, my special witnesses, who, along with Miriam, shall testify of my life and teachings. To you, I give all authority to act in my name, 
and by acting in my name, you act in the name and on behalf of the Source. To you, I am power to do all manner of miracles, even as you see me do. And there is nothing that you see me do that you cannot also do, if you remain worthy, your faith is strong enough, and you learn the secrets of Celestine Light and become true adepts of the Light. Let those who are new among us learn from those who have been with me for a longer time, that all might know the truth of my life and teachings without delusion or change, such as will quickly come among the people once I have returned from whence I came. Once I am no more upon the earth, in all things when there is confusion or a dispute, it is only to Miriam that you can turn for resolution, for she knows every minute of my life and all of my heart. If she speaks of my will, it is as if I had spoken it, for in truth, if she speaks it, I have. But the days will come when Miriam is also no longer among you. In those days, let your decisions be in a quorum and let there be unanimity, for if you are truly being guided by the Spirit of Source, you will all be guided to the same conclusion and understanding. Now turn to one another and let every man embrace every other man as a brother. The apostles did as Jesus bade, and each embraced one another. And in their embrace, there was kindled a divine feeling of brotherhood, different from anything they had ever felt, and it set chill bumps upon them all. Then turning to Miriam, he asked her to kneel before him, and laying his hands upon her head, he said, Miriam, child of light, daughter of Source, beloved of my heart above all others, with the authority of Source and by the power of my word, I do ordain you to be my living testament, my apostle to my apostles. And the spiritual head of the quorum of the twelve while you remain upon the earth. You are granted all the rights, privileges, power and authority to perform on earth whatever you shall deem necessary in wisdom, virtue, and righteousness for the Celestine Light of Source. Miriam then rose, and holding her hands in a prayer position upon her chest, she bowed her head and backed away from Jesus that another might come forward. Jesus called Cephas next. Cephas came and knelt down before him, and Jesus laid his hands upon his head and said unto him, Cephas, you are the rock of the Celestine Light of Source upon the earth, and upon this rock shall the children of light always find inspiration to hold fast against the world. With the authority of Source and by the power of my word, I do ordain you to be my apostle and call you to be the organizational head of the Quorum of the Twelve while you remain upon the earth. You are granted all the rights, privileges, power and authority to perform on earth whatever you shall deem necessary in wisdom, virtue, and righteousness for the Celestine Light of Source. Then Cephas rose and holding his hands in a prayer position upon his chest, he bowed his head and backed away from Jesus that another might come forward. And one by one, each of the apostles came forward and knelt before Jesus and were ordained to their apostleship and given special rights and authority. And these are those who were called and ordained as apostles and special witnesses to the life and teachings of Jesus on that day. Miriam of Magdala wife of Jesus, Cephas of Bethsaida, Yaakov of Nazareth brother of Jesus, Amram of Bethsaida, Yaakov of Bethsaida, Yohanan of Bethsaida, Philip Bartalma of Bethsaida, Mattiah of Tiberias son of Cleopas, Shimon the Zealot, Judah son of Cleophas, Judah Toma of Ptolemy known as Toma, and Judah's Iscariot of Jerusalem. Afterward, Jesus spoke further, saying, While I remain upon the earth, follow me. Walk with me on my walks through Galilee and Judea and beyond. Let your brothers and sisters of the community care for your families that you can be with me and be a living testament to my life and works. I know that this is a sacrifice I ask, but I will soon be gone and your families will still be with you. Our time together is precious but short, 
and it is in the sacrifices we make for one another that the friendships of ages are formed. After I have returned to the Celestine Lights, go forth two by two to preach my gospel, that those who are dead in spirit might be baptized and born again into the wonder of the Celestine Light. Heal the sick who have repented and have virtue and cast out devils from those possessed, that they might make their way into the light unhindered by the encumbrances of confusion. Take nothing for your journeys, except a simple wooden staff. Carry no bread or bag or money in your tunic. Wear quality but simple clothes, adorned in Celestine ways, and sandals upon your feet, for you will be walking far. Go first into all the towns of Galilee, then into Judea, then into Syria, then into Greece and Rome and Egypt. And all the lands beyond. You will inspire many, and they will form churches, and choose leaders and practice a semblance of my teachings that you have given them. But because of the desire of men to have power over other men, the churches built by men will be ruled by the laws of men, not source, and many of their doctrines will be of man, designed to suppress and control their believers rather than free and uplift them. Nevertheless, do not lament this, for those who are drawn to these churches shall still find more light than they had before, if they seek it. If at some point they should find the true celestine light of source inside of them, it will call them to their greatness, and they shall find the children of the family of light, wherever you may be. In your travels both near and far, when you discover a true child of light, it shall be a rare day and cause for great joy. You shall know them by the resonance of your hearts and spirits. On these days, once they have been baptized and become one with you, have them come to the communities of light on Lake Genesaret and their families with them. As I have said, the day will come when you must abandon the communities on Genesaret, but until that day bring the children of light to it. When Miriam has joined me in the eternal life to come, there shall be none who shall or could take her place, for only she has known me so well. Thereafter, let a quorum seek source in prayer and find unanimous agreement upon all things of common spiritual guidance. When Cephas has joined me in the eternal life to come, let the most senior of you who were my original apostles take his mantle as leader of the children of light, with the unanimous support of the remaining quorum, after a confirmation of prayer. When one of you passes from this life, let those remaining form a quorum and, with a confirmation of prayer, unanimously choose another. From among the children of light to replace he who has passed. In your choice, consider well women who are worthy and capable, for though men are more often in situations allowing them to travel and preach, it pleases source when sisters of power are not overlooked, but called upon that the children of light may benefit from their light. And upon all that you shall call, lay your hands and confer the same powers and authority ye have given to you. Finally, the day shall come when the last of you, my original twelve, will no longer be upon the earth. After that day, when there is no longer an original apostle upon the earth who can speak as an authoritative witness to my life and teachings, let there be no new apostles until the restoration of all things that shall come in the epic of promise to generations unborn. After that day, when there are no more apostles upon the earth, the children of light shall be scattered across the earth and let each group decide in ways that are best for them and their circumstances, how they shall be led and edify one another. That all might be led by the same light, I charge each of you to write down an account of my teachings and my life such as you know and have been uplifted by. If you are not accomplished in writing, take an honest and worthy scribe to write your words. Do not neglect this important charge for it is through the chain of the written, as well as the oral words, that the principles of Celestine Light shall continue to edify the children of light, generations after generations. After all of us have passed into the eternal life to come. In the days to come, 
watch me well and listen closely to my words. You shall see me do miracles, but nothing that you cannot also do. Therefore, observe how I speak and the motions I make with my hands and my eyes. Faith powers everything, but if you do not understand how a miracle was done, ask me or Miriam or one of your brethren, until you are sure of the means by which it was accomplished, that you might do likewise, with faith. Beyond the miracles that are seen by the people, there are many other powers, even secret powers, which I desire you to have that you might be a shield to the children of light, a source of testament to the faithful, and empowered to walk as a mystery among the children of men. Therefore, watch, listen, and learn, for I shall make you men such as no men have ever been. Salome Salome comes to the home of Jesus, Miriam, and Martha with a great weight of sorrow upon her shoulders as she confesses that she was the cause of Eucanon's death. Jesus explains the circumstances of the situation to Miriam and Martha, and they welcome her into their home. And it came to pass that Jesus and Miriam and the other apostles came down from the hill and returned as evening was falling to their homes. They walked through the midst of many people encamped, but were not put upon by them. Jesus and Miriam approached their home with contentment, looking forward to seeing their children again and Martha, and they spoke in amazement to one another that they had been within sight of their house for a day and were just now making their way to it. For it had been an event-filled day. As they came near the door, they heard Martha speaking with another woman. And Miriam, not recognizing the voice, asked, I wonder who that is speaking with Martha. Jesus answered her with a big smile upon his face, It is the one you have waited for. Before Miriam could ask who that might be, they were at the door and over the threshold. Seeing them, there were cries of joy from Martha and the children and Jesus and Miriam were swamped by the many embraces of their family. Through the tangle of arms and heads, Miriam spied an unknown young woman standing against the wall with her head down, so she could not see her face. And looking to Martha who was still embracing her, she asked, Who is the young woman among us? Martha pulled away from Miriam, and going over to the young woman, she reached out for her hand and then pulled her toward Miriam and Jesus. Still the woman would not look up, so they could not see her face. But Miriam noticed that she was dressed in the finest clothes, such as only a noble woman could afford. Jesus, Miriam, Martha began, Before I introduce you to this lady, I need to tell you that I have welcomed her into our home. She has a great weight upon her heart greater than any I have ever known someone to have. I have told her that in her sincere sorrow it should be lifted, but she will not let the weight depart. I hope. Your words will have more effect than mine, otherwise, I fear she will be crushed by the weight of her sorrow. Then turning to the lady, she said, Please lift your face and look upon my Lord Jesus and my sister Miriam. Have no fear. If I have shown you only friendship, they will show you no less. The woman seemed to bring her head up a fraction, but then she broke down into uncontrollable crying and fell into a heap upon the floor. The children of Jesus and Miriam and Martha stood around, looking at her uncomfortably, while the adults looked to one another. Silently seeking a consensus upon how to act. Then Martha gathered the children into their common bedroom, and Jesus and Miriam knelt one on each side of the woman, each with a hand laid lightly upon her back. And Miriam said unto her, Milady, do not sorrow so. Speak to us, and let us comfort you. But the woman continued to cry and remain in a heap upon the floor until Martha returned and also knelt beside her, saying, Come, come. You spoke not ten words to me for hours because you wanted to wait for Jesus. Well, now he is here, please speak. I have pity for your sorrow for things unknown, 
but the children are becoming frightened, and nothing is accomplished by having us merely watch you cry. We can help, but you must let us. At the words of Martha, the woman looked up. Even though her face was swollen and red from crying, they saw that she was beautiful. She looked Martha steadfastly in the eye and said in a wavering voice, I am a murderer. I killed your husband. With that confession, she stopped crying and simply fainted upon the floor. Martha and Miriam looked with confusion at one another and then looked to Jesus questioningly. He explained, This is Salome. Daughter of Herodias, stepdaughter of Herod. Herod had granted her one request, and her mother compelled her to demand the head of Yochanan, who was in prison. Though it was not her will, it is her enduring sorrow. Martha and Miriam looked to one another and then, still kneeling, embraced each other. Martha took a deep breath, and then exhaling told Miriam, If Jesus says that it was not her will, and even still she has such great sorrow for her complicity, I bear her no malice. Miriam nodded her head and said unto Martha, The beauty of her soul emanates even in the disarray of her body. It is unconditional love that will heal her heart and none more so than from you, the wife of the man whose death she grieves. Then Jesus reached forward and held the hand of Salome as she lay upon the floor, and he said unto her, Wake, child, and be at peace. In that instant, she awoke, and still holding her hand, he lifted her up and they all rose with her, until they were all standing side by side, with Jesus on her right, Martha on her left, and Miriam straight in front of her. Then without a word, the four of them reached out and put their arms around those beside them, and they pulled close into a circle of one embrace, and Jesus asked Salome, What do you feel? She answered him softly, saying, Love, love such as I have never before felt. Love such as I had never imagined could exist. It fills me. I feel as if I am lifted upon a warm breeze, touching the clouds. But how can this be? How can you touch me, let alone embrace me? You should revile and hate me, for it is only because of me that a great man who was your kin is dead. I have come here not to seek forgiveness, for I know that is not possible, but to ask that I might be the servant of your house for the rest of my life, to make an insufficient, but small amend for the evil I have done. We are all servants of source, Miriam said looking into her deep brown eyes. But beyond that, we hold no servants, nor compel any, for we are all brothers and sisters of the light, and though called to different callings, we are all equal in the sight of our father and mother in heaven and judged not by our station in life but by the celestine light of our soul and the evidence of the light in our lives. How wicked must be my soul then that I could have done such a terrible thing! Salome protested. Martha gave her a small rub with her hand upon the small of her back and said unto her, Jesus has said that you were merely the tool of your mother, and therefore, it is she who has been wicked and must make account before God for the death of my Yochanan. But, my lord, you were not there, Salome said softly. In my weakness, I did do evil, and I must make amends. Jesus turned so he could look into her eyes and said unto her, But I was there, Salome. I stood in prison with Yochanan, and together, we watched as your mother compelled you to demand his head from Herod. Though we were unseen to you, Yochanan and I watched as you valiantly tried to defer that which your mother compelled you to do. Even when at last she broke your will, the deed you have sorrowed for all of these days never happened. The moment before the executioner came forward, I held the soul of Yochanan close to me, and before the axe fell upon his neck, his mortal body was already lifeless upon the ground. Even as all mortal bodies shall die, so shall all souls continue on, the righteous to the resurrection of glory.
and so has the eternal and glorious soul of Yochanan risen to his glory. He lives still today and shall forevermore. His widow does not grieve, because she knows it is only for a breath of eternity that they have been separated, and together they shall be again. I promise you he looks down upon you even now from the Celestine realms and has only love for you, even as we do. You do not hate me? Salome asked incredulously. In unison, Jesus, Miriam, and Martha shook their heads and silently affirmed that they did not hate her. Salome spoke to them with quiet astonishment, Instead, you give me love, such as I have never felt or imagined. What manner of men and women are you? For this is not how people are. Miriam again looked into her eyes with great compassion and, holding her gaze, said unto her, We are Celestines. We are children of light. We are the son and daughters of Source, even as you are. We are not as the people of the world, because we are not of this world. We are among them, but they know us not. Only another who is one, as you are, can know the children of light. This is a great deal for me to grasp, Salome said with a sigh of happiness. I came here feeling on the edge of death, and now I feel more alive than I have ever felt. Then Jesus spoke unto her, saying, We must decide now how to care for you and where you shall go. Before he could finish his words, Salome interrupted, saying, I desire to go no place other than here. Despite your kind words and love, I feel I still have amends to make and desire still to serve your house. But you are Herod's stepdaughter, Martha pointed out. Besides the fact that you cannot stay with us as a single woman and that we also have no room in our small house for another, you bring danger to us for the king shall certainly come looking for you and bring trouble upon us were he to find you here. I will sleep outside in a shed, on some hay, Salome answered. And neither Herod nor my mother will come for me, for I am dead to them. I spoke ill to them and very severely. I told them I was coming here to be your servant. At first, Herod thought I was merely trying to connive something from him then he was incensed. But at the last, it was my mother who threw me into the street, calling me the most vile names, with only these clothes upon my back. She said henceforth I was dead to them. She grabbed Tara, one of her slave girls, and her parting words to me were that Tara was no more, for she was now Salome, and if ever they saw my face again, it would be that I was Tara. Trust me, they will not come looking for me, and it will be as they said. There is surely another Salome now in the palace, even the slave girl Tara, and I am not even a memory. It is astounding the depths of evil that those of the dark can fall to, Miriam commented. Certainly, we must find a place for you. Again Salome objected, saying, This is the place for me, I desire no other. Please do not send me away. I meant the words I spoke. I know I cannot live under your roof, for it would be against the law, but it is with gladness that I will make my bed upon the straw under the stars. Miriam laughed, saying, The law does not have the same meaning in this house as you have been accustomed to. We will not board you as an animal outside, but in truth, there is not room enough inside. Miriam looked questioningly in silence to Jesus, seeking his thoughts, and he said unto them, This week, we will have the men of the community build another room where Salome may stay, and we will welcome her into our home as a friend. Let her serve as she desires. She may travel with us on our journeys or remain and help Martha with the children or choose other tasks that she feels called to. Let her learn of our ways and we of hers for she has wisdom beyond her years and training such as few. Women will ever know, having been a daughter of the palace. 
Let her walk and listen and see and breathe the communities of light that she will know her home and her home will know her. Salome could scarcely contain her joy, and she bowed to Jesus, saying, Thank you, my Lord. I will do all of those things which you have said and serve in every other way I am able. But most of all, if I may, I desire to walk with you, even as we have heard in the palace that Miriam is said to go all places with you. I desire to learn of your teachings until every word is etched into my heart and flows into the world with every word I speak. Jesus brought them all together again, holding hands in a circle, and looking upon Salome, he said unto her, As you have desired, so it shall be. Sermon on the Mount Jesus delivers his most famous sermon to thousands of people on a big hill northwest of Chorazin. He speaks with authority and wisdom as he covers many topics, and his poetic and profound words amaze the people. The following day, at sunrise, Salome first learned the contemplative movements as she stood barefoot upon the ground outside of the house of Jesus following the movements she watched Jesus, Miriam, Martha, and the children doing and listening as Jesus explained the significance of each movement while he was doing them. Miriam gave her some of her garments to wear, and they put away Salome's expensive bejeweled clothes from the palace so that undue attention would not be drawn to her. Later, Jesus told the apostles who she was, but asked them not to reveal her true identity to others for a time. From that day forth, she remained with Jesus, Miriam, and Martha, and if there were any who condemned them, it was only in their thoughts. Fornon spoke a loft arrangement. Within a week, a small room had been added to Jesus's house by three men from the community so Salome could have a place of privacy of her own as he had promised. Soon after daybreak, multitudes of people began to gather at Jesus's house from every direction. The eleven apostles came with their families within two hours of first light as Jesus had asked them to do the previous day. Some people called out from the crowd for Jesus to heal them or to heal one of their relatives that were with them, but he moved about as if he had not heard them. Once Cephas arrived, he spoke to the multitude and asked them to have patience and promised that Jesus would speak to them soon. And they were calmed by his words in so much that no longer did any call out to Jesus to be healed. On the third hour of light, Jesus, Miriam, and the apostles commenced a walk toward the hills to the west and all of the people, including Salome and Martha and the children, followed them. The day was beautiful, warm, and sunny, and there was almost a festive atmosphere as people spoke with smiles and cordiality as they followed Jesus up into the hills. Northwest of Chorazin, about the distance to Capernaum, was a large hillock, and upon this hill, Jesus and the apostles settled at the top and the multitude sat down on the ground below him, spreading their linens and setting up their sun tarps. Many of the children played at the base of the hill while their parents sat up higher to hear the words of Jesus. Spreading and raising both hands high into the air, Jesus said unto them, On this beautiful day, with the sun's light and warmth upon you, and the blue sky above you, and the green hills beyond, and the magnificent expanse of lake below, and the songs of birds upon the air. Give thanks to Source for the glorious world that was made for you to live upon. And I say unto you, Blessed are those who are humble in spirit, for humility opens the gate of heaven. Blessed are the challenged, those who long to live in the celestine light, but are faced with many impediments which block the path to the light. Source shall give them comfort. Blessed are the calm those who are not overcome by their own desires or the chaos around them, but trust in God. They shall have peace in their hearts in the world and inherit the earth to come. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They hearken to the still, small voice and, with desire and action, seek to fulfill the will of God.
they shall be filled overflowing with the celestine light that they seek. Blessed are the merciful, who see in the misfortune of others their own life that could be and help others as they would wish to be helped, not just with alms, but also by giving of themselves and their time. They shall be blessed with the mercy of the Almighty. Blessed are the pure in heart, those who are upright and sincere, honest in every thought and activity. They will have the Holy Spirit abiding always with them, and they shall see God with a special witness. Blessed are the peacemakers, both among nations and among neighbors, those who have a peaceful mind and a harmonious heart to resolve the disputes of men. They shall be the treasurers of source, guiding divine peace from the heavens to light the lives of men upon the earth. And they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, they that live the highest light despite the condemnation of the world. They shall rise a step in heaven for every lash they take upon the world, and the kingdom of heaven shall be theirs. Blessed are you, when you resist evil, and men revile you and persecute you by word and deed and say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, and thus did they persecute the prophets which were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but take heed not to lose your savour or be contaminated by the impure, else with what will the food find its flavour? It would thenceforth be good for nothing, but to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. You are the celestine light of the world. In the example of your life, how you eat and speak and dress and live, you should be as a city upon a hill that cannot be hidden. For you do not light a candle and then hide it under a basket, but put it on a tall candlestick that it can give light to all who are in the house. The world is your house. Therefore, do not hide the celestine light of source that burns within you, but hold it high that all the world might be illuminated by your light. Let your light so shine before the world that those who condemn you will know in their hearts that they condemn a child of God and that those who are lost children of source will see your light and find their way home. Think not that I have come to uphold the law and the prophets, for I have not come to uphold any but those of truth and to fulfill the promise of source given to men and destroy those that are not and there is far more to be trampled underfoot than to be upheld, for the teachings of God have been taken and the teachings of man have been given. I am he who is the builder, and I have come to tear down the feeble works of man and to restore the mighty temple of God. Some of you here are of the world, but conquer yourself and you can be numbered among the children of light. Some of you here are children of light that have been lost in the world, and now you have found the source of the light, but cannot see how to reconcile the life you have lived with the life you know you should live. Choose that which has eternal significance and you shall have joy, both in this life and the life to come. Some of you here are children of light who have committed in your heart and shown by your deeds that you are children of light indeed. Unto you. I say that your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, for much has been given to you and much is expected. You know that it is the law that you shall not murder, and whosoever murders another shall be judged in both this life and the next. But I say unto you that there are far more ways to murder than killing the body, and all are accountable to God and should be accountable to the laws of men. Therefore, let whoever has a raging anger against another, be it a man or a woman or an animal, be liable to judgment on the earth, even as they shall be in heaven. For a raging anger is a murderous anger. It is an anger that misses the final blow of murder only because of fear of the consequences. Therefore, I say unto you that a man who has barely controlled anger without a righteous cause and injures a man or a woman or an animal, either in their body or their spirit, must be judged the same as the man who attempted murder and failed. Knowing this, 
let peace and calm always flow in the heart and mind and thoughts and words of the children of light, save in defense against that which is unrighteous. When you speak, speak with respect to all men, and to all women, and to all who work for you, and to all animals. Though you may command them to do this or to do that, do it only with kindness in your words and respect in your thoughts and actions, except for those who do not. Reciprocate the respect which you give. And if a child of light should curse another person without cause or spit raka unto another, giving contempt without cause, let him come before the council and be held accountable for his actions. Let the children of light always be the embodiment of the celestine light, especially Amangan another, especially among husbands and wives and their children. If you have a disagreement with someone, Speak of it together and come to a solution with words and reason and respect and love. Do not sulk in silence, for that is only fuel for the fire and shows a disrespect, not just for others, but for yourself and for source. Almost as bad as anger is to treat another, especially a husband, wife, or child, as if they are an idiot and that their thoughts and opinions are not even of worth to listen to with intent to hear. To not listen with respect to the thoughts and opinions of your husband, wife, or children, or brothers and sisters of light, even when you are in disagreement or even when they are simple in their method of explanation, is a grievous sin in the eyes of Source. Needing not only repentance before God, but restitution to those you have wronged by your words and actions. When you are wrong, admit your wrong with humility and ask the forgiveness of both God and the person you have wronged. And prove your sincerity by restitution to the person you have wronged. Do not think you can alleviate your sin by making an offering before the altar of God and then go your way. First, you must be reconciled with whoever you have wronged and only then will Source recognize your gift before the altar. Do not be hard-headed and unreasonable when you are in the hands of your adversaries, nor docile like a sheep, allowing others to do with you as they will. Endeavor to Give them no cause to do worse to you while you are in their hands, but neither stand idle in defense of righteousness and fairness. Keep your peace until you can stand before the fair and impartial to present the facts. If no fair and impartial are to be found, call upon Source to deliver you. You know that by the laws of God and men, it is said that you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looks upon a married woman or man with lust in their thoughts has already committed adultery in their heart. You see my wife Miriam, beautiful, with her face uncovered, and it is not a sin to look upon her. Nor is it a sin to look upon her and admire her beauty, for she is a creation of Source, and you honor Source by admiring the creations of Source. It would be no different if she were standing here before you naked in all of her splendor. Yet the man who looks upon her with lust, who thinks impure thoughts of her, but does not act upon his thoughts by either word or deed for fear of the consequences, has nevertheless already committed adultery in his heart. This silent adultery may not be punished by man, for it is kept hidden and unknown from men. But it is known to source and shall be punished by God, both in this life and the next. Therefore, if you are weak to lust, you must separate yourself from the temptation, lest you are burned by the fire you start. If your eyes cause you to sin, cover your eyes that you will not see the temptation, for it is better that you are blind to temptation than your whole body and soul is cast into the rubbish dump. Verily, your eyes are the windows of your soul, and what your eyes see, your body becomes. Therefore, let your eyes be focused only upon righteousness, that your whole life may be full of light. And if your right hand is causing you to sin, tie it to your side, lest it lead your whole body away from the light, so demeaned of value that it must be cast into the garbage pile of G.E. Hinnom and burned in the fire.
Now lust is the greatest temptation of the adversary within, lust for a woman or man, lust for power, lust of gluttony, lust for money. All things of lust lead man to commit acts for which the eternal consequences are far more painful and enduring than the pleasure of the fleeting fulfillment, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Of these, lust for a woman, be she married or not, often clouds the better judgment of man, more so than all other types of lust. Therefore, against this lust must you ever guard. To prevent this lust, by law and tradition, women cover themselves. From head to toe in uncomfortable garments that men cannot look upon them and lust. Yet it is not the woman who is sinning, but the man. Therefore, it should not be the woman who must beckovered in uncomfortable coverings, but the man. Let the woman dress in comfort and freedom. And if a man finds that seeing the bare skin of a woman causes him to lust, then let the man hide himself away in his house or cover his eyes with a hood or coverings so that he is nearly blind. The woman should not have to suffer because of the sin of the man. That the fires of lust may be righteously quenched, all men and women should also boot, and this they should do while they are young, shortly after their eighteenth celebration of birth that the natural lust which Source gave to men and women for pleasure and procreation can be satisfied righteously within the bonds of marriage. For the man or woman who is receiving pleasure and fulfillment within their marriage will not give into temptation to look elsewhere. It has always been so, since the beginning of time, that there are more righteous women of light than there are men of light. This will not be changed by all the proselytizing and preaching that you may do, for Source has always sent down into the bodies of women, the greater portion of the virtuous and faithful spirits of heaven. Therefore, let some among the righteous men of the children of light take another wife, one chosen with love by the wife they have, that all righteous women will have the opportunity to be married to virtuous men in this life. And a plural marriage is not just a man to another woman, but also the new wife to the wife that stands already with the man, and among them there shall be no secrets. Nor is it meant for women to be always with child, for how then are they to have a life beyond caring for children? And this is easier to accomplish in righteousness in a house with multiple wives. Verily, the spirits of heaven wait with joy to come down into a body upon the earth that they might further grow and expand their light by their choices and experiences. But use alternatives in your intimacy to ensure you do not bring children into the world until you are prepared to nurture their hearts, bodies, minds, and spirits, for all who are married will be held accountable, not only for choosing in selfishness to not have children, but also for Choosing to have children when they were not prepared to care for them in all ways to encourage their growth, expansion, and happiness. It has been the law that whosoever desires to put away his wife shall give her a certificate of divorce. But I say unto you that wives may put away their husbands as well for just cause and demand lifelong support. But neither the husband nor the wife shall put away the other, save it be for just cause which is fornication or adultery, or violent or continual torment of the spirit, mind, or body. And whosoever marries someone who has been divorced for fornication or adultery commits adultery by their marriage, save there has first been a true and contrite repentance, including restitution that has washed away the sin of the sinner. Again, you know that the laws of old, Say that you shall make an oath to God before men to prove the seriousness of your intent. But I say unto you, take no oaths to God before men to demonstrate your veracity or intent, but to men only say yes or no. Let any oaths to source only be for the purposes of source, not for the purposes of man, and these only in private or within a close circle of your brothers and sisters of light. You know that the laws of old say that there should be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. 
Yet have you ever known of a judge to demand an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth? No, not in all the history has it been. So, the meaning of this law then is that when an injury has been given by one to another, that the compensation to the injured must be equal to the injury suffered. No more or no less. And this is a true law of source. But not for all injuries does this apply, but only for those which cause a man grievous or irreparable harm to his life or income. When grievances are more petty than grievous, let them be settled one man to another, one brother to another, one sister to another. When petty disagreements and grievances cannot be settled brother to brother, then let there be a mediation of the family. If the family decides the outcome, but one brother cannot abide the decision, let there be a mediation of those with that responsibility in the family of light, and after hearing the facts and circumstances, let their decision be final. Avoid the courts of law except for the most grave matters, those that are so grievous or have caused such irreparable harm that they cannot be reconciled by your family or the family of light. Other than this, courts of law will inflict both the petitioner and the defendant with a poison to both their spirit and their life, from which they will not easily recover. There are times when you will be burdened by the unreasonable actions or requirements of others. When these are in opposition to righteousness. Or. Of. Great seriousness, you should oppose them. But often, they are merely an irritation, the acts of bullies and people in power. In such cases, it is better to affect indifference and even go beyond what is demanded for then you take away their sport and they become bored and let you be. Therefore, if a Roman comes and compels you to carry their pack for a mile, offer to carry it for two. If a man slaps you in the face without cause, turn your other cheek to him as well, provided you or your family or the family of light are not threatened with real harm. But if your family or the family of light is threatened, or your own life or safety, do as you must to defend yourself, but in that, do nothing that will make the matter worse. If a man asks your help, turn him not away. And if a brother or sister asks to borrow that which you own, let them have it as long you are not in need of it at that time and think not for its return until they either bring it back to you as a good steward should or you have need of it again. You have heard in the laws of old that it is said to love your neighbors and to hate your enemies. But I say unto you, hate not your enemies, love them as misguided children of God. Ask for blessings upon those that curse you that they might find the errors of their ways and do good deeds even for those that hate you, that their hate might be turned into admiration and respect. Pray for those who spitefully use you or persecute you that you might always be an example of the higher path walked by the children of light, who show by their lives that they are true sons and daughters of God. Remember Source loves all the children of men and makes the sun to shine and the rain to fall for the blessing and benefit of everyone, both the good and the evil, the just and the unjust. Can you do any less than your mother and father in heaven? For if you only have love for those who love you, what could be your reward? For even the publicans do the same. And if you give greetings only to your brothers and sisters of light and ignore the wayward in the world, how are you any different than the publicans or Pharisees, for do they not do the same? Therefore, strive each day to be better in every way than the day before and strive each day to live your life in ways that are loving and virtuous and just, even as Source is loving and virtuous and just with you, even in your imperfections. Take heed that when you give alms, you do not do it before men to be seen. Do not sound a trumpet for the poor to gather and know that it is you who is their benefactor. But when you give alms, do it in secret that only those overseeing the largest may know from whence it came, and even then, if you give in anonymity, it is more pleasing unto God. 
and that which you do in secret shall be rewarded openly to you by source. When you give alms, do so without consideration for how much you are giving, except Tob sure that it is not too little. Other than that, do not let your right hand, which gives alms, know how much your left hand took from your purse. And when you pray, do not be as the hypocrites who love to pray long and tedious prayers, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets so they may be seen by men. Verily, they shall have their reward, and it will not be what they think it will be. But when you pray, go into a closet or a room where you are alone and shut the door that you can have privacy and pray to Source in secret as a friend speaks to a friend, and Source who remains hidden from the eyes of men and is your truest friend, shall answer you openly. When you are asked to publicly pray as a representative of your brothers and sisters, do so only in humility, with gratitude for the honor you have been given, and speak only with words that truly express the feelings, desires and beliefs of those who have called you to represent them before Source. When you pray, Except in prayers of sacred ritual, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be better heard by God for their many repetitions, but in fact, God hears them not. For their repetition shows that they pray only with their words and not with their hearts. Verily, I declare to you, Source does not listen to the words of men said in prayers, except prayers that are said with feeling from the heart and with sincere love of God. To prayers. Other than this, God is deaf. Understand that Source knows everything you are in need of before you ever ask. But by asking with passion and feeling from your heart and with sincere love for God, you demonstrate that you actually value that for which you ask. When men sin against you and do not repent and confess to you and make restitution to you, you have no obligation to them. But when men sin against you and are truly sorrowful for their action and offer a sincere repentance and honest restitution to you, then you must forgive them in full and remember their sins no more, even as Source forgives you in full and remembers your sins no more when you have given a sincere, full and contrite repentance. When you fast, do not be like the hypocrites who wear a sad countenance and stumble along that men may know they are fasting. Verily I say unto you they shall have their reward, and it will not be what they think it will be. But when you fast, make yourself clean and tidy, wear nice garments, have a smile on your face and warmth in your countenance that men may not even guess that you are fasting, unless they are fasting with you. And Source, who is in secret, shall reward you openly. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust decay and where thieves break through the gate and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, such as acts of kindness and love, of honesty and fidelity, and of goodwill and good stewardship, for these are the treasures which neither moths nor rust, or any of the plagues of men, can decay or corrupt. These are the treasures which thieves cannot break in and steal. These are the treasures of enduring value, which mark you as a man among men in life and a prince. Among princes in the world to come. The love of money and power are the gods of the world and if you pursue and lust after either, let it be a warning that you have strayed from the path of Celestine light. For you cannot serve two masters, you cannot serve money or power and source. Either you will hate one and love the other or favor one and deny the other or hold to one and despise the other. You cannot be a child of light and also love and avidly pursue money or power, for they are oil and water to one another and cannot mix, and only one can be first in your priorities. But what shall become of you if you do not pursue money? Fear not, do what you love, and trust in God. Verily, I say unto you, do not be anxious about what you shall eat or what you shall drink or how you shall clothe yourself. Be content with less, not working endlessly for more, for life is more than food and drink and the clothes you wear.
It is more than the house you live in or the men that you command. Life is meant to be lived in tranquility and joy, and these come from contentment with less, not always seeking more of the things of the world. Fulfillment and happiness come from quiet days with your wife or husband, playing with your children, listening to the concerns of your brothers and sisters of light, being of service to your community, being a good steward of the land and to all. The Creatures of the Earth If you have all the treasures of the earth, but you have not these things, you are most destitute among men and a pauper in the world to come. Behold the fowls of the air, they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into homes, yet source feeds and cares for them. If source so loves the birds of the air and cares for their needs, how much more are you loved and cared for? Why do you worry about tomorrow? Sufficient is the day for itself. Which of you by worrying or planning for a tomorrow that may never come can add one day to his life? Verily, in worrying and working for the tomorrow that may never come, you sacrifice the day that is in your hand. In that sacrifice, you lose more than a day, you lose the moments with those you love that never were and prevent the moments that would have been from ever becoming. And why do you worry about the clothes you wear? Consider the lilies of the fields, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you even King. Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so adorns the flowers of the field, which are here today, but wither tomorrow, and are cast into the oven, shall not source so clothe you, O you children of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink, or where shall we live, or how shall we be clothed? After all these things, those who are lost seek and sacrifice their lives for emptiness. But Source knows you have need of all of these things, and if you do not pursue them foremost in your thoughts and actions, but instead store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, then all these things shall come to you as you have need. Like the birds of the air and the flowers of the fields, look to the earth to provide your needs, from the food you eat to the clothes you wear, to the homes you live in, to the money you need to buy little pleasures. The earth has been given to you that you may have all of these things and have them in abundance, if you have faith, seek that which you desire to find. Do not expect it to simply fall out of the sky, and remain balanced in your life between your needs and your desires. Therefore, do not live today for tomorrow, but live today for today. The days to come will have their own challenges. When living a life of peace, joy and true fulfillment, sufficient is each day for the challenges therein. Do not condemn others for their lifestyles and choices that are different from yours and do not despise those who do not believe as you do or hold the same things of value. The more you judge others, the more they will reciprocate and judge you. And with the disdain that you show, so shall you be disdained. Be careful not to speak with critical words or critical inflection in your voice to members of your family or your brothers and sisters of light, if they have not asked for your critical opinion. Every fault you see in them, you likely have even greater in yourself, and only because of that can you recognize it in others. Therefore, rather than criticize your brothers or sisters by word or even inflection or even by what you may think is a friendly suggestion, seek first to improve yourself and wait for them to seek out your opinion if they desire it. When your brother or sister is ready for help, they will ask for your opinion or advice, therefore, a suggestion unasked for, that does not seek to improve without judgment, but first belittles by word or inflection, are words that should never be spoken. When you desire to praise another, shout it from the hilltop, but when you think to criticize another, chew upon your tongue. Give not that which is holy to the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Each day, 
there are only so many hours, and in your life, only so many days. Therefore, every day is precious and should not be squandered, trying to help those who do not desire your help or teach those who do not desire to be taught or uplift those who prefer to stay in the pit. Be of good service, but only to those who value the time you give, only to those who seek the help you offer, only to those who desire to hear the good news you speak, and only to those who wish to be tomorrow more than they are today, not in the ways of the world, but in the ways of the Celestine Light. Ask with faith, with selflessness, for anything of righteousness that is a need of in your life, and it shall be given to you. Seek with faith for anything of merit, and you shall find it. Knock with faith upon any door where you need to enter, and it shall open unto you. For every person of virtue, who asks with faith, with selflessness, shall receive, and every person of virtue who seeks with faith shall find and every person of virtue who knocks with faith will find all doors open unto them. Which one of you, if your son asked for a loaf of bread, would instead give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would instead give him a snake? If you who are with faults still know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall our Father and Mother in Heaven, who are without fault, give good things to the children of light that ask of them? Therefore, all the good things whatsoever that you wish men would do for you, do you even so for them, verily, this is the fruit of the Law and the Prophets. I have spoken often of the children of light, and many here have wondered who they are and if they are one. Verily, the children of light care not for the ways of the world, but are enraptured with the ways of Celestine Light and the community and family of light. They walk a different path than the path of the world, a path that leads them to peace and fulfillment and community in this life and overwhelming joy, exaltation and expansion in the life to come. A child of light comes not by birth or by decree but by choice and the conviction to follow the precepts of Celestine Light they know to be true, because both their heart and their mind say it is so, and their prayers confirm it. Many are called to be children of light, but few are chosen because only those who tend the orchard are allowed to harvest the fruit. Many have not been called, but are still chosen because having seen the Celestine Light, they make the choice to abandon the darkness and live the light. Like a wayward son, they are welcomed into the arms of Source. If you would be a child of light, enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are those that go that way. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leads to life in the Celestine Light, and few are those that find it. Beware of false prophets for there shall be many that shall spread like a plague upon the land. They will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. Everyone who preaches in my name is not of me, but only those who live the teachings of Celestine Light that I have given. Words are like dust, alone they are worthless. It is only when someone speaks the teachings I have taught and their words are proven with actions of love and service and humility, and virtue, and respect, and stewardship that you may begin to accept that they are from me and true emissaries of the Celestine Light. It is not by miracles that you will know them, but by knowledge that works miracles. It is not by wealth that you will know them, but by austerity, that they give their excess above their needs to the poor. It is not by having many men to command that you will know them but by seeing them toiling by the sweat of their brow in common with their brothers and sisters of the community. It is not by power that you will know them, but by a tenderness and stewardship for all life. It is not by great oratory that you shall know them, but by the teachings of the Celestine Light they demonstrate with the example of their kind and virtuous life. It is not by the deference that men give them that you shall know them, but by the respect and attentiveness they give to others, especially those of little means or position. Therefore, 
though false prophets shall abound, there is no need for you to be led astray. Look to the things which I have given, by which you may separate the false prophet from the true. Then go in private and ask God to confirm the conclusions of your mind and the feelings of your heart. Simply remember that you will know them by their fruits and that the life they live is a greater witness of their veracity than any of the words they speak. Remember, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from the thorn bushes or figs from the thistles? Every good tree brings forth good fruit, in harmony with the teachings of Celestine light I have given and the life I have shown to you. But a corrupt tree brings forth fruit that does not come from the vineyard and orchard of source, and it is fit only to be discarded upon the ground. To Rot Now some will say that they receive a little good fruit from the teachings of a false prophet, and therefore, they just ignore the words which have no harmony in their heart and lift themselves up with the words that do. But I say unto you that every good tree brings forth only good fruit. There is not a good tree that has one branch that bears sweet fruit and an adjacent branch that bears rotten fruit. And when fruit is gathered into a basket one bad fruit will spoil the basket, even as a single bad influence can decay that which would otherwise have remained. Good. A truly good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a tree corrupted bring forth good fruit that is not already tainted with its demise. Every tree that does not bring forth good fruit must be hewn down and cast into the fire, lest it taint the purity of that which is good. Wherefore, remember this test of a prophet and of a child of light, by their fruits of their life, you shall know them. But do not think that a child of light or even a prophet or an apostle will never have fault or err in their personal choices or that a leader of the communities of light will never sin and be in need of repentance. If they were already perfect, they would be translated in the blink of an eye and be no more upon the earth. But in the life they live, you see them live as I have shown you and taught you to live. Not as the world lives, but only as the children of light live. Nor should you think that everyone that calls out to God or praises Source or who claims to be acting in the name of God will actually ever enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who live the life and truly do the will of my Father and Mother in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name and in your name done many wonderful works? Then I will profess to them, I never knew you, you spoke in assuming words, but you never prophesied for me, you cast out devils, but they only laughed, for you had no authority, you have done many good works in my name, but with vanity for your glory, not in humility for mine. Depart from me you that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever hears my words and lives them, I will liken to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and his house did not fall, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone who hears my words and lives them not shall be likened unto the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon his house, and it fell and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass that when Jesus ceased to speak, the people were astonished at what they had heard. Him say, for he spoke doctrines that put down things they had believed and presented doctrines they had never heard. But he spoke teachings that made sense and resonated in their hearts. He spoke as one with authority, not as one of the scribes. An aura of divinity spread over them, emanating from him in so much that his words pierced them that they had tingles throughout their body. And though many might choose to not heed the words they had heard, none could doubt the veracity of what he had spoken. Miracles and Suffering After a break for lunch, Jesus continues his sermon and speaks 
about why God allows suffering in the world. He announces that after he is through speaking, he, Miriam, and Cephas will walk through the crowd and people who wish to be healed may touch any one of the three, and through their own worthiness and faith, they will be healed. Many are healed and some are not, but almost all see and feel things that they have never even imagined. While Jesus had been speaking, his Apostles had been sitting in asthma circle directly below him and the multitude sitting beyond them. But in the place closest to him sat four women, and the order in which they sat was meaningful. Facing Jesus, his wife Miriam sat on the left, which was Jesus's right hand and the place of honor reserved always for her, beside her was Salome, Martha was next, and Miriam, his mother, beside her. Throughout his discourse, the women held hands or linked arms or leaned against the woman beside them. This was common practice among Miriam, Martha, and Miriam, but Salome had purposely been included with them and, by Martha's request, sat between her and Miriam, that she would have no doubt that they accepted her as one of their family and held no animosities for her part in the death of Yochanan. After Jesus had stepped down to go to the company of his family, Cephas stood up on the pinnacle and announced to the multitude in a loud voice, We have been blessed by the teachings of Jesus, Son of Light, surely. None have heard his words this day and not been pierced by their significance and inspired by their promise. Jesus has told me that he desires to still speak more this day, but first, as it is already well into the afternoon, let us all break for a meal. But please remain where you sit, and once Jesus has finished eating, he will speak to us again. Then after asking for silence and saying a short prayer of thanksgiving and blessing for the food they would all eat, Cephas stepped down and went to his family. The people did as Cephas bade. As most had traveled from other areas and encamped. Around the communities of light, they had ample food with them, and those that had none found the strangers. Around them happily shared whatever they had. When Jesus was ready to ascend again the pinnacle, he informed Cephas, who went up to the pinnacle and announced to the multitude that Jesus would now to speak to them again. Once again, Cephas offered a prayer for the multitude, asking, Source, God of the earth and all that is, thank you for this opportunity we have to hear the words of Jesus, your Son of Light. Let our hearts be open to receive the celestine light that he brings and our heads be clear to understand his words. So let it be. Then Cephas stepped down from the pinnacle and Jesus stepped up. Looking over the multitude, he said unto them, I know many of you have come to Capernaum to see me because you have heard it said that I have healed people in miraculous ways, and you hope that I will heal you or a member of your family. When I come down from the mount, I will walk among you, and you may reach out and lightly touch my garment, and those who are prepared shall be healed. That you may know that it is not through me alone that the celestine power of source comes to heal but through any of the children of light who have been given that authority, my wife Miriam, who is one of my apostles, and Cephas, another, will also walk among you. If you are ready to be healed, you have repented of your weaknesses and stand upright before men and God. If this be so, then simply touch our garments as we pass by and ask aloud with your words for source to heal you. We are bridges of the Celestine Light, and if you are prepared in your heart, it will be as you desire and you shall be made whole. At this revelation, the apostles were surprised, all save Miriam and Cephas, for Jesus had not spoken of this to any of them or taught them how they could be channels of the Celestine power of Source as he was. Then Jesus preached to the multitude, saying, This will be in. Afternoon of miracles, but it will also be an afternoon of disappointment. Many will seek to be healed, but only some will obtain that which they seek. How can that be? 
Why would some be healed, but others not? Is it the fault of the healer? Are they not true channels of the Celestine Light of Source? Nay, that cannot be so, for there are some that will be healed, even of very great diseases and infirmities. Have you ever wondered why Source even allows suffering and disease and infirmities at all? Have you not seen at times when the pain of suffering is so great or the agony from the loss of a loved one, that a person will cry out in despair to God, asking why? If there truly is a benevolent God in heaven, a mother and father who love their children beyond measure, how could this God of all that is, with the power to make or destroy the earth and all the heavens above with a single command? Allow such misery and suffering and pain to their children who walk the earth? You would be less than honest with yourself if you did not admit that at times, such questions have passed through your thoughts. Today you will have the answer to those questions. You may not like the answers. You may not accept the answers. But you will know the answers. I tell you these things with the hope that in understanding the truth, even if at first you may not accept its reality, that you will accept it enough that it will begin to alter your habits and choices and will make a beneficial difference in your life. It is taught by the priests and leaders of the faiths of this land that God is an omnipresent, omnipotent presence. God is referred to in our times in the masculine structure of speech, but only as a form of speech, and is not thought of as actually having a form of a man. But in ancient times, God was not so considered. In ancient times, God was spoken of in the plural and in both the masculine and the feminine. When next you are in the synagogue and they are reading from the scripture scrolls, ask them to read of the creation of the world. In truth, much has been removed from the sacred scrolls that were originally written, and more has been removed than remains. Why was much that was written removed? Because the scrolls as they were originally given by source to the prophets were given from source and the true understanding and implications of that are at odds with the teachings that men desire to hear. The very nature of the name source, by which God chose to be known to man, is plural in its composition. More importantly, it embodies both the masculine and feminine. Even in what remains of the tattered scriptures read in the synagogues, this name of God is used over two thousand times. But it is almost always used in contradiction upon itself, and this was not done by they who originally wrote the scrolls, but by the scribes and priests who came after them and desired a different God for it is employed as a singular and masculine title, but it is in fact not only plural, but both male and female, even as the true God of heaven is. I speak now from the same scrolls that still are read in the synagogues, and God said, Let us make man in our likeness and let them have dominion. And again, behold the man has become as one of us. And again, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. In these words, you see mankind was made in the image not of God, but God's. They were made male and female in physical appearance like the physical appearance of God, one a male, one a female, a father and a mother, a part of the source whom you worship. Source is not a faceless eon without substance or form as is taught today. Even the very text of the scrolls read in the synagogues record Moses speaking to Source, face to face. That there is no doubt that the scroll records an actual event and not a metaphor, the scripture concludes, as one man speaks to another. Understand that Source is not a faceless eon of the male persuasion. Nor is Source only one eon as you have been led to believe, but many. But the Source that is the creator of this world are three, the Father, the Mother, and the Son, who is your brother, for the eternal soul of each of you is a creation of our Father and Mother in heaven. And more than this, 
source is also what each one of you can become someday as you learn and grow from your experiences and choices and become perfect. And it is for this cause to learn and grow and become more perfect that you should be striving for every minute of your physical life upon the earth. And it is for this cause that you might learn and grow by your experiences and choices that suffering is allowed to exist in your life and the life of every person, some to a very great degree. There is no greater desire of your father and mother in heaven than you should return to them in glory, and they wait with love to embrace you and welcome you home. But you cannot return to a realm of perfection ruled by the source, unless you are first more perfect. You do not need to be perfect as the source are, for you continue to expand for all eternity. And you have forever to improve upon your perfection. But you must grow beyond the bonds of the ways of the world, you must grow into the ways of the source, and in that, you become greater than you are, greater than you began, and with a harmony that can live in the presence of the source. When you seek to understand the nature of Source and try to comprehend why suffering exists and why bad things happen, even to the most wonderful and righteous people, remember how you help your own children to become more than babes, in the same manner your Father and Mother in Heaven seek to help all of their children upon the earth. You let your children experience their life. You teach them right from wrong, what can hurt them and what is good for them. You admonish them to be of good character and virtue. They journey through life, and they never forget the teachings you gave to them, both by word and by example. But until your teachings are confirmed by their own experiences and observations, they do not shape them into more than they were. By the teachings of your words and the examples of your lives, you lay the foundation for the building upon which your children construct their lives. But the building is not built until they can prove by their own experiences and observations that the foundation is true. By this, they learn and they grow. Sometimes, they make mistakes, and even those confirm the foundation you built and help them to become more the next day than they were the day before, if they so choose. And I say unto you that every day of life is a school, no matter your age, and each day, there are many tests. And each choice you make, be it big or small, is one. Sometimes people, even well-intentioned and righteous people, make the wrong choices. They learn from the pain and the error of their ways. When the choice comes again, they hopefully choose wiser. It is better to experience a little pain and suffering for your short time in mortality to help you to walk a better path than to not have that incentive to walk in righteousness and condemn yourself by your poor choices to far greater pain and suffering for days without end in the life to come. It is by this means to experience the bad and the good, to make choices, both right and wrong to have the opportunity each day to become better than you were the day before thought our sojourn in mortality is fulfilled, and you may pass beyond the shining gate and into the realm of the source forevermore. Consider this now when a man is born crippled, it is asked who sinned, he, or his parents, that he was thus born. I say unto you that neither the man nor his parents sinned. For Source is a God of love and would never punish a newborn with any punishment, for any cause. I know it is not taught thus among many, but when you consider the nature of Source, consider your own nature as parents. Let your heart feel how you would feel. Let your mind think how you would think. Would you who love your children cripple them at birth to be punished for your sins? Instead of you? Nay. You who love your children, yet are mortal and imperfect, would beg Source to put an infirmity upon you, rather than see your child suffer. Do you think that your father and mother in heaven, being immortal and perfect, could act any less loving or caring for their children of spirit? How then is it that a man is born crippled? Or another suffers from disease when he is a man? Or another, a lover of peace? is murdered at the hands of bandits. 
Or why is one man healed by a spiritual blessing, but another remains as he is? One answer to all of these questions returns to the journey of mortality and what it is that each of you desired to gain in your sojourn upon the earth, as you contemplated the journey, before you were ever conceived in your mother's womb. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before you were born of woman, you were born of spirit, and before you lived upon the earth, you lived in spirit beyond the earth. You came down into mortality that you could experience things that only a physical and mortal body can experience, and this that you might learn from your experiences, that you might become an eternal soul of greater wisdom, of more love, and fuller empathy and sympathy for your brothers and sisters of life and eternity. That you might become more like the Source. Therefore, when you see a man born crippled, do not imagine who sinned that he was thus born, do not scorn or pity him. Instead, honor him, for he has shown uncommon love for himself and his family and an intrepid courage and devotion of desire to grow into a magnificent son of Source by being thus born. Having lived within the challenges, he will gain empathy and sympathy for the plights of others such as no. One who has not lived thus can ever gain. Having lived within the challenges, he will learn to cherish love, both that which he receives from others and that which he can give to them, and this in ways such as no one who has not lived thus can ever gain. Having lived within the challenges, he will see all the world with different eyes and learn to appreciate the beauty and wonder of many common things, in ways such as no one who has not lived thus can ever gain. Having lived within the challenges, he will afford his closest family and friends an opportunity to also learn empathy and sympathy and love and stewardship to a greater degree than they otherwise would have been able, had he not been born thus and lived among them. Therefore, when a person is born crippled, but still capable, this is someone who chose to be born thus, before they were ever birthed, that both they and their family and friends might have greater opportunities in their sojourn in mortality to become more than they began. Sometimes an affliction will strike a man in the prime of his life, for no apparent cause of his own. But like the man born crippled, this can sometimes be a choice made before he was ever born into the world or a choice made by his higher spirit later in his life to help him or those in his life to learn greater empathy, sympathy, faith, and love. But there is also a second Ian that may overshadow the man who becomes afflicted later in life, and it is this Ian that is usually the cause. Like the man who was born crippled, it is often the case that the man who acquires a disease or infirmity also made the choice to do so. But unlike the man born crippled, he may not have made the choice by action, but by inaction or incorrect action. There are certain laws of health by which you would be wise to abide. These are not necessarily laws written on the sacred scrolls, but they are taught and known to the children of light. Living the true laws of health and vitality produce superior wellness. More pointed, not living the laws of health, whether by choice or ignorance, bring about greater disease and afflictions. This body you wear is mortal. It is subject not only to death, but to all manner of diseases, infirmities and imperfections. That is how it was created by Source that through your mortality, you would be given the opportunity to make wise choices. As you are a good steward of the temple of your body, that habit becomes a part of who you are, and you become a better steward of other things given to your care such as your children, your animals, your crops, and your community. As you prove yourself with lesser things, Source will give you greater things, both in this life and the next. Source rewards the good steward, but has an empty cup for the poor steward, save they recognize the error of their ways, repent, and commit to living a greater light. Therefore, when you find yourself sick and afflicted, do not curse what has happened to you, 
but give thanks that through your infirmity you are reminded that you are the master of yourself and can make changes in your lifestyle that will improve the state of your wellness in the times to come. If you do not learn the lesson of your poor health, even as you recover, you are doomed to fall to another. Infirmity soon again. Therefore, this day, as I walk among you as a bridge of light between man and God, to bring the healing Celestine light of source upon you, reach out and touch my garment if you will, if you have the faith, if you have the desire. If you are dedicated to living the greater light called Celestine. Consider the man who took off his garments and labored in a loincloth for all of the day under the hot sun, because he was uncomfortable and sweating wearing his clothes. At the end of the day, his body badly burned, he sought to be healed. He reached out to touch the light, but it did not come upon him and he was not healed, for it had been by his choice that he had forsaken his clothing that protected him from the sun, and he had not learned from his error and upon another day, the same thing he would do. Then there was the man who was imprisoned by the Romans and forced to work all day in the hot sun in just his loin cloth. He too was badly burned, he too desired to be healed by the light, but when he reached out with faith and hope to touch the light, his body was restored as it had been, because the cause of his suffering had not been by his choice, and in his desire to be healed. He held humility and faith and love and desired to be a better man in his heart. As I walk among you today, ask yourself which man are you, the wise man who seeks to ever act in wiser ways or the foolish man who seeks always immediate comfort and pleasure and considers not they painful consequences that shall fall upon him on the morrow. Then Jesus stepped down into the crowd, and he beckoned Miriam and Cephas to also come down into the multitude. And the three of them walked out in different directions that they might go among all of the people. As they passed through the multitude, nearly everyone present reached out a hand to touch them, not just those who were noticeably infirmed or afflicted. The old and the young, the Hebrew and the Gentile, the Egyptian and the Roman, all reached forth their hands and let them linger on their garments with softness and respect, as they moved slowly among them. And of miracles, there were many. Men on litters stood up and walked. People with sundry pains from sources they knew not suddenly had none. Men, women, and children who had been blind for years or since birth at once saw the wonder of the world and they fell to their knees and praised Source. Many who had no noticeable affliction still were changed, and you could see it in their countenance, which as they touched Jesus or Miriam or Cephas went from an expectant, hopeful smile to rapture and joy and tears. Though some were not healed, as Jesus had said would be so, upon the joyous faces of the thousands of people in the crowd, it could not be doubted that almost all had seen and felt a light such as they had never imagined, even the Celestine light. And they would return to their homes with a warmth in their hearts that before had never been. Setting apart the Apostles